Hello there, hello there, welcome back. Random show episode number 182, part two, part the, part dos. What's going on? What's cracker lacking? Welcome back to the show. Hope you are well. Wherever this live stream may find you, I hope you are swimmingly. That's what I hope you are. I hope you're swimmingly. I hope you're well. I hope you're good. I hope you're swimming. I hope you're well. I hope you're swimming. I hope you're good. Energy back up and restored. I'm full of breakfast. I'm full of coffee for the first time in more than what? It feels like a month. I've drank actual coffee. So I'm actually ready to go. I sprinkled some, you know, some of my white powder on top of there, as I've been accused of. I sprinkled some of that stuff on there like it was caster sugar. And I'm ready to go. Ready, pumped, and ready to go. It's going to be about two hours of non stop fun. Then I'm going to break, head to the gym, get a pump on, come back, and then another two hours. We're going to keep on going. We're going to keep on going. Welcome back to The Random Show with I, your host, Agostino Zinger. And I hope you're doing well. Wherever this live stream may find you, I hope you're doing swimmingly. So, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to jump right into it, Okay. No delay, no lacking, no slacking. We're going to jump right into it. Number one thing to talk about right now. Number one thing to talk about right now. Yes, you guessed it. What's happening? What's happening with those unsealed documents pertaining to the one and only Jeffrey Flippin Epstein? You know what's happening. You know what's going on. Don't act like you don't know, right? What are these documents and what's happening? Because some interesting names have come about some very interesting names the documents as says here by sky's news a u.s court has unsealed a number of documents relating to jeffrey epstein and the american finances sex offender who died in prison in 2019 the documents were part of a 2015 list civil lawsuit lodged by virginia gufre um who says that she was one of Epstein's principal victims of underage sex trafficking. She sued Jelaine Maxwell, um, Epstein's former lover, for defamation after a spokesperson issued a statement describing Gufrey of allegations of Epstein as obvious lies. At the time, the 62-year-old tried to have the case thrown out, but District Court Judge Robert Sweet rejected her motion to dismiss it. Documents relating to the case were subjected to the court orders uh, um, sealing or redacting, then protect the privacy of some of the people named. If they are likely to be either people accused of wrongdoing or not included who worked for Epstein, flew on his planes or visited his homes, as well as alleged victims of witnesses. So all these people named are somewhat tied to all of that madness, all of that icky, yucky, disgusting, evil, deplorable stuff that was going on in Epstein Island. The Miami Herald first intervened to get um the to get them unsealed to the public. Interest groups, um, interest grounds are in 2018. This is the eighth set to be released. The day after the first round was published in 2019, Epstein was found dead, aged 66, in his Manhattan prison cell, where he was awaiting trial for child sex trafficking offences. So pretty, pretty crazy stuff, right? So let's continue. What's happening so far, right? Um, so far, we've got Janae Maxwell mentions prince andrew in an email in the documents released tonight an email that appears to be sent by gillian maxwell mentions prince andrew this email was sent on the address of gillian maxwell at l max.com to philip barden and ross gow in 2015 it reads i have already suffered such a terrible and painful loss over the last few days that i can't even see what life after press well um, will even look like statements that don't address all just lead to more questions what my relationship with clinton andrew and on and on it's pretty crazy that prince andrew isn't in prison in it it goes to show you just how rigged the system is that prince andrew a bona fide pedo a bona fide sex pest a bona fide creep an actual monster in the fucking clear is somehow not in prison that tells you everything that you need to know about the system, everything you need to know about the world and how it functions. If you're a higher up elite, especially from a fucking royal family, you can essentially get away with murder. 
It always brings me back to that statement that Donald Trump said that one time. Donald Trump said that one time when he was at the peak of his fucking fame, when he was maybe just got into the White House and became president of the United States. He made that statement where he said, if I was to go into Times Square and point and shoot somebody, like everybody would kind of ignore it or whatever it may be. Something along those kind of lines, right? And everyone was kind of up in arms about it. More I think about it, the more he was bang on. He was mostly speaking about what happens when you have privilege and power. The same thing when he said that grabbed them by the pussy line. That grabbed them by the pussy line was kind of taken out of context. Because if I remember correctly, he said that grabbed them by the pussy thing to basically show off to the guy that he was talking to. Like, hey, I'm so rich. I'm so powerful that if I just grab them by the pussy, because I'm, I am who I am, women won't say anything. He can kind of get away with doing whatever he wanted. And as abhorrent and as disgusting and as awful as that is, that actually is reflective of the real world the real world is actually like that the more powerful you are the more noteworthy you are to have the more money you have the more connections you have you can actually get away with murder you can actually get away with being a pedo you can actually get empowered to do pedophilic disgusting sex pesty um abusive manipulative evil things to people and everybody turns a blind eye that's the actual truth of the matter. That's how scary it is out there. That's how scary it is out there. So when these higher ups try to talk down to us, regular civilians, and try and give us life lessons and try and tell us to follow their fucking example, we're like, hold on. Weren't you guys empowering creeps and monsters? Weren't you guys taking young, vulnerable women from all around the world and essentially exploiting them, tearing their lives apart and leaving them out in the street for them to pick up whatever was left of their lives and make some good of it? Weren't you guys principal in that destruction? Of course you were. Now you're trying to give us lessons. Why don't you keep on moving, sir? Why don't you keep on moving? More articles here. Woman claims Prince Andrew touched her breast in newly released documents. Again, how much more evidence do we need to see before Prince Andrew gets put into prison? And also, don't you find it interesting that the most deplorable, disgusting human beings like Prince Andrew, instead of doing the, the, the gracious thing and maybe unaliving himself, they will live a long and almost prosperous life into their old, old age. This guy, if he doesn't end up in jail somewhere, he'll probably live until he's fucking 101 with not a care in the world. He'll sleep like a fucking baby. Not a wrinkle in his eye caused by stress. Don't you find that interesting, these kind of people? He doesn't even have the fucking, he doesn't even have, he doesn't even have the grace, if that's the right term, to fucking self-expire and just take himself out of the conversation just to bring about some kind of respite and just to kind of bring a sense about of some sort of comic retribution nah he hangs around he's out there and sent barts he's flying to fucking florence he's going to fucking horse shows and stuff living his life as if nothing has happened while he's got a trail of victims you know trying to pick up the scraps of their lives absolutely egregious let's continue as we've been reporting a tranche of documents relating to the paedophile financier Jeffrey Epstein has been published. Some of them included evidence of a woman who claimed Prince Andrew touched her breast. In one document, the woman named Joanna Soyberg or, jo or Joanna Joyberg claimed that the Duke of York touched her breast while sitting on a couch inside a US billionaire's Manhattan apartment in 2001. He's been a sex pest since 2001. 2001, this guy's been absolutely touching up people and being an absolute menace. While giving the testimony in May 2016, Buckingham Palace previously said the allegations are categorically untrue. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the sex pest you have to be to do that sort of shit and still get away with it? Absolutely egregious. We continue with some sort of nonsense here. Maxwell recalls Prince Andrew visiting Epstein Island once, allegedly, right? Details of Ghislaine Maxwell's videotape a deposition in 2016 have also been revealed in the latest released documents. She claimed that she could only recall Prince Andrew visiting Jeffrey Epstein's island once. So even in 2016... Ghislaine Maxwell was running cover for Prince Andrew, very aware that she didn't want to fuck up, you know, that cash cow, didn't want to fuck up that connection because you'd imagine she probably thought in some scenario, if she did ever get out of prison or if she did, you know, escape the clutches of the justice system, that maybe she could lean on those guys for an escape route or for a plan to go somewhere else. So she made sure to keep those guys sweet. Um, it says, yeah, ask whether any girls under 18 were there during her visit. She replied, there were no girls on the island at all. Yeah, right, Ghislaine. No girls, no women other than the staff who work at the house. 
Those are still women, by the way. I'm sure, you know, Maxwell or fucking, what's his name, Epstein wasn't just touching up fucking the girl who was flying in from Ukraine. I'm sure everybody was getting it, you know, for, for lack of a better term. Um, girls meaning, I assume you're asking underage, but there was nobody female outside of the cooks and the cleaners. Yeah, right. It continues here. Email appears to show Epstein asking Maxwell to issue a reward to friends of Gouffray. It says here, an email sent from Jeffrey Epstein to Ghislaine Maxwell has also been revealed as part of the documents. It appears to show that the financier asked her to issue a reward to any of Virginia Gouffray's friends who come forward and help to prove her allegations are false. So these guys were trying to run cover and ruin repu like reputational damage. Because I think that's what people said a lot about um, Epstein, right? That allegedly he might have been some sort of Mossad agent. And allegedly a lot of the things that he was doing was sort of like the advancement of, um, is it like a honeypot sort of scheme? Where essentially you get very high ranking people in a compromising position where they are maybe engaged in sexual acts with underage girls and shit. And you use that to blackmail them so that you you can basically extract you know secrets from them intelligence whatever it may be or just use it as a way to kind of make sure you have people in your back pocket so that's what people were alleging so on the other side of things i guess if you're a victim and you came out and you said hey this guy did this to me they would also employ the same tactics and try to damage your reputation by having people who operate in the same field come out and basically disprove your allegations by basically paying them off. So they would pay them off to say, hey, say this person was lying. And obviously, because the person also works maybe in sex work or something, you're more prone to believe them. And then you would obviously um, think that that person was chatting out of their ass, which is absolutely disgusting. Imagine you went through what you went through. You suffered what you suffered from. And you have people around you who work in the same field, maybe even former friends of yours telling you, no, that didn't happen. You know, I'm sure there are some girls who probably have had mental breakdowns, who've probably gone crazy because in their heads, they can vividly remember what happened and how they got abused, how they got raped, how they got taken advantage of. But then they have their own friends telling them, no, it didn't happen. It didn't happen, baby. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. It's like, oof, flipping hell. It continues here. Amongst the allegations listed by Epstein in the email was a Clinton dinner. A Clinton dinner. Yo, Bill Clinton, boy. Fucking hell. Um, what's his name? Um, uh, What's his name? Bill Gates' wife left him the moment he got mentioned in those emails, right? Or he was mentioned in that list of being on the flight logs for the Epstein Island. Don't get me wrong. Maybe Bill, maybe Bill Gates' wife was waiting for an excuse to leave because I think she ended up hooking up with some guy soon after. So maybe she was looking for any excuse to get away from the dude. But she did the honorable thing and got away, was from, got away from somebody who was associated with a legit monster. Fucking Hillary Clinton hasn't missed a beat when it comes to Bill. Even when that whole Monica Lewinsky thing went down, she is sent, she did a lot of victim shaming because, you know, Hillary Clinton was a queen of that sort of shit. There was no sort of like, you know, female empowerment in that regard. She really did try and basically paint, you know, what's her name? Um, thingy to be a fucking whore or something, right? And didn't really chastise her husband too much. And in this case, the same sort of thing. Clinton's been named. He's all over these fucking documents and Hillary Clinton isn't going to go anywhere. You know what I mean? Monsters not lie with monsters who would know that who would be surprised there she added i've already suffered such a terrible and painful loss over the last few days i can't see the life after the president um it continues here another one bill clinton mentioned in an interview under oath that's the headline that we want to see here bill fucking clinton mentioned in an interview under oath are we surprised are we really surprised? Of course we're not. In Joanna, um, in Joanna Soberg's interview under oath, she described conversations Jeffrey Epstein that mentioned former President Bill Clinton. In the court document, she said that Epstein told her that Mr. Clinton likes them young, referring to girls. The interview was part of a number of documents in 2015 of the US defamation case by Virginia Gouffray against Ghislaine Maxwell. Bill Clinton is out here, you know, being a fucking pedo. Who would have known? Who would have known, man? Who would have known? Um, but Maxwell confirmed in other documents released that Mr. Clinton had traveled to the board on um, board Epstein's private jet. She did not know how many times. Mr. Clinton also said he traveled on Epstein's plane on humanitarian trips to Africa and that the time praised Epstein as a committed philanthropist. In a statement released in 2019, spokesperson for the former president said he had not spoken to Epstein in well over a decade and knows nothing about the terrible crimes. Of course, you know nothing. That's what you do. 
when you're a pedo, you deny, you deny, you deny, but then the evidence comes out, and guess what, you go fucking quiet, fucking horrendous, horrendous, bro, absolutely despicable, but again, will he face any fucking, you know, will he face any consequences for it, will he see the inside of a jail cell, probably not, You'll probably get a book deal. You'll probably sit down with some big fucking TV network and give some sort of sobbing account of how he was manipulated or some shit and try and spin it as if he's the victim. Absolutely disgusting. But again, we're not surprised. It continues here. How Clinton is involved. New release flowers um, names of 170 people. Um, judge per sex, judge ruling claims. They were previously uh, referred to as John and Jane Doe's. ABC News has reported that Bill Clinton is Doe 36. Mentioned in more than 50 documents. Bill Clinton is mentioned in more than 50 fucking documents. There's no indication of any wrongdoings. Yeah, of course, there's no indication of any wrongdoings. You just get mentioned along a fucking career, international, sex trafficking pedophile and his madam, right? You just get mentioned in passing, but you did nothing wrong. Sure. He was photographed with Epstein and admitted to being associated with him in a philanthropic um, um, capacity, but his representative have said that he cut all contact with Epstein in 2005 before he faced criminal investigations. Yes, yeah, sure. Look at, the, look at that picture. Look at that fucking picture, bro. Honestly. If anything is more damning than that, I don't really know, honestly. Virginia Griffith 2015 is reported to be included in the claim that she met former President Epstein on Caribbean Island. Flight logs kept by one of Epstein's private pilots have confirmed that Mr. Clinton flew to the plane, flew Epstein's plane several times between 2002 and 2003 as part of him. Yeah, of course, humanitarian projects in Africa, I'm sure. While you're digging fucking wells, you're fucking abducting fucking young girls and taking them to another island and shit. Absolutely crazy. And let's not fucking look at the fucking pipeline between humanitarian aid in Africa and some of the top modeling agencies in Europe. Let's not even dig into that because you dig into that sort of shit and you're going to start crying. You're going to start crying when you start looking at the fucking details of some of the top modeling agencies in Europe and you start looking at some of the girls that listed on there and their ages and where they come from and the fucking financial, this, you know, um, turmoil and war torn places they're from and how they get taken advantage of. It will make you shed a fucking tear. Don't do it. I promise you. You shouldn't do it. We continue here. Gouffre is questioned over the whereabouts of a photo showing her with Prince Andrew. In a transcript, Virginia Gouffre questioned um, over the whereabouts of a photograph showing her with Prince Andrew. Gouffre says that she was recruited by Jeffrey Epstein, former lover Ghislaine Maxwell, to be a, ma to be a masseuse for the disgraced financier and was subsequently abused by him. She was one of the first alleged victims to speak and publicly was pictured with a now famous picture of Prince Andrew. All the latest documents to be released today are part of the 2015 civil suit. She says, I probably still have the picture it's not in my possession right now um she also said the documents related to the case were full of nerf guns my kids toys and photos we continue another crazy shit can you imagine this look at this stephen hawking mentioned by epstein in an email stephen fucking hawking was on fucking epstein island too can you imagine what that scene must have fucking looked like stephen hawking running around chasing fucking 17 year olds and shit 18 year olds whatever it may be and trying to do what he wanted to do over there can you imagine what that must have looked like god almighty bro God almighty. Epstein mentioned um, astrophysicist Stephen Hawking in a reward email to Gillian Maxwell in a... Uh, he said that the false allegations had been made, including one that described the new version of Virgin Islands that Stephen Hawking participated in underage orgies. Mr. Hawking was photographed on set Epstein Island in March 2006 as part of a trip for science conference. The conference was paid for by Epstein and 20 scientists attended. Can you imagine him also be he's so fucking crazy? Honestly, boy. This just goes to show just how perverse the world is. Honestly, it's ap the world is actually legitimately run. Is actually run by a cabal of fucking abusers, rapists, and fucking pedos. That's the actual reality of it. That's the actual disturbing reality of it. Like how much sex and depravity is actually involved in keeping up some systems or most systems in the world. Can you imagine? Like fucking hell, man. God damn it. It makes you fucking sick. Um, Virginia Griffey speaks there. 
What else we got here? Gouffray claims that Maxwell told her to have sex with several men. Um, one of the shows, Virginia Gouffray said that she had been told by Gillian Maxwell to have sex with several men in a 2016 deposition. After asking Miss Gouffray to in turn about each of the men, Laura Menninger, a lawyer who was part of Maxwell's legal team at the time, asks, other than Glenn Dubin, Prince Andrew and Jean-Luc Brunel, Bill Richardson and other princes, the large hotel chain owner and Marvin Minsky. Is there... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Other than... How many names are these people, boy? Fucking hell. Uh, is there anyone else that Gilly Maxwell directed you to have sex with? Uh, Mr. Gouffray replied, I'm definitely sure there is, but I can't remember everybody's name. No. Jesus Christ, bro. Jesus Christ. For context, Ghislaine Maxwell was living and traveling and working with Epstein in the late 1990s and early 2000s. They're believed to have dated in 1931 and stayed friends after breaking up. She was arrested by the FBI in 2020 um, when officers found her during a raid on the secluded property in Bradford, New Hampshire. Bradford, New Hampshire. After a free week trial in December 2021, Gillian Maxwell was found guilty of recruiting underage girls to be sexually abused by her former boyfriend. She had been accused of recruiting. Fucking wild, isn't it? Absolutely wild. Honestly, you can't make it up. It's absolutely disgusting and kind of fills you with dread. I'm not going to lie. I know it fills me with dread anyway. It makes me fucking want to bath in my mouth seeing all this absolute disgusting depravity. But again, we're not surprised. We're not surprised. Let's scroll up and see a bit more here. Um, Gouffray, oh, well, Gouffray, uh, Soberg claims Gouffray groped um, with um, Prince Andrew Puppet. What? During her testimony in 2015, um, Joanna Soiber claimed that she saw Virginia Gouffray being touched with a puppet of Prince Andrew. God almighty, they were using toys. While in Manhattan 21, in 2001, sorry, Miss Soiberg said that Maxwell called her to an upstairs closet where there was a puppet of a Duke of York, which was made for a BBC program. Yo, yo, it looked like him and she brought it down and presented it to him. That was a great joke because apparently it was a production um, from a show on the BBC and they decided to take a picture with it and Mitch Gouffray and Andrew sat on the couch. They put a puppet on Virginia's lap and sat it on Andrew's lap and they put the puppet's hand on Virginia's breast and Andrew put his hand on my breast. <sighs> Yo, that makes me kind of sad. I'm not going to lie. That makes me kind of sad. Oh my God, bro. More news here. Don Trump named in an interview under oath as well. They named Trump too. Trump was on the island. While on route to Manhattan, Ms. Virginia, Je Jeffrey Epstein, Virginia Gouffray, and Ghislaine Maxwell and Prince Andrew said the financier jet diverted to Atlantic City, New Jersey. The pilot told me to go back and tell Epstein that I can't land in New York and that we're going to land in Atlantic City. Jeffrey was, said, great, we'll call up Trump and we'll go to, I don't recall the name of the casino. Jesus Christ, Trump is mentioned as well. All right. All right. God damn, bro. All of these fucking names. Epstein accuser says she met Michael Jackson. No, not Michael. Not the fucking. No, no. Fucking you know, the king of pop. No way. Jonas Soyberg testified in a newly released deposition. She once met Michael Jackson at Jeffrey Epstein's home. Oh, fuck. She said nothing until what happened with the late pop icon. She said that nothing um, until what happened. There is no suggestion of wrongdoing by Jackson. His name has come up around the case before as it's mentioned by a lawyer. Oh, man, that kind of, that bummed me out. Please, man. Not the king of pop, man. Not my guy. Not my guy. Please, no. Um, what else we got? Bill Clinton likes them young. We already talked about that. Um, the case is court documents stem from. David Copperfield was there too. Performing magic for the pedos. Joanna Soberg, who claimed that she had been forced to perform sexual acts on Jeffrey Epstein, described going to dinner at one of Epstein's homes, also attended by a magician, David Copperfield. <laughs> Honestly, bro, the whole world is run by fucking pedos. Someone called me um, from the house and said that they, they would be there. And if I wanted to come to dinner, then I would, could meet him. Miss Soybeck said that Copperfield arrived and he did magic tricks before asking if she was aware that girls were getting paid to find other girls. Copperfield did not get specific about what? So Copperfield was do going to do magic and getting paid in women. It's, it's kind of similar to like DJs, right? When sometimes you get played, you get booked to play at a club. Instead of getting money, 
you get drink tokens and a bag of drugs. So I guess if you're a creep, if you're a sex pest, then you get paid in women or in girls and stuff. Can you imagine? Oh my God, bro. Some like shaking, trembling, almost teenage looking women in this corner and you get to, you know, have your way with them and you feel nothing about that. You feel perfectly fine about doing so. Yo, how do these people sleep at night, man? How do you sleep at night knowing you have this in your fucking... Oh, it's former Israeli PM. Are you serious? God almighty. Gosh almighty. Are you serious? Are you serious? Former Israeli PM is also involved. No way. No way. That is flipping crazy. No flipping way does this make any sense. Please don't make this make sense. In the disposition, um, Epstein's accuser, Joanne Soyberg, um, has asked if she ever met former Israeli Prime Minister, um, <laughs> Edward Mubarak. Edward Mubarak, she said to which, no. She also asked if she was recalled meeting any Prime Minister or Foreign President. And she again said no. Um, when asked if she had met any Nobel Prize winner, she said not to my knowledge. There's no just in the role doing no Barak. Soyberg is one of the only women is one of men is one of many women who says that they were abused by Epstein. Yo, 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 yo. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if true? I wonder what now fucking Tesby had to say about that, eh? She's always on fucking Twitter ranting and raging about being fucking, you know, unapologetically pro-Israeli. I wonder what Noah Tesby has to say about that, innit? Come on, Noah Tesby. Give us your explanation about that, bro. Come on, let us know. Gosh almighty. Disgusting, innit? Absolutely disgusting. Anyway, that's the main update for the most part. No surprise of all the nastiness going on there. Um, it just fills me with dread. Very upsetting. But I think most of you are aware of those disgusting things. So you don't need to talk about them too much there. But God almighty, that breaks my heart. Um, continuing on from that. Continuing on from that. We have this article here, courtesy of Fortune magazine. Pretty fucking hilarious because of the own goal it's going to cause and the backlash it's going to make. I don't know why the screen's so grey, but you can see here, Lululemon's billionaire founder slams the company's diversity and inclusion efforts. You've got to be clear that you don't want certain customers coming in. Yo, this is kind of wild, but I'm not going to lie. I respect it. I kind of respect when people are outright with their fucking bigotry, with their racism, with their discrimination. I kind of like it up front and in public. I don't like it when it's subversive, when it's done, you know, under the guise of being inclusive, when it's kind of done trying to be kind. No, if you actually don't want a certain type of customer and you don't want to represent your brand, say it with your whole chest. But also, you're not allowed to cry when everybody turns their backs on your company then don't dust don't don't start crying and then start in your, your new advertisements having everybody from all shapes and sizes all over the world representing your brand because you want to get back in people's good books no if you don't want certain people if you don't want the fatties if you don't want the people who aren't probably in super tight shape then say it with your chest but then also don't be surprised if that has a trickle down effect and ends up impacting your company more than you actually realize that's what i don't want but you're free to say what you want but then you're not free from the consequences of what you say. That's the main thing. Let's read the article here. It says, while many CEOs are shouting about they've increased efforts to ramp up diversity and the business of one founder is promoting the exact opposite. <laughs> Lululemon's billionaire founder, Chip Wilson. Chip Wilson sounds like a name of somebody that wouldn't like black people, no, right? A Chip. I wouldn't imagine a Chip Wilson will be a fan of um, the marginalized, right? The unre unrepresented. Um, Lou Lemon's been in there, found a Chip, West, Chip Wilson insists that inclusivity, exclusivity, sorry, trumps inclusivity while blasting the posh leggings company he stepped down from 10 years ago. To be fair, there is a point he's making there because this relates a bit to the Bergheim. Berghain and most popular nightclubs that I like to go to or the clubs that most people like to go to do have an element of inclusivity about them. There is a lot of kind of suggested exclusivity. Hey, you can't come to this party. Some parties even in London don't advertise 
on traditional platforms. You can't find them on RA. You can't find them on Design My Night. You can't find them on fucking Eventbrite. You can't find them on Facebook events. They all do their stuff via discrete Telegram groups, via word of mouth, via sometimes email blast, whatever it may be, but they do it with the sole purpose of keeping out a certain subsect of customers, mostly tech house heads and bros and all this sort of stuff, and maybe some black guys, but for the most part, they do it because they want to protect the people on the inside. So everybody kind of does it in their own way. Now, they will make it seem like, oh, we want to create a safe space. It's about creating a safe space for our people, our community, blah, blah, blah. But there is a little bit of exclusion going on there. So maybe this is kind of the par of course with most things. But let's continue here. They're trying to become like the Gap. And we have to also remember, this guy is the former CEO or the He's not involved in the company anymore. Right? I think he stepped down. So this is really destructive because he's not even involved in the company and he's saying these things and it's most likely going to harm the company that he's even a part of. Do you know what I mean? This is a really sad thing about it. So the, the actual Lululemon is probably inclusive and diverse and doing all the good things that they should be doing to make sure they're brand representative of the wider world and stuff, right? Cool. But him not being involved is probably going to have a negative effect on how people view, it, view the company, even though he's not fucking involved there actively. Crazy. Anyway, his quote. They're trying to become like the Gap. Everything for everybody. Wilson, who is estimated to be worth $8.7 billion, said in an interview with Forbes. To be fair, if you're worth $8.7 billion, you should be able to say what you want. Yeah, you got enough money. You probably got more money that, than you can spend, right, in your remaining life, in your remaining years on planet Earth. Probably say what the fuck you want. Now, whether or not that has an impact on you in real life is another thing, but you should be able to say what you want. You should be able to. That should be one of the... Um, one of the prizes of becoming ultra wealthy that you kind of can get away with whatever you want look at fucking Epstein Island that's what that was right that was an exercise in how much can we get away with because those guys after you bought all the Ferraris after you bought all the horses all the houses all the castles the only logical step to go is to become a bigot is to become a hate-filled person and also to take advantage of people by abusing being a pedo being a sex pest and stuff that's the only logical way to go right instead of doing humanitarian work instead of being a you know a valuable member of your community instead of giving back to the places where you come from or making people's lives easier or helping them out with your amazing wealth or distributing to others whatever no fuck all that shit let's take advantage of people let's be an animal and let's exploit people more and more that's the that's the that's the big way to go <laughs> let's continue and i think the definition of a brand is that you're not everything to everybody you've got to be clear that you don't want certain customers to come in what kind of business model is this you don't want certain customers what customers do you want then like <laughs> that is wild you don't want certain customers to come in it's fucking insane so the active web giant is clearly onto something wilson has added almost four billion to his net worth since 2020 nearly all because of the rise of the value of his eight percent stock in lululemon he's got eight percent stock in lululemon but that accounted for four billion dollars to his net worth. So how much is Lululemon worth overall then? God Almighty, bro! If eight percent accounts for four billion, that whole company must be worth a lot of money. <laughs> God Almighty, I didn't know it was that big. Um, it's not the first time Wilson has expressed his disdain for the brainchild um whole diversity inclusion thing having reportedly faced backlash for anti-Asian, sexist, and fatphobic comments. Yo, why does he hate everybody? <laughs> Who does he like then? Who does he want wearing the stuff that he makes? He doesn't want fats. He doesn't want Asians. He doesn't want what? He doesn't want women, which is odd because Lululemon, when I think of Lululemon, I think of like hot girls wearing those fucking leggings. That's who I think of right when i think of lululemon i think of gay guys who like wearing those um sites because those gay guys especially when i go out clubbing and stuff they love the little um cross body bag they got lululemon have this like little i forgot what it's like a bag got a cross body and it's got lululemon written on the fucking webbing on the strap gay guys when i go clubbing in the clubs that i go to techno clubs you will see a gay guy with it topless across his body and shit so i see mostly women wearing the tights and gay guys wearing the bags but those are their two biggest customers or two biggest ambassadors and he hates them right it's so bizarre and then fat phobic thing it's like come on bro kind of kind of little fatty be able to kind of tuck her fupa into some leggings what's wrong with that 
What's wrong with that? What is wrong with somebody a bit chunky wanting to maybe, you know, keep the chunk somewhat compressed under some leggings or a bra top? There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Come on, bro. Fucking hell. The American Canadian entrepreneur has was mostly um has most infant sorry, most inf infamously insisted that the company's most popular product, the leggings, is not for everybody. It technically is though, isn't it? Leggings are technically for everybody because they technically help everybody get a little bit more snatched. Even if you're skinny, they help to accentuate what you already have. And if you're fat, they help to tighten it up and keep it in somewhat, you know, less of a flabby state. Um, if anything, leggings are the most universal of all products when it comes to that. Uh, most specifically, plus women, when they came under fire for being see-through. Um, they don't work for some women's bodies, he says. He told Bloomberg's television street to Smart in 2013 before stepping down as a firm CEO, then leaving the board entirely in 2015. So he's left the company completely. He's not involved. He stepped down as CEO. He's left the board, but he's still able to make as much money as he did there. Four billion from, from an 8% stock. Brilliant. Um, he could t I like that he left under that fucking controversy and still talking this shit. Um, it's funny to watch them try and say it he told Canada's National Post he's also spoken in favour of children working <laughs> this guy is an absolute this guy is an absolute villain isn't it he has spoken in favour of children working in factories to earn money and avoid poverty he blamed birth control for the rising divorce rates and described plus size clothing as money loser for businesses yo Maybe, I don't know if that is technically true, if plus size clothing does lose money for companies, but he's actually an advocate for children working in factories. Because if, like, in, I guess he's basically saying in the countries that children work in factories, um, you know, they, the, the, the unemployment rate is super high. Kids have to work in factories. There's not many jobs going around. And if they don't work in factories, their family don't eat. Right. So what would you rather? Would you rather a family go hungry to basically appease your liberal ideals? Or would you rather have a kid work in a factory and shit? Because there's no if fixing the infrastructure and improving lives overnight. You have to kind of use what is available at the moment. I don't really know, but it's a fucking crazy thing to say that to be pro um, children working in factories. It's fucking crazy. Um, in a statement provided to Fortune, Lululemon's company spokesperson said that Chip Wilson does not speak for Lululemon and his comments do not reflect our company's views or beliefs. Chip also has not been involved in the company since his resignation from the board in 2015. And he, we are a very different company today. Jesus Christ. A double standard duh, 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 since um, the departure of Lululemon has been trying to shake off the idea that it's exclusively for upper class um, white women of a certain stature through inclusive marketing and a bolstering its diversity and inclusion commitments. To be fair, they've done a good job of it. I always thought Lululemon was a bit white and was a bit yuppie ish. When I think of Lululemon, I would think of um, who's that lady from Goop? That's who I would think of instantly. But I think they, did, they, have done, they have done a good job of shaking that kind of idea of themselves. But such efforts have often been labeled tokenized. Um, tokenistic by celebrities consumers and staff members but of course how do you how else are you going to disprove or shake that image of being super white and being super upper middle class you have to do a better tokenism there is no other way to do it you have to be heavy-handed and just have a united colors of benetton all shapes and sizes advert um to kind of push another image of yourself that's the only way to do it and obviously send loads of free stuff to influencers of all shapes and sizes for around the world you kind of have to do it heavy-handedly there's no subtle way of trying to readjust address the balance or try to rewrite how you're basically viewed out there however over a dozen employees of the firm told business of fashion it was launched to protect the company's image first and foremost and the company often denied black employees job opportunity in favor of less qualified white counterparts okay cool this is probably the most concerning thing i think if a company is just doing the heavy-handed hey we want to represent the world to make more money thing i don't think it's necessarily that bad the problem is more so behind the scenes when you have issues around you know people not being able to get promotions or not being recommended for certain roles despite being qualified for them and that being maybe incredibly like it's, a, it's like the Tremaine thing and Tremaine was complaining about Supreme our oh, Supreme is super you know trying to put this image about being you know multicultural and all this sort of shit and representing black people but in the actual head office they don't actually have a lot of black people in powerful positions in the sweet seat that's where I can see you could be a bit annoyed in that regard if you work on the inside but I think as customers 
if you weren't for Lululemon and you thought they were a bit white and up in middle class and they start, they changed it with this sort of stuff, I think this is a really good way to go about it. So I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. But Chip Wilson is a fucking psycho. Next, let's move on to this. Dark Side Feel. DSP has announced that he's doing a documentary with Mike Klum. So if most of you are aware, I haven't watched it yet. I need to actually do a live stream and do a reaction to it. But Mike Klum did a really amazing documentary on Boogie 2998. And it's one of the best documentaries I think I've seen. I've seen bits of it here and there. Very well produced. And it did a really good job of sort of, you know, putting, laying it bare. Just how much of an awful person Boogie is through his own words. And through interviews with other people in and around him and stuff. And it kind of just showed just and i think the other side of why people like low so much and why they can't you know stop watching these absolute degenerates absolute deplorable people basically um you know turn their life into a living hell in flipping real time so it was quite nice to see so with dark side phil being the premier low and somebody that i actively root against and and a, a demonstrably irredeemably awful person he's also somebody that is incredibly um i would say adverse to having interviews and sitting down with people the last time that he did do one with side scrollers it turned into being one of the biggest mistakes of his streaming career um in terms of he wanted to maybe rewrite the narrative and show a different side of himself and have that be the place where people could go to if they had any questions about him and whatever it may be and it ended up being one of the worst mistakes of his streaming career because it laid bare what an awful person he is and how often that he lies so with this documentary most likely it'll be the same thing for some reason dsp thinks it's going to actually do him the world of good but i have a feeling it's actually going to do him the world of hurt if the documentary is as extensive expansive detailed and involves the lord's different voices it will actually be one of the worst mistakes he makes if he actually goes through with it but for some reason dsp just is as addicted to drama um as everybody else is out there even though he says he's not and he just can't help himself so this is dsp announcing he's working with mike clum after mike clum already leaked the information to review tech usa let's see what he has to say i believe ponage says why don't you do shout outs before we get to the topic literally i have one tip so far that's it there's nothing really to shout out so i think we will get into the topic now you know it's serious when he wears his black top you know black top is the black begging t-shirt this is his announcement this is like his um apple fucking you know presentation right this is his steve jobs outfit he means business now that everyone wants to hear about all right and then we'll get to shout outs and q a after that all right all right so ladies and gentlemen here's the deal because the rumors have already hit the internet there's already rumblings there's already information out there so i am here to so basically shaking. clarify everything to clear the air and to let you know exactly what is going on all right go on tell us then last year was a very drama filled nonsensical year for me against my will and against my wishes correct we i think we can all agree last year there was a lot of very negative talk about me on the internet, in some cases from really big YouTubers, right? Now, in some cases, being very transparent here, when I got criticized by Moist Critical, and he was like, dude, I can't believe he's saying the things he's saying on his streams to his viewers about income and stuff like that. It seems very, you know, disrespectful. He doesn't seem like he has any gratitude. You know, you can't say that kind of stuff. That resonated with me. It struck a chord. No, it correct? didn't. No, it didn't resonate with you. You didn't. You continue to beg. You continue to do all the things that you said you wouldn't do. And if anything, it was quite embarrassing that you needed another grown man to tell you that begging and pleading for you with your fans to pay you in tips so that you could pay for your groceries and take your horse of a wife out for dinner once a week is not the right thing to do. Is disgusting, is deplorable, and will never be acceptable and will never be okay. People will always clown you for it and rightfully so that's a disgusting thing to do and to need somebody an adult to tell you that is really beyond any kind of explanation i agreed with him after watching myself back you know this is from like the fall of 2022 okay after watching myself back <clears throat> that stuff I was and he's like, 41 years right. old by the way he's absolutely right he's 41 I years old sometimes get so full of of, of emotion whether it's fear you know, because of finan finances and stuff like that, or it could be many different Which things. Which you got yourself you know, in trouble with. Fighters, all these things. Whenever I get full of emotion, I tend to just go off the cuff and say things that I probably should not publicly say, right? Um, and I should be called out for it, rightfully. However, I felt that at that point, 
there were too many people who had only heard the negative and had no idea about the positive about me. You know, obviously. What is the positive about DSP though? What is the positive? He's the king of hate. You're the king of hate. What is positive about DSP really? Outside of maybe his ability to always be streaming, right? He streams like six days a week and shit, right? He's always on here fucking begging and pleading for money. You know, he makes a, a good amount of money. What was it? A hundred K a year from begging and pleading people and, you know, playing games terribly. But what else is good about him as a person? Like good. He treats his fans like shit. He manipulates them. He cheats. He lies. This person's awful. If I'm here after 15 years and I have a community who watches me every day, likes my content and supports it, I'm doing something right. All right? I wouldn't still be here. If I no, but you're not, though. That's the thing, though. You're, you're not doing something right. If you actually look at the details and you break it down, I think if you look at the piece of piece um, tips tracker and shit, you will notice that for most of the time, he has a, he has a goal of achieving, what, $150 per each stream. He does two streams per day. And for the most part... The majority of the money that he gets is always from the same f two to three whales are the ones that are basically propping up his entire existence. And those same whales are also the same people who buy, um, who kind of have loads of sock accounts and do all these fucking, um, what do you call it? Buy all these gifted memberships for people on his channel also. So essentially his whole entire career is supported by the charity and generosity of maybe five people in total are the ones that are funding him completely. So he's kind of similar a lot to those kind of cam girl type people out there where he has these benefactories, these kind of, you know, these people who are essentially paying him to perform every single time. There's only five of them for the most part. And the rest of it also is just manipulation and shit. And he wastes most of that money on fucking WWE championships, right? WWE champion, sorry. That fucking gambling, you know, um, gotcha game that he plays, the mobile game he plays. So the money that he makes, he could easily be okay with. He could pay his bills. He could be okay, clear his debts. But he wastes most of it on gambling and obviously on drinking loads of booze, being a former alcoholic, make it make sense. I wasn't doing something, right? There's people who are here for a good positive reason. Sure. And I felt like it wasn't fair because... These big YouTubers who always name drop me never examine that half of it. They only examine the negative because that's what gets thrown in their face by the toxicity of YouTube. That's how YouTube works. Promote the toxic. Push the... But that's a funny thing, though. If he actually had fans, where are the fans that are making, like, fun, positive content about DSP? Why don't those people come forward? Where are those fans? If you actually have, if you're actually doing some good, why aren't there people out there pushing some of the nice and good things that you say? Why is it only the negative is getting pushed? Maybe because you're negative. That could also be the reason. Maybe. Who knows? Negative forward, right? <clears throat> and so I, I said, if you're going to talk bad about me, why not interview me? Correct? Not really. They don't need like, to. Why not just talk to me directly? They don't need to. If, I felt like if someone would just have a conversation with me to see that I'm a real guy, I'm not just some ass. The f it's happened already on side scrollers. That's a funny thing, though. It happened already on side scrollers. One of the guy on side scrollers had no idea who DSP was. The other guy did. They kind of, you know, they went, you know, they go back in time and shit. They just hang out and do all that geeky stuff. Cool, whatever. But one of the guys on the side scrollers interviews had no idea who DSP was. And just through talking to him on the live stream interview, he deduced that DSP was everything that the detractors said he was. He was a liar. He was a scammer. He was a manipulator later right he was able to deduce that during the fucking live stream interview so everything that he's saying happened already in side scrollers interview but he thinks it's going to be a different story with mike club it's going to be funny to see to be fair i want to see it mostly for the interview footage of him at home and stuff i want to see that waddle i've been so desperate to see how he walks from the back and stuff because I've, I've seen him do he's got that kind of waddle that he does he almost looks like a bit of like a penguin so i would love to see that in actual 4k asshole who you see the negative highlights of, but I'm actually just a real person, perhaps you'd think a little differently, all right? Mm, probably so not. I presented that to the internet, and basically, the only people who contacted me were drama brokers and people who were looking to boost their own presence on YouTube. You know, it wasn't like a Moist Critical who reached out. Yeah, exactly. Big up, Netwatcher. Exactly. I honestly can't believe that this guy has his the fan base. It's funny, isn't it? how the fuck does this little scumbag rat like just get people stupid enough to send him money but that's the thing though you know what dsp has he has that legacy fan base which is quite important 
when it comes to places like YouTube, like that ability to like, I think I saw a video of one of the guys, I forgot it was, some street fighter dude, I forgot his name. He mentioned it. He mentioned how like, I think somebody asked him a question of like, oh, how do I build a fan base? How do you go from streaming to one person to streaming to loads of people? Like, how do you build it up and stuff? And he was basically like, he got luck. He got lucky because he got in early. Getting in early allowed him to kind of have a built-in fan base that he was obviously able to take from videos to live streaming. Um, and I think the same is for DSP. Like, he got in YouTube early enough that he was one of the few people out there doing it. Like, content creation back when YouTube first started wasn't that common. Not everybody had maybe access to cameras or whatever it may be. So it wasn't as easy and as accessible as it is now. And there wasn't a lot of competition. So he was able to kind of get in there. And obviously, he hasn't stopped streaming or recording since then. So if you just stayed consistent, if you just stay consistent, and again, he's somebody that's incredibly financially irresponsible, incredibly dumb, incredibly reckless and irresponsible, all this pig, all pig headed, all this stuff, but he's still been able to maintain his, you know, footing online because he just stayed the course. He didn't drop off. He didn't just take a break or go on sabbatical. He just kept churning out shit content after shit content because he started off early enough, people just hang around. That's basically the reason why he's still around. And obviously, he has whales that will support him. But it's pretty crazy when you actually look at the numbers. He legitimately has five people that are propping up his entire existence. It's pretty wild to think that, to be fair. Out to me and said, yeah, let's do an interview. It was like, Review Tech USA, you know. Oh, let's do an interview. No, you already every day name drop me because you don't make your own content. You just make drama. And I'm also certain as well that he actually has legit fans. I don't buy this notion that everybody that supports DSP is a dent head or something like on that line. Obviously, there are some, but I think the majority of his fans are actually regular people who just are long term fans. Like, it's pretty difficult. Like, I think people dismiss how difficult it is to stop being a fan of somebody if they've provided you with like hours and hours of free content over the last however many years it is you know consistently you're always going to get i don't know how many hours worth of content per week from this redact and it kind of occupies your background space and allows you to do the chores around your home maybe do work whatever it may be all those things are things that people are not going to willingly put to one side because it's hard to replace it with something else if you if you only listen to dsp for the majority of your life in content wise where else are you going to get that content to replace it you have to actively go and find it and stuff that takes time that's long so it makes sense to just like hold on to him you know because why not even though he's a redax why not he's you know you've known him for this long anyway why drop him now and you name drop me for drama purposes you have no content of your own i'm not going to give you more free content you're out of your mind you see <laughs> i wanted to have a real conversation with someone and it didn't happen right mm. <clears throat> so then fast forward to march mm. and what happened was completely unrelated to anything in that realm of discussion. Side Scrollers was a new podcast that was relaunching on the internet. It was a podcast that was run by Stuttering Craig, someone who in the past, over a decade ago, I had great deal. In a I had gone to a convention. That fucking voice. In a piece. as a guest. Yeah. I was at the height of my YouTube popularity. Yeah. And it was his convention. He had me there as a guest. Before then, I'd actually hung out with this guy at, a, at a, another convention, MAGFest. Um, I was a fan of their website 15 years ago, screwtech.com okay. and stuff like that. So he had reached out to mm -hmm. me and said, hey, I know we haven't talked in years, but we're looking for guests for our show. Yeah. And I said, I'll be a guest. Why not? And I saw their show and their show is a variety show. Well, mm. ahem, their show was a variety show where they would talk about games and news. Now it's not anymore. Now they've actually used my interview as a platform to change their show and get popularity. But we'll what's, what's the problem with that? He think, he likes to think he's such a big deal. You're not that big of a deal, bro. People will, and and it's not even a good big deal. People are literally waiting for you to just fail and to fall on your fucking ass and to have to be brought back down to reality. That's why I look. That's why I wait and w watch you for most of the time. Point and laugh and wait for the comic retribution to come around because for some reason, even though he's you know he has been quote unquote cancelled in some respects, he hasn't really faced the true consequences of his action he's been able to get away with murder for a long 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 time so you kind of keep watching hoping that he's going to get his kind of just deserves so the way he kind of likes to spin it as if people are like watching him because he's some sort of big deal or something it's just it's a strange angle to go about it and what's the problem with them changing their angle of their show because of your sh your interview and because of how that kind of maybe changes the direction of what they're doing
doing. What's the, what's the problem with that? We'll talk about that later. That's what regular people actually do. They listen to their audience. They see what's happening. They see the fucking, you know, reception they're getting from people and they kind of adjust course. They don't just be pig headed and do what you do for fucking a million years. So basically, I, I say I'll be a guest on your show. But okay. But they completely changed the deal. Uh -huh. The deal was originally, I'm just going to be a guest. We'll talk about a variety of topics. It'll be a fun show. Then it becomes no one wants you to be a guest. On, you know what? I'd actually, I, I would actually like to see DSP on a podcast, though, to be fair. Like talking to other humans. Because I think he's so deranged. He's so dumb and clueless about the world. And he's so um, living in his own bubble and secluded from everyone. It would actually be quite entertaining to see him talk to other people like and have to have back and forth with people have people call him out on his bullshit i'd actually like to see that but most people wouldn't want to do it because he's insufferable right and he's fucking a headache to talk to right like even that side scrollers interview by the end of it those guys were legitimately exhausted because he just does something to your brain talking to somebody like this on a you know at, at a long enough basis but i actually wouldn't mind seeing him on a panel show i'm not gonna lie or as part of a regular podcast thing it actually be quite entertaining comes oh well, what we want to do is we want to be the exclusive place for you to finally get that interview that you've always wanted well, i didn't really always want an interview i only wanted the interview because people were talking so negatively about me right so i was promised that this was going to be a fair interview mm -hmm. where I was going to be able to say my piece about all this stuff that people say about me over the years. Mm -hmm. And then after the interview, basically, I was going to get to be a guest on the show. Mm -hmm. That I needed to get through this interview first, but once I did, I could be a, a guest. And mm -hmm. it would be just like everyone else who'd been on the show. At that point, mm -hmm. for over a month, people had been guests on the show. No one else had to go through an interview, just me. Okay? Yeah, because your dark so side feel, bro. Why else would people want you to be on there? Come on, man. Why else would they want you to be on it? Come on, be be for real. Be for real for once. Come on, bro. Be for fucking real. This interview, okay? I get paid nothing for this interview, for the record. It's just me giving them over five hours of my time. Come to find out, was this a fair interview? No. All they had done was talk to all of my haters and detractors for, like, weeks. Got uh -huh. all of their negative side of the story. Literally never spoke to a single person about the positive side of things. All they did was research negative shit about me. And so they went into the interview with the mindset that they wanted to get me to confess to all these heinous things that I had done over the years. Wow, that's a great way to approach an interview, isn't it? They lied and told everyone that the next day... I you know what's funny? He wanted the interview. He said the interview was great after it happened. He said the interview went fantastic. Even though his fans told him it went, it was a disaster, he was so delusional, he actually felt he did a good job. He felt he disproved all the rumors. He clarified everything. That would be the one-stop shop where everyone could go and get their, answers, question, their, their questions answered. And then after the fact, when they started reading out Super Chats and they started engaging with detractors and shit, that's when he changed his mind about it but after the interview right after it he was perfectly fine even when he was there and they asked him hey how did the interview go did you enjoy it he said yes or i think one of the guys was like oh were we too harsh on you were we grilling you too much he's like no 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 it's actually been really really fair he was very 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 encouraged about the interview then obviously when the tone changed around it and he actually started to clock on what was happening that's when he changed his tune but I love how he retcons and basically changes reality to fit his fucking narrative. It's fucking stupid. After the interview, they were going to have a decompression show where they play games. And then they were going to have a follow-up interview with me later. None of that happened. After the interview, instead, they did a, a hit piece on me. Basically for a, a hit piece. Fuck off. He's hip. The hit piece to him is basically having people on there who don't agree with what he says or who question his narrative question how he interprets certain things you call out his bullshit and his lies and hold him accountable that is a hit piece this guy is fucking de deplorable man the whole day they just crapped on me and made all negative references and took in a ton of money as they should dollars that's that's what anger that's the real anger to him the real anger is that there were people going on side scrollers sending them guys loads of tips because the interview was good we didn't have a lot of hope, us detractors. We didn't have a lot of hope. We were thinking it was going to be a slow, a softball, shitty interview. There was some indication that the main guy, I forgot his name from Side Scrollers, was a bit of a fucking DSP simp. He was having a bit of a freak out. It was making people be worried about the interview. Then the interview came around and those guys knocked it out of the fucking park. And people were relieved. They were like happy. They were like, thank you. Finally, we have an interview where this guy is getting his feet held to the fire. He's getting grilled. He's being made feel uncomfortable. 
unbelievable. He's basically facing the reality of how regular people think about him and shit. And it was great to see him squirm and have that weird squeaky voice that he yeah, felt like he had a throat in his, frog in his throat. And obviously be a fucking questioned by, um, what's his name? By Keemstar as well, that confrontation and a few other people as well. We loved it. That's why people were so gracious and were sending them tips. But it was absolutely killing DSP that he wasn't getting some of that love and some of those tips back at him because he thought that Side Scrolls interview was going to get him more fans. But it did the opposite. He received from my detractors and haters. Not only that day, but they continued to milk this for weeks on <laughs> he end getting months. Milked. It was months. You're later. a low cow. What do you expect, bro? To get me on the show or get onto my content. Get onto he my to content. Me. This he guy is... would not stop. He's so Basically, angry. He saw me as He's a big so cash upset. Cow and he wanted to keep riding those coattails. Now, since Pause. that show, all right, <clears throat> they have basically gotten some notoriety in the conservative political community which is hilarious because when they started the show it, they always said it was not going to be about politics now the only attention they get is when they talk about politics so what bro right so what they're pivoting their content what's wrong with him he gets so upset when people do different things to try to engage an audience or to try to find an audience or to grow in his head, everybody should just do the same thing they did when they started. So Side Scroller should be exactly the same show that it was when he was first listening to it, when he was fucking 21 or whatever how old he was. Like, people can change. People can adapt. People can, you know, whatever, correct course to basically keep the lights on, to make sure they find an audience, whatever it may be. That's not a bad thing. Not everybody has the luxury of doing the same thing for fucking 15 plus years. Like, fucking LDSP political show that's their show now um all bolstered by when i was on it and by, by the way my interview continues to be the most watched thing they've ever done the funny part about it is the interview never actually did anything in the realm of what i wanted the whole point of the interview that i wanted to do was that people who don't know about me can watch the interview learn and then there's no questions anymore about that stuff in the end all that interview ever did was it went around my detractor circles. That's it. It didn't actually hit mainstream. No one really cared about that interview outside of the detractors. So it didn't really get to serve the purpose. But I'll say this, at the very least, basically all the bullshit about those those negative things, those questions, those accusations, the conspiracies, it all went away. If you don't notice, no one... <laughs> no, really it, no, it it. no, it never. No, it never. You just stopped answering them. The questions never go away. The accusations never go away. The reality of it never goes away. You just ban everybody that objects objects to your narrative or questions you or pushes back slightly. That's what he does. He runs an act like it's actually North Korea at fucking DSP's stream in DSP stream chat. There is no dissenting voices. There is no people questioning him. There is no, um, you know, grilling. There's nothing whatsoever. If you have any objection, even if it's just him stating a fact or him an opinion about a game and you have an opposing opinion, if you say it too forthrightly, you could get banned. He doesn't like anybody saying anything the opposite to him. Yet all attention has to be on DSP and you have to agree with everything he says. It's absolutely heinous. That's why he doesn't see or hear it. And obviously he buries his head in the sand also. My stream and talks about it anymore because I've already said my piece and I'm not <laughs> wasting time anymore with that shit. I'm done with it. I told you guys I'm done with those topics. We're okay, get to, with, get to right? the mic clump stuff. Come on, get to the mic clump stuff. Hurry up. So, after that, I made it my philosophy to stay out of drama and okay. I said, i'm not going to be doing any interviews Great. i'm not going to be doing any kind of anything with anyone even uh -huh. though people did reach out to me oh i want to interview phil and this or that even this this or that. mudahar or whatever mudahar oh, i'm going to pay you five thousand dollars for an interview and i said i don't want your money i'll do an interview but we're not talking about this drama i've already addressed it all the conspiracies are just that I'm not wasting my time. If you want to have an intelligent discussion about interesting topics. Intelligent discussion. Bro, you're not actually intelligent. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're actually not. You're not that interesting. As a person, really. The interesting thing about you is how you've been able to get away with being who you are for 15 plus years, for the most part. That's what's the most interesting thing about you. You're an absolute freak. No one can figure it out. Like, how is it possible that someone like this exists and has a fan base? That's the most interesting part about you. No one really cares about your opinions and stuff. That's the problem with it. Because, and it's partly his fault. Because he's ostracized himself or he's, you know, placed himself in a bubble and he's withdrawn from any contact with human beings. You know, why, why would you want to listen to him 
you know, with any, about anything else. He has no idea about the world outside of, you know, of, of the world outside of his snort fort. Like, literally nothing whatsoever. Even though he's fucking 41 years old, he is really an infant when it comes to his mind and how he thinks about things. So, you're not that interesting, unfortunately, DSP. The moment you bring up drama, I'm gone. And then he ghosted me and <laughs> I'm never gone. contacted me ever again. Because all these people want is drama. They don't actually Duh. talk about facts like fucking... Well, also goals. they want to talk to you. All Come on, is man. Milk drama so this guy is awful. On YouTube. They're all fucking greedy. So anyway, I stayed out of it. Completely, 100%. And uh -huh. I didn't address any more of this bullshit for the rest uh -huh. of 2023. And things went smoothly. However, there were still people who tried to pull me in. Right? These idiots trying to get me to go on a fucking podcast that I never was never involved in whatsoever. And they lied about that and tried to make shit up and talking shit about me. People making documentaries about me. Right? Which is hilarious. The whole term documentary is hilarious. Because if all you do is research shit that's already on the internet. And you regurgitate it into a two hour video. And all you do is add a little bit of commentary. That's not a documentary. Yes, it is. That's a definition of a documentary. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean the documentary isn't valid. You cannot like it. You're allowed not to like the documentaries. You're allowed to think they're reductive. You're allowed to think they're redundant. You're allowed to think they're repetitive. You're allowed to think they're fucking surface level. You're allowed to think that. But they're documentaries, bro. They're still... That's what a documentary is. How else are they meant to gather information about you if it's not through researching little tidbits that exist out there and adding their commentary? <laughs> that's the fucking definition of a documentary you fucking idiot oh this he's a legend <laughs> you've done everyone else did work for you all you did was regurgitate the, co the toxicity and the and the conspiracy you added really nothing besides a little bit of commentary on top that's not a documentary it doesn't even add anything all it does is kind of summarize all the negative shit people have said so with all that going on, right, people come, oh, well, you, will you do an interview with the guy who did the documentary and this or that? And ultimately, I said, no, I'm not doing any of that, yes, right? I'm staying out. And the funny part yes, is, yeah. someone actually asked me a question last year, and it resonated with me. They said, you know, Phil, all these people on the internet are constantly talking negatively about you. Any of these people... Because you're, a neg because you're a negative person. You were once referred to as the king of hate. You actually, em you know, embrace that name, and all of your fucking content was you know, around hate. You rant and you moan about everything. You complain, you bitch, you cry when you play Street Fighter. You wrangle your fucking audience and stuff. You are a pretty hate-filled person. There is not a lot of good things about you, really. I don't know why he's so surprised that people talk negatively about him when he's quite a negative person. <laughs> his, his lack of self-awareness is fucking frightening, but that's one of the key tenets of being a real prime champions league worthy fucking locale is having world-class levels of fucking lacking of self-awareness it's absolutely one of the tenets of it actually like reach out to you to talk to you right uh -huh. did they ever go to you for information or to get your side of the story no and i answered very honestly no not why would once. they why would all they this time, why would I've they been on YouTube and all the negative videos and the documentaries and everything done not once has anyone ever made a legit effort to get my actual side of anything? Instead, it's always we believe all the time. But you always lie, though. What's the point of asking you if you're going to lie? He lied to the side-scroller's face and said the WWE Champions thing wasn't him. He said the bank leaks weren't his. Can you imagine? The bank leaks that were obtained through fucking social engineering that were pretty clear that they were his because of all the things, because again, he shares too much anyway. He talks too much. So you were able to fucking look back at his streams and be able to link when he mentioned eating a certain thing, when he mentioned going to a certain place, you could see them listed on his fucking bank records, which obviously also showed that he spends way more money than he should do playing fucking WWE champions. But then he goes to his fans and begs and pleads them for money to pay for his groceries, to pay for his bill, and to take his fucking horse of a wife out for dinner every single week when he makes more than enough money to do all those things he lives in the house with one person who works part-time and a fucking cat yet he thinks he needs double he needs two hundred thousand a year to fucking survive it's absolutely crazy he manipulates and takes advantage of his fan base and lies to them and feigns fucking feigns poverty to extract as much money as he wants from them and the bank records show that and he lied to the side scroller's face 
And he said, nah, that's not mine. Bro, who else is it? You think somebody's running deep cover and has been trying to frame you for what? Years upon years and build up an entire banking credit, you know, banking records that really mirror your real life. Is that what somebody done? Really? Is that what you're trying to make people believe? So people don't bother asking him questions because he always lies. That's the problem with it. He doesn't like answering questions anyway. He bans you if you have an opposing opinion. And if you ask him a question, he's going to lie. What's the point of talking to him? Toxic shit and just report the toxic shit and that's it. Even the side scrollers interview, which at first seemed like it was going to be neutral, was revealed to be an actual attempt to get me to basically fess up to shit I It wasn't an attempt. It wasn't a neutral interview. They both went, they, they went into it for help, wanting to help you clear the air. Part of clearing the air is admitting your wrongdoings. DSP didn't want to admit his wrongdoings. He didn't even want to admit the begging thing was a bad thing. He thought it was a necessary evil. To him, he thinks begging fans for tips and donations is actually perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with begging your fans. There's nothing wrong. He actually thinks it's actually more honourable to beg your fans for tips and donations than it is to accept sponsorships and you know from from companies. Like he thinks the burden should be always placed on the fans to support him because I'm a crowdfunded individual. It's like, come on, bro. I didn't do for their own purposes. They yeah, yeah, to yeah. To, oh my God, look, we did it. We got Dark Side Phil to spill the beans on everything and now we can be notable because of it and it didn't work. Because it's not, the shit they were trying to get me to do wasn't true to begin with. So obviously it never was going to work. These people were fucked up, all right? So basically, I stayed out of all of this all year but all right all right always in the back of my head I'm, I'm always wondering and i've told you guys this too i don't think anyone's ever going to give me a fair shake on the internet i just don't believe it it seems like everyone is out for the drama everyone's out for personal gain as they should what's be what's better to completely spin something in a way that makes me look horrible for clickbait you're already horrible dsp you, you're already a horrible to person actually show me in a fair light i'm not even saying show me in a positive light i'm saying show me in a fair light i want to see if the interview does this let's see because he's talking all this talk but this interview isn't going to go well for him i don't think this documentary is going to do him actually anything well it's not going to do the things that he thinks it's going to do but he's think he thinks it does so i want to see what happens when this documentary, imagine Mike Klum does a good job of actually having a balanced documentary where he, he tries his best to interview as many people who are pro DSP as they are anti DSP. Imagine if he does that. I don't think it's possible to find enough people to kind of, you know, um, balance out all the detractors out there because DSP is a irredeemable piece of shit. But if he's able to find them, I would love to see what DSP says after the fact when people are able to see all the detractors say what they say, all of pro DSP people say what you say, say what they say in support of him, have him defend himself in his own words and then let the, the public decide in the same way they did with the Boogie documentary. The Boogie documentary had all the info, final information about Boogie. It had him talking about his own experiences and his view on certain things. It had interviews with people that know him and whatnot. And people were able to make up their own impression of Boogie and they reacted to it and did videos and shit. That was a good way to kind of get people to sort of like, you know, see him for what he is, make your own mind up. And for the most part, you know, in, you know, Boogie obviously, you know, contests some information bits and stuff and he's trying to manipulate people with some sort of things. But there is nothing to kind of argue about. The documentary is what it is. It kind of lays you bare. Then it's up to the public to make up their impression. It doesn't even try to like throw out a narrative. It just explains what you explained. So I'm curious to see if people do still surmise at the end of this documentary that DSP is a piece of shit, will he accept it? Will he be okay with it or will he cry and still complain? That's what I'm curious to see. That's what I'm curious to see. To actually have another side of the story, to see what it's actually like from my perspective, to go through this, to live through all of this slander and nonsense that's happening. <laughs> Young old vibes, is DSP a little person? No, 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 he's a regular person. He's actually six foot, weirdly enough. He does have the nasally voice of a, you know, of a, maybe a little person or somebody that would be like Joe Rogan size, but he's actually six foot, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. That's the actual funny thing about him. He's not actually short. Um, 
Big up um, Wooly Dingo as well. Net Watcher says here, yeah, I feel DSP is the type of person who genuinely cannot think until he speaks. Yeah, of course, 100%. But that mostly comes because he's so, um, you know, he's so fucking, he's such a shut-in, you know? He's, he's basically refused to engage with the outside world. He does everything in his power not to talk to other human beings outside of his stream chat. You know, he doesn't have any friends. He doesn't have any colleagues or anything. He doesn't hang out with anybody. He just stays in his snort fort with his wife that's barely there, his cat, and that's it. Do you know what I mean? And that's why he's so, like, warped when it comes to some of the things he speaks about. It's, it's really kind of crazy to watch him speak and to try to, like, make sense of the world or try to interact with regular people it's absolutely funny that's why when you see him on side scrollers it's really interesting because he can't he has this we he's kind of like tense and his voice is cracking and shit it's just odd he's an odd odd species i swear to god he is happened to me for all these years to just be a guy trying to get by with my community and having a good time and ignoring all the <laughs> having bullshit, a good time yeah and then yeah, having yeah. To hear that constantly this stuff is going on outside right so basically all right I got contacted by someone who is a neutral party, someone who does not stand to benefit by actually portraying me in an incredibly negative way uh -huh. because it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it basically, let me put it this way. If you're someone who wants to actually make real content, if uh -huh. you're not someone who's a drama hound, if you're not someone who is a, uh, Again, a keem star, a review tech, someone who all of your content is based on making someone look bad. Uh huh. Right? Uh huh. If you're someone who actually wants to make legit content, then you actually have to be fair, because the what do you have to be fair to make legit content? Again, documentaries should try to be fair, but they don't have to be. What? Why did? What? Why did they owe you that? It's somebody's interpretation of how you act or maybe gathering bits of information and trying to present it in a clear way as possible. But they don't have to do it in your favor. They don't have to do it to be fair to you. Why do they owe you that? The moment that you're not, who else would ever want to work with you again? Yeah, right? I love if, that little I love that little manipulation. If you're not fair to me, no one would want to work with you. Yeah, someone, yeah, if yeah. If you portray someone in an unfair way that makes them look awful, then no one else is ever going to want to work with you either. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. It has to be some way where you're actually being fair to the, the subject matter. All right? So, basically, I was contacted by Mike Klum, mm -hmm. who recently did a documentary on Boogie. And before everyone freaks out about this, because I know a lot of people saw the Boogie documentary and were like, wow, that documentary was not positive. That documentary was very negative. It shows all the weaknesses of Boogie, all his shortcomings, the fact that he basically pissed his life away, all his money away, that he's a toxic guy who falls into drama and he has all these issues. You're right. But that's what they wanted to do with that documentary. You understand? Okay. That's actually what they wanted to portray in that documentary. That was the whole point. To show that side of his life, which I guess they felt had never been really revealed before. Um... That's exactly what was what they were going for, okay? I was contacted by Mike, and he says, basically, this is fascinating. There's people out there who want to see a documentary about you, but he didn't know that much about me, okay? So, <laughs> by the Mike is playing him like a fiddle as well. He's playing him really well. He's kind of really being nice about him. I swear to God, he's playing him so well. Um, obviously, just to make sure he gets the interview, so fair play to him, but DSP has no idea he's getting played. That's the problem with being a shut-in. You have no social awareness. You have no discernment. So he actually doesn't know he's getting basically manipulated. Like, if anything, Mike Clum is milking him the same way that Tom Dark was trying to milk him. He doesn't realize it, though. <laughs> the way, and just for the record, this was months ago. This was he not doesn't realize it, man. This was months oh, ago. Oh, God. Okay, where we actually began talking okay. about scenes about stuff like this. Cool. And basically, through a series of conversations, okay, that I had with this guy. As I explained my story to him, he was basically like, so you're, this is completely different from Boogie. Yo, big up um, Eddie D. DSP has enough money to pay Mike Clump to at least persuade him into making a puff piece. Um, is that, is that been, is, is that been, um, is that a thing people have been saying? That DSP is paying Mike Clump? I don't think so. 
this guy is very adverse to paying anybody. He doesn't even pay people that make his fucking artwork on his fucking, you know, videos and stuff. His thumbnails, nothing. He doesn't pay for editing. He refuses it. He takes everything for free. Everything he wants, he gets given for free. Or he doesn't he doesn't offer even to pay people. So I don't think DSP would offer Mike Clum money. If anything, Mike Clum knows if he does his documentary to the same level he did the Boogie documentary, it's going to be a fucking banger. It will definitely get more views than Boogie. It will definitely get more views than Boogie. Or it will definitely spawn a whole entire micro universe around it, like content. That's what the Side Scrollers interview did. Maybe the Side Scrollers interview itself didn't get a lot of views, but it did spawn loads of reactions and loads of other bits of chatter and loads of other threads. So that interview will actually do numbers. So I think Mike Club is very aware of that. So if I was him, I will just put my own money into it because it's very much one of the only opportunities you're going to get to get a lot of of this kind of content out of him especially in this you know he's in this vulnerable state where he wants to rewrite the narrative and all this sort of bullshit i think i don't know i don't think dsp would offer him money and i think mike clum knows there's more money to be got from him just putting it out on him by himself i think so um i'm not too sure what you guys think yeah it's not even close my life is nothing like his i'm not in the situation he's in you know, my in my opinion, and this is my opinion. You know what I've always loved about DS about low cows? I love that low cows have this superiority complex among each other. They're all messes. All of them every low cow's a mess. Every low cow is almost um as bad as each other. But for some reason, they think they're better than one another. Oh, I'm not as much of a low cow as that guy. It's like a weird thing that low cows have. They have this weird superiority complex where they actually think they are better than others when essentially they're all the same. They're all basically people who, you know, can't get out of their own way. And most people are like willing or actively rooting for their fucking demise. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what most low cows are to people. They're a source of you know, nonstop car crash entertainment. But they actually think they're actually better than what they are. It's a really strange thing. The lack of self-awareness is really shocking with most locales. But I love the little infighting and the little things that they have where DSP's like, oh, because they're both, because Wings and Boogie are two fat dudes, he, he kind of thinks less of them, right? Because they're both morbidly obese. He kind of thinks, oh, yeah, I'm better than them because what? I'm skinny fat. Like, huh? Opinion. Other people can disagree. I feel like, in my, my position is a much better position than his. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like I'm a better person than him. Like, honestly, this guy actually thinks he's better than the detractors. He's better than other locales. Like, I'm just amazing. Everything I do is the best. Everything I do is correct. I did nothing wrong. Like him, he's in horrible hell. Financially, he's distraught. He can't make ends meet. He's desperate, which is why he's on things <laughs> like this lol. Aren't you desperate too? You beg for money for fucking tips and shit from your audience. Aren't you desperate too? You refuse to get a real job. You refuse to accept sponsors to kind of, you know, what's that word called? To um, um, offset some of the money that you're trying to make or to make up for the shortfall from your fans. You put all the fucking, you know, onus and responsibility and burden on your fans to essentially support your lifestyle through the charity, through their own charity. Some of them are using their fucking disability checks and shit to pay for you. Uh, some of them are even, you know, out there on the fucking streets and they're fucking keeping your lights and you have no shame about that. Come on, bro. You're desperate too. You bet. You literally tell your fans, hey, I haven't got many tips in an hour. I need this, this, I need this, I need this. It's like, God almighty. You are the, you are the living embodiment of desperation yourself, brother. I'll cow show where he's. You're big up Eddie D. Look at how many gifted memberships he has over 7,000. 7, um, those, go that goes to the man's head. Exactly, 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 Eddie D. Getting on his hands and knees and being mistreated by Keemstar to make money. Um, He's there's honestly they're honestly all the same there's nothing way there's nothing they're all the same getting on your hands and knees and doing content with keemstar and letting him fucking ragdoll you in public and stuff is just as embarrassing as getting on stream and begging your fans to give you tips to pay for groceries or to pay for cat food to take your wife out for dinner that's as embarrassing as what the those guys are doing with keemstar Especially when you consider some of those guys hated Keemstar before. It's as embarrassing. There's nothing, you know, 
there's no degrees of embarrassing there. They're both in the same fucking category of embarrassing. In a real desperate way, right? That's very much not the case, okay, with me. I have a successful business. I enjoy coming to stream with you guys every day. I love what I do for a living. I'm making it happen, right? I'm getting out of a horrible financial position in my life which happened already and I'm all, I'm climbing out of it. It's slow progress. No, you're not. You're never coming out of it. This is the thing as well. I love that he dangles that in front of his fans. You're never going to climb out of it. You're never, ever going to climb out of anything. You're still going to be the same loser redact that you are now until the end of time. It's never going to change. He kind of, he kind of needs that anyway for his business. He needs to dangle that possibility that it could change, but it's never going to change. That's why he's here begging all the time. He actually doesn't want it to change. Your big up Austin Casey, appreciate you, brother. Gig up has. I got my tax return back, so I'm giving you your cut of it because you helped me get through my work days with your content. <laughs> big up Austin Casey. <laughs> tax return hype. Tax return hype. Whoa, whoa. Yo, when I used to get my tax returns, my because I don't get them anymore because now my taxes get filed correctly. Damn it, right? I, I don't work for startups anymore because when I used to work for startups, they'd always file my taxes incorrectly and I wouldn't, you know, I'd got to pay too much tax and you get your fucking tax credit and we hit, hit fucking nice. But now I work for fucking corporations and shit. They file your taxes correctly so I don't get tax credits anymore. But when I did used to get them, best believe when that fucking tax credit hit my account, it went straight to fucking eight balls. It went straight to bottles of whiskeys and it went straight to tickets to raves. I honestly regret it so much. I regret that I spent so much of that tax return money on drugs, alcohol, and tickets to techno parties. I have nothing to show for it. When really what I should do is what most people do when they get tax returns is that you just put it into your savings straight away. You might take out $100 and fucking pay for some things, but for the most part, you take out the most tax credit and you put it in your savings, right? You might take 10% and use that to maybe go and get a steak dinner, maybe go take out your fucking wife or your girlfriend or take your kids out to a fucking theme park and stuff but he put most of it in savings agostino didn't do that he put all that money into eight balls he put all that money into booze he put all that money into tickets to go to techno parties he put all that money into ubers he put all that money into menthol cigarettes even though i don't smoke even though i can't smoke and even though it causes me fucking massive coughing fits i want to look cool in a smoking area so i'd buy packs of menthol cigarettes i'd have a pocket full of fucking class a's and i'd go outside and i'd be stomping from side to side my face leaking with fucking sweat acting as if i was fucking normal and then and then i'd come back home with hardly any money and be wondering wow how did i spend almost 500 pounds on one night out i'm disgusting i'm deplorable don't follow my example don't follow my example big up austin casey <laughs> but it's definitely progress right my story is basically that even though I've made all of these improvements over the years and I am not representative of what people make me out to be anymore, maybe one day, 10, 15 years ago, I was really bad. I was obstinate. I was stubborn. I was stupid. I said and did. You know what's funny? You know what's funny about Freakos? Honestly, you know what's funny? I must be the only... And again, I say this with some level of like regret. I never really had, in my most crazy party era, there was never really anything to do with sex involved. I swear to God, there was nothing really to do with sex involved. And I rarely, if ever, even hooked up with anybody. It was mostly me just being the life of the party. I swear, that was mostly my main fucking thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to go out, I wanted to party, and I wanted to be the life of the fucking party. I wanted to offer everybody drugs. I wanted to offer, I wanted to buy people shots and shit. That was all I was on. It's really odd to say this, but I swear to God, there was never an indication of even hooking up. I just wanted to be the guy in the middle of the group. Like, go Aggie, go Aggie, go, go, go. That's what I wanted to do. That's all I wanted to do. <laughs> it wasn't even about freak offs. I just wanted to be the center of attention. I wanted all eyes on me. I wanted to be Bridezilla. I wanted to be the nightclub Bridezilla. I wanted everybody to come to my party, my wedding, my dance floor. Look at me. Look at me shake my money maker that's what i wanted to do strange 
Honestly, so strange because I was involved in, and again, maybe because I was so smashed, I wouldn't even realize if somebody was giving me signals, anybody, because I wasn't aware. I was just in my own world, like, oots, 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 oots. There was no idea of recognizing who was on what. I was just caught up in my own fucking little world, you know? I swear on my life. It's really strange, really strange to say this, but there was no freak offs for me. But I wish I did have a freak off. I wish I had more freak offs when I was out there. Consensual ones, by the way. Consensual freak offs with of age people. But most of the time, I was just feeling myself, you know? Did awful things, right? <laughs> and I got away with it, basically. <sighs> and now here we are 15 years later. And I'm still able to run a business, albeit a much smaller scale business than what I used to do. But I'm still popular. Business high. I still have a fan base, and people still talk about me, right? For 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 the wrong reasons, by the way. They don't talk about you for the right reasons, dear. The problem is constant misrepresentation. And you might say, "Well, I don't get it because you you already have addressed I don't, everything." I, right. I don't I don't get I've it. I addressed <laughs> all of the bullshit and nonsense out there. However, I addressed it here, right? And no one listens to me when I say it on my own content. No one. Mm. This is me talking to my audience who already, it's like, it's like what do they call it? You're preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. You guys already know the deal, right? The fact is most people don't. There's no central place you can go on the internet for the story of Dark Side Phil. Mm. It's this detractor content, this detractor content, this mm. documentary that's way outdated and has outdated information, this documentary that just regurgitates the detractor conspiracy theories. There's literally nowhere you can go to say, I want to learn about Dark Side Phil. Why does everyone talk about this guy? I don't get it. And get an actual answer that's... Can't they learn it on your own fucking podcast? What are you talking about here, man? What are you talking about here? Fair and makes sense. Okay. And so, after having ta talked to Mike, all right, the idea that we came up with was to do a documentary mm -hmm. that's going to, for the first time ever, and I'm going to say this, likely for the last time ever, cover my actual real story. Me growing up. Okay. What it was like. Okay. Right? How I got into games, you know? Boring. What it was like when I was a kid. Asked my parents, you know, what was it like raising Phil and stuff like that. Wow. <laughs> We're going to get Mama Phil and Papa Phil. It's so funny, too, because if I'm not mistaken, isn't DSP's dad like a former Marine or something? DSP's dad's like a former Marine, a very successful guy in his career, and he gave birth to one of the most biggest losers in the world. What an utter disappointment he must be to his dad. His dad gave him all the, all the tools, every, every opportunity to make something of himself, and he ends up being a full-time beggar on the internet. Imagine the disappointment. He ends up being one of the most derided, one of the most hated people on the fucking internet. And he begs his dented, um, you know, f fan base for fucking money to pay for his fucking groceries. Imagine how sad you'd be as a father to think that's your kid. And his mum, the one that offered to pay for his fucking honeymoon, but he said, no, I have debts to pay. Pay off my debts, please, mummy imagine i would love to actually hear them because they are partly responsible for this monster they are partly responsible for raising this kid who or raising this man who is so divorced from reality who has no concept of kind of being a grown-up in any way shape or form who acts like a fucking man child but thinks he's an actual adult i would actually like to hear from them i'm not gonna lie this might actually be a very fascinating interview all for the wrong reasons and all not to do with dsp right um, going through the arcade days, going through the, the Street Fighter days, c growing up in arcades and how it became this kind of... Uh, hey, big up my guy, Rodeo Brito. Big up Rodeo Brito. What's going on, my guy? Big up Rodeo Brito. Um, I think you're right there about BDSP being nuts from Wish. You know what has been fascinating for me when it comes from locales? And I'm fascinated by this. This is, this is what I'm fascinated about. Locals for me, since I've discovered locals, Boogie, Wings, DSP for the most part, the ones I kind of stick to with some LTG stuff there, I've been surprised, especially when it comes to Boogie, Wings and DSP, I never knew Narcissist could be so, it's, it's weird to say, I didn't know Narcissist could be so fat and ugly, but have so much self-confidence, if that makes sense. I thought to be a narcissist, you have to kind of accomplish things. You have to be somewhat accomplished and then your 
kind of like success kind of like emboldens you to feel like you shit doesn't stink and that you walk on water. I didn't know it was possible to have losers who are narcissists. That's that's the thing that kind of blew my mind when I started getting into locales. I didn't know that there was such a thing as guys and girls who are losers, who are actual bona fide losers who have narcissistic personality traits. I didn't think that was a thing. I look at DSP, I look at Wings, I look at Boogie, you look, especially Wings and Boogie, right? Morbidly obese guys who are like 400 plus pounds, who are essentially disgusting individuals in every way possible, but they think so highly of themselves. Like even Wings, Wings honestly thinks he's not a neckbeard. He thinks he doesn't fit into that caricature or the avatar of being a neckbeard. He thinks he's better than neckbeards. He thinks he's somehow uh, better than these guys he speaks about in his chat with anime, you know, avatars and things. That really blew my mind. I was like, wow. I always thought to myself, a narcissist was more so an accomplished individual, a successful person who lets the success get to them, and, you know, makes their head too big so they can't necessarily see any wrongdoing that they do. I didn't know you could be a loser and also be a narcissist. That blew my mind. I swear to God, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm not that aware, but that was one of the things I was like, wow, you can actually be a beggar like DS you can actually beg people online for money but still think you're a boss still think you're a hell of a businessman still think you're a successful person still think that you're somehow someone that people should be looking up to or something because you beg because you fucking shake your tin can every morning and every fucking evening for people to give you money to pay for your fucking groceries can you imagine the lack of fucking shame uh, how do they say almost fraternity culture and shit talking was encouraged, right? And how that carried encouraged. into my competitive Street Fighter career in the 2000s and how it became an innate part of who I was for a very long time. How eventually, after having a back injury and deciding to quit competitive Street Fighter- A back injury. I love how he talks as if like he was a fucking professional skateboarder or he used to fucking ride BMX. What's this back injury from? Imagine being such a- Imagine being such a fucking shut-in. Imagine being so avoidant of any form of physical exercise or any kind of physical movement that you injure your back to the point where you can't do anything more now. It's sort of like a self-fulfilling injury, right? It's sort of like you do it yourself in the hopes that you don't have to move anymore. But he talks about it as if like he was involved in some sort of fucking armed combat or something. And that's how he suffered his back injury. He suffered his back injury through just being, what? For being sedentary. He had a sedentary life is what led to his back injury, essentially. And instead of doing what regular people do, when you fucking twist your arm, when you strain yourself, and you actually have to work it out. You actually have to do some stretches. You actually have to move your body, get some motion back in that fucking rot rotary cuff or arm or tendon, whatever. He just said, no, that's it. I'm just going to sit more now. I'm going to stay more still. Like... <laughs> How that turned into a job becoming a YouTuber. Right and how I right. somehow got yeah. this popularity that doing voice. content on YouTube that not very many people were doing. Right, the improv commentary style. Improv um, commentary style. What? What is improv commentary style? What is this? Improv commentary style content. You mean like content? <laughs> you mean like commentary? Improv comedy style. Improv comedy style, what is that like code word for like acceptable racism? <laughs> is that what he's trying to say? Making it popular, right? I was the innovator of the video game <laughs> back in the day. I was. But look at this <laughs> innovator of the video game. <laughs> honestly, the ego. I wish I had this level of an ego. I wish I could honestly look at my content and say, I'm an innovator. I am the reason why people sit in front of a, a webcam and play video games. It's like, what? No, you're not. And even if you are, you do it terribly. Everybody has taken what you've done and they run. They fucking run to the fucking moon and beyond. And you're still stuck on level one as your podcast is fucking named. Like, what? I wouldn't. That's not something to be gloating about. Like, why are you the innovator and you're so far behind everybody else? Like, come on. He he just got a ring light, what, like a couple of years ago? <laughs> like, what? And you got it for free from a fan too or something. Like, come on, brother.
But most people won't give me credit for that because they want to, oh, it was this person or this person. I was the person who made it mainstream popular on YouTube. And then everyone else decided to run with it and change it up and do it differently. But I was the guy who made what? it. What? Patrick Emerson. The Fire Kid talked about dropping um, uh, KG. Okay, cool. Let's fucking stop um, DSP. He's talking out of his ass. Let's switch tact. Thank you, Patrick Emerson. Let's check that out right away. I want to see this right fucking now. Oh, my God. What the fuck has happened? Let's see what they said here. Let's see what they said here. Let's see what they fucking said here. I've already got okay. Let's get some. Let's get some. Let's get some guesses. Let's get some predictions here. I said previously, Brendan most likely is going to say that they came to a mutual agreement to let go of George. That's my prediction. My prediction is Brendan's going to say it was a mutual agreement. Um, me and George were talking all the time. I was on the phone to his mom. We are good together. He's going to say something like that. That's my theory. My theory is going to say something along those kind of lines. Me and Thing are fine. It's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong. Blah, 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 blah. He'll try and make complete light of the situation. That's my theory. What do you guys think in the stream chat? I think that's what he's going to say. He's going to try and make light of it or he's going to try and lie and say it never happened and people are making it up. Even though Brian Callen fucking confirmed it, right? So let me see actually if I can find the original email where fucking uh, BGL confirms that George got good douche. Let me see if I can find it here. Bear with me one second. Bear with me one second here. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see what was said here. There's like a BGL screenshot where he says, oh, um, what you call it? It's been gone. Let's see if I can find it. Bear with me at one second if I can fucking find this thing. Uh, George, George, George. There we go. I think this is it. I think this might be it. Let's see if I've got it here. Bear with me a second. And then we're going to see what fucking the fire and the kid guys have had to say about it because i'm fascinated to see what they said okay um so this is what originally happened right so this is bg this is hella mark carly bgl bgl somehow got in touch with george's mum, and this is what happened right so some emails here and this is bgl talking to george's mum. please send me the dm george's mum. well guess what Brendan's lawyer, <laughs> Brendan's lawyer, all one word, just called George and they let him go. They said they can't afford to pay him, which is funny, right? Imagine you can't afford to pay somebody. Imagine you can't afford to pay somebody. Imagine you can't afford to pay somebody. Where is it? Where's the fucking thing? Where's the fucking thing? Imagine you can't afford to pay somebody and you've got, where's the fucking car? Where is it? Ah, oh, I wish I had a picture of the car here. Where is it? I don't have the picture of the car. Do I have it here? There we go. Somewhere around here, right? Yeah, maybe it's this. Is it that? I think it might be that. There we go. Imagine you say you can't afford to pay somebody and then you've got this in your driveway. Imagine you say you can't afford to pay somebody and you just go out and you buy this. So after you fire somebody, you go and buy a Dodge Demon 170, which is allegedly going way above the fucking manufacturer's recommended retail price of like a hundred fucking dollars. It's selling for 300,000. Even if you got a good deal with that guy at the chop shop, whatever it may be, he probably paid somewhere north of 150, north of 150 grand for this car. Maybe it's financed, who knows? But still, he's got a ton of cars already. He added this car to his fleet because Rogan's got it. But then he buys this after firing somebody because he can't afford to keep them on. Can you imagine how much that would absolutely piss you off? Okay, cool. Anyway, um, he can't afford to pay him. What the fuck? Wow. Now George. George has to figure out. This is B this is George's mum crying to BGL about this, right? George has to figure out how to get back home. Um, um uh home on what little savings he has. Wow, life is really strange, and so are people. So BG so Brendan fires George just before Christmas because he he allegedly cannot afford to keep him as an employee at Fitboy, even though he said he does a good job there. Then 
Soon after, he buys a Dodge Demon 170, one of the rarest cars out there, especially since Dodge are going to stop making these cars soon. I read somewhere, I saw some YouTube videos, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they're not going to be making these as, as often as they are. So they're, they're in hot demand, there's not many of them available, they drive really fast, they've got an amazing range of, you know, really high horsepower, all that fucking good shit, they do wheelies, Rogan speaks about them, great muscle cars, everybody's fucking creaming their nuts over them. So Brendan goes and buys it even after saying that he can't afford to keep this guy on right he can't afford to keep this guy on but he ends up buying this fucking car can you fucking imagine that right then people call him out and say fix it with george that shit wasn't right and brenda replies in the comments and says not sure what dumbass you're getting your info from kg still works for me <laughs> right that's what brenda basically says like you guys are lying i didn't say he's not working for me we're perfectly fine stop lying on me stop lying on me stop lying on me right but of course of course brian callen ends up being the person that fucking clarifies everything by answering the fucking email that BGL sent. I wish I could fucking get it. I wish I could get this email. I wish I had a copy of this email somewhere. But Brenda, Brian basically confirms in the email that George actually did get fired. Actually, I've got it right here. I've got the fucking email. Of course, I've got the fucking email. I found it on a TFATK subreddit right bloody now. So, Brian confirms the rumor because it's now just a rumor. Even though we've got evidence that BGL's mum said what she said to, to BGL in the DMs, that could have been finagled. But BGL was a very smart guy. He sends out a mass email, right, to all of those guys. And somehow, for some reason, Brian replies to the email and says, I didn't fire George. Like, look what he So, he basically confirms it. Brian Callan, actually... I didn't hire him, nor do I know he was fired until Lex let him go. And apparently we are still paying him. I'm also not talking to him. I'm also now talking to him to try to find him some work. I called him the second I heard. Remember, he's not my employee. <laughs> Brian doing the same thing he did to Chris to George. He's throwing George under the bus. He's feigning ignorance. Chris Delia wasn't my friend. I never knew Chris. We never hung out. We were never boys. I know. I don't know anything happened about Chris. I don't even know who Chris is. I don't even know his fucking surname. I've never been to his house. We're never boys. He did the same thing to fucking George. What a piece of shit. Remember, he's not my employee, but I care about the kid, obviously. So trying to help in any way I can. If you have any ideas, give them to me. He's now asking BGL to crowdsource to help him fucking brainstorm job opportunities for fucking Keto George. Like, go and do yourself a fucking favor, you absolute mongrel. So anyway, um, that's that's what Callan says. Next fucking DM, obviously, BGL goes up and says what he says. So, all of that to say, I'm curious to hear what these guys said about George. How are they going to explain it? This is the first time I'm watching it. We're going to react to it live, live via the power of the internet. My prediction is Brendan's going to try and downplay it and try and make it seem as if George and him came to an agreement. You know, me and George, we're always on the phone. We talk all the time. I was actually on his phone to his mum. Joanna was speaking to his mum all day. His wife has come to the fucking... You know, he's going to make up something. He's going to try and make it seem like it was a mutual agreement. But then, I'm pretty sure, as per usual, same thing that happened when the whole Kalila thing happened, Brian's going to come to his defence. Because there's one thing about Brian. He knows where his bread is buttered. Brian knows where his bread is buttered and he knows without Brendan, Ka Brendan Callan, Bren Brian knows without Brendan Shaw, his career would be mute, especially post-rape allegations. Brendan's the main reason why Brian has any kind of podcast career because Brian on his own, he's got too many fucking failed projects he's never fucking followed through on. So I'm pretty sure Brendan's going to try and downplay it and try and make it seem like it's all a big lie and a big misunderstanding and him and George are fine. And they came to mutual agreement to part ways. And then I'm pretty sure I've got a feeling that Brian's going to jump in and basically use his body as a human shield and basically say it was his fault or something. I, I don't know. Brian, Brian does that a lot. He's going to try and come in and fucking help Brendan out because he knows where his bread is buttered. He knows without Brendan, he doesn't have any money to pay his alimony and support his fucking second family. So that's what I think is going to happen. But let's see. Enough talk. Let's play the video. Let's see what they say here. Let's see what they say here. Okay, four, okay, 14 minutes. Okay, thank you, Severa Design. Thank you, Severa Design. You're a fucking legend. 
Thank you so much for that. I'll play a little bit from the start because I want to hear what they have to say, catching up from Christmas and shit, and then I'm going to skip to 14 uh, minutes. Thank you. Let's see what they say. This Let's is really the fighter and the kid. Come on, baby. Back. Yeah. They're gonna try and feign happiness that ah, everything's okay. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's try and let's let's see. They're gonna try and fake feign ignorance that everything's okay, and then they're gonna. Boys are back in town. Boys are back in town. You and I didn't really wish each other a Merry Christmas or a Happy New Year because we don't do that kind of stuff. Friends, I don't have because you hardly talk to each other, and you're not actually friends. friends. I don't have any good friends text me that stuff. But Happy some New business Year. people text me, which is nice. But yeah. as far as friends, friends, be no, we don't. Be because you're not actually friends. That's the reason you don't talk to each other outside of the podcast. <laughs> and the uh, relationship has been severely damaged ever since the fucking cancellation of Chris and Brian's rape allegations. Like it's never been the same again. The power imbalance has shifted back to Brendan. Brendan's a boss. Brian Callan's his employee. And they both just put up with each other. That's the main fact of it. Oh, the mustache is gone. He's got a beard now. He's, he's let go of the mustache. Look, he's fed up with it. The, the that beard is returned interesting you I, do we even do happy birthday not really uh, if you see like oh happy birthday man but you never text really. hey hold on can we no I, did you, hold on what now the, did you steal those from oprah okay now hold on these were given oh me. i know where i know where those I was, yeah. i've been in the hospital the last eight days 24 yeah. 7. did you steal those from the nurses at the now, NICU? now hold on Brandon, Those these are the Gaylord are, Fokker specials. I don't know. I think these are super streamlined and they look dangerously neutral. Hey, look at me. Yeah. They look so gay. <laughs> hey, look at me. Those look no, like no. you're confused. I love how we're starting off 2024 with the same level of, you know, um, hilarious fucking rib splitting humor we're used to from these guys. Gay humor right gay jokes dick jokes are probably going to be soon coming you know there's going to be some something relating to cucks happening very very soon i love it the same humor you know and love from two middle-aged men with families coming at you live and direct from thick boy studios love it love it love it it's about your pronouns well now that's different now maybe they look a little gender neutral that's what i was saying oh, they might oh you know what those are those oh, are the oh, female oh. or male shoes yeah, and these are the Where ones it's like, that go, it's for everybody. They came with my Tesla, my Tesla 3. I knew it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it. Yeah, they're the cuck shoe. And so... There we go. We cuck. Cuck references. Let's wait for the dick reference too. Let's wait for the dick references as well. Come on, let's wait for some sort of dick thing. Come on. Give us give us some dick sucking references. Come on. Come on. And that's cucks why are us. Cucks are us, and that's why I keep my little feet like that, and I can do no, that. No, seriously, what are you doing? All right, look. They were given to me by somebody for Christmas, and I find them very... Comfortable. comfortable and i actually thought you'd be like those are cool kicks. oh no i oh, don't know no. it's, uh, we're talking <laughs> I, I, we got started, I looked down and went whoa i looked at him and i went maybe i'll wear these to see what brendan thinks maybe he'll think they're cool kicks but they're not yeah they're not fake jordans that's why don't worry brendan if you brian if you buy some reps maybe brandon will, re will respect you but if you don't have any cool fake reps he won't respect you no they're like they're nurses not. and then they're like this weird off brand and they're also it? super cheap i guess they're made of recyclable material oh no yeah yeah, yeah 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 way too they're a little too comfortable you know what i mean hopefully they're like little rain. pillows on hey, my feet hope it doesn't rain yeah those things are gonna melt like a fake rolex well i you know when i wear them hey I will man say this. hey guess what guess what i'm bored already of the intro let's skip to the 40 minutes big up severe design i'm already bored of the actual podcast let's skip to actually 12 let's go to about 12 let's see what they say here all this fucking small talk avoiding the elephant in the room let's skip to what the actual meat and potatoes of the story is let's see how deplorable these guys are a little too much like but your height and weight, dude, you'll be around for a long. You're so skinny. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, skinny people live forever. I'm pretty healthy. I you're have a lot of genetics energy. Too. I have shitloads of energy. Yeah. You know, I, I really do. Like, uh, Rogan was talking about me. He has all that energy to rape and stuff, isn't it? Allegedly. That's where the energy comes from. That's what happens when you take people's souls through um, forced interactions of you know, the sexual nature. <laughs> you take all their energy. It's sort of like a sex vampire, you know? That's why he has all that energy, allegedly. That's what I've heard. I'm not sure if that's true, but I read that somewhere on Wikipedia, I think. With Derek from More Plates, More Dates. And he was alluding to the fact that guys like me don't have the energy he has. I have all the energy. 
I'll put my energy. Wait, he was saying guys anyone. like you? Yeah, he said because he, he wants because he said is Brian Callen on TRT yet? And, oh, and Joe said no. He says his testosterone's high, and which it is. But I'm gonna get another read of my testosterone. I love if t I, I want the I want the place more dates guy to do a breakdown of Brendan and figure out if he's on Ozempic or not. That would be really good. <laughs> figure out if Brendan Shaw on Ozempic, please. That would be really good. Let's do that video. So the past two testosterone. I don't give a fuck what your high. testosterone says. I, I mean, Joe included. I don't know anyone with more energy than you. No. Joe said you don't have energy. Yeah, yeah. Well, he thought I would. He, he was like, some of these guys break down after doing two shows a night. Come hang with Callen me. Callen doesn't. Come hang with me. Oh, I'll you're, shoot the, a whole you're the worst example. For I'm that. the worst example. No, I'll work out for that's two like, hours. That's like looking at. I've got so much. Look, what is this Wankoff session about energy? What the fuck are we doing? What are we talking about? I have all the energy. I have energy, bro. You don't do anything. You guys barely work. You record like three hours of content a week. You do like two shows a fucking weekend. Like relax. These motherfuckers are acting like they're fucking going on a world tour every fucking single week. You perform within the radius of fucking California. At most you have to get a fucking plane to another state. Let's chill the fuck out a bit, you know? Let's chill out. Let's fucking chill out here. You're not running a fucking marathon in under an hour. Let's fucking relax. What kind of energy you have? Let's relax. Let's rein it in a little bit, lads. Come on. DK Matt Metcalf and being like, dude, just eat gummy beers in one meal a day. Yeah. You're going to look like I'm that. I'm the wrong guy. To, I'm no, the wrong you're, guy. You're the awful I'm example. the wrong guy yeah, yeah. to fucking try to match energies with. You're not no, being a that. terrible idea. I'm the wrong guy. In endurance or any of that, it's going to be a long day for you. That's what? weird, bro. At all of his friends. Well, he just. With low I energy? Know, I, Rogan. Oh, my God. We started off the podcast already talking about dicks, talking about cucks. Talking about, you know, being anti-woke and all that shit. And we already mentioned Rogan. Is there ever a podcast in the T Fat K fucking catalogue where they don't mention Joe Rogan? Well, I think he was talking more about how he has a lot of people that he tries to he, he's just a big believer in TRT. hormone support, especially as you get older, which he's probably right about. He's a big believer in hormone support. <laughs> Is that another word for fucking being on gear your whole entire life? How long has fucking Rogan been on TRT? How long has Rogan been injecting himself with stuff? Probably most of his adult life, ever since he turned into like the way he looks now, right? Like how, has Rogan ever not been on stuff? Like fucking hell, bro. Ho hormone support. <laughs> About, which believe me, I'm, I'm around the corner. See, I don't think you need it though. I don't. Why fuck with it? I talk to those, I talk hey, to Bubba, a team hey, of Bubba, scientists. You know why all, Joe, myself, all of us are on it? Because we need it. Yeah. You don't need it. No, I really just don't. I don't. Joe and myself. I love how Brendan does that. Me and Joe and myself. Joe and myself. You know why people like me and Joe, the awesome people, the beast of dads, the beast of podcasters, the kings of content. You know why we need it? Because we're awesome. And we need to top up our levels of awesome. Because if we're not awesome, then how are people going to know we're awesome? <laughs> Talk to my wife. <laughs> Which one? Which one? You know what I mean, Chin? Hey, Chin. Yeah. You know what I mean, right, I bud? I know what you mean. Chin, you know I what I'm fuck. sorry. I'm not Chin, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Chin, you're all quiet, man. His hair's all fucked up today. Yeah. What? What like oh, spring? no, George. Look at that, man. He's not there. He's not there, man. He's not fucking there. One's in the chat for the fallen soldier, George. One's in the chat for the fallen soldier, George. He's not there anymore, man. The little fucking round face assassin is not there. The little round face gerbil looking assassin is not in the fucking chair anymore. One's in the chat for fucking George, the fallen soldier. R.I.P. to fucking George. R.I.P. Where's this working remotely thing gone? R.I.P. to fucking George. Sad to see. Let's see what they say. Are you a little depressed? I usually like. Are you okay? I'm not depressed, but obviously I'm a little sad. Why are yeah, you okay? exactly. You guys want to discuss it now? Oh yeah, let's talk about. Oh yeah, it. Oh, yeah oh! George. <laughs> They're so fucking wrapped up in their own fucking animus. They're so wrapped up in their own pride and ego. They're so wrapped up in their own lives. They genuinely didn't remember. <laughs> he was already a distant memory. George already didn't exist. <laughs> like what? Who? <laughs> Why are you sad? <laughs> That's the same fucking reaction Brian had when you got accused of rape. What? But I thought you loved it. You said you loved it. You said you enjoyed it. You said you wanted to do it again. <laughs> Who? Who's that? I don't remember her. <laughs> Holy shit. 
He's gone two minutes and they've already forgotten about him. Let's talk about George for a sec, guys. So there's been a lot of misinformation. Oh my George God! George did not get fired. No. George was. Why is Brian? Asked, why we, we, is we, Brian? We, why is Brian talking about this? Oh my God! Why is Brian taking the lead on this? No, Brendan's a piece of shit. Brendan is an absolute piece of shit. He fires George through a lawyer. He's that much of a coward. He can't even fire the kid directly. He hires him off of the back of him being this motivational guy, inspirational guy, because he lost a bunch of weight and stuff, right? And it's a very personal relationship. They start off talking to each other. He's fucking giving him all this praise. He's, you know, heaping praise on him. He's encouraging him. He's giving him confidence. They act like they're quote unquote friends and they're cool and they're nice to each other. You can clearly see George looks more up to Brendan than he does to Brian. So naturally, if that's the case and you want to let him go, you owe him a direct conversation like hey dude let's have a seat let's take a walk let's jump on a phone call or whatever let me grab you let me grab some dinner with you let's sit down let's grab a drink let me discuss some things with you i want to go in a different direction whatever you owe him that fucking direct conversation he doesn't do it he does it through a lawyer cool then he gets rumbled and exposed and he gets online and starts acting as if like what we heard isn't true then he has to explain it to the fans and instead of fucking owning up to his mistake or explaining it or not by the way you don't need to explain it if you don't want to you don't owe anybody any explanation of how you run your business you don't need to explain nothing to nobody but if you're going to talk about it talk about it why are you letting Brian fucking dive on the fucking grenade? Why are you letting him talk for you? All of a sudden, Brendan can't speak. The king of interruptions, the king of fucking, you know, asking 10 minute fucking questions. Now he's all of a sudden mute. Now he's deferring to fucking Brendan, Brian. Now he's looking to the side and waiting for fucking daddy rinks to fucking help him out. Come on, man. Need somebody with more experience in right now as Thick Boy is expanding into different areas. Yeah, when you have like full producer, not a like twenty-two-year-old, no. right? And so everybody loves George. So what? <laughs> so first they can't afford him. First they can't afford to pay his salary, but now they want to hire a better person with more experience. Do they think they can they do they think they can pay somebody the same they were allegedly they were paying George a grand? As again, I don't know if the truth this is the truth. I've heard stuff online, I've seen stuff on the Reddit. Allegedly, George was getting paid one thousand dollars. In LA, one thousand dollars, I'd imagine, doesn't go far. In the same way as London. If you're getting paid one thousand pounds in London, you probably couldn't find a space to rent for 1000 you couldn't even find a room i don't think i think most rooms in london go for like 900 plus not including fucking bills so you won't even be able to cover a room in london for 1000 pounds probably the same in la then allegedly he gets bumped up to three grand allegedly that's why i heard as well not sure if that's true but i heard he got bumped up to three grand who knows but let's say he's in the let's say he got paid two grand where are you going to find a person older than George who's going to take on more responsibility and be happy to get paid 2000 Where? Where? And we know through BGL and we know through the vlogs that Chin does that Brendan is very demanding. Brendan expects you to be on call 24-7. So he's going to pay you less than George or the same as George to do more work and to be on call 24-7. How does that make sense? You fire one person because you can't afford him. And now you want somebody with more experience to do more, to do more, to take more responsibility, but to do it for less. Like what? What? What I think you did was offered him a different, uh, Lex who runs the company. Lex you know, run CFO. Offered yeah. him something else. Correct. You, you. Come on, man. Who the fuck is Lex? Lex did, who, who, who is this? Lex fucking Friedman. Who the fuck is Lex? Lex didn't exist when he brought him on stage. When he used George as a fucking human prop. When he lose, when he used George as an applause break on his stage show to introduce to people and say, hey, here's this kid that I've inspired. Look at how amazing I am because I've got this kid that, that likes me. I can't be bad. This kid likes me. When he used George as a human prop, where was Lex? Now all of a sudden when he got fires, it's not me, it's Lex. 
Lex was our CFO. CFO of what? CFO of a YouTube channel. CFO of a YouTube channel. Is that what you have? You have a CFO of a fucking YouTube channel. No wonder Brendan gets fucking scammed. He's got somebody claiming a salary as a chief financial officer of a fucking YouTube channel. Are you serious? <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? Maybe look at the, maybe look at Lex. Maybe fire Lex before you fire George. Why do you have a CFO for a fucking YouTube channel? Why? Why? You are not a good person for that job to go and even talk to George because you're very attached to George emotionally. I'm going to speak for Brennan for a second. Guys. No. You're but you owe him that. That's what being a leader is, Brian, you fucking idiot. That's what being an actual leader is. You have tough conversations with people. Especially if you have like five employees. It's different if you've got like a team full of like 20, 10 people. Fair enough. Then maybe you shouldn't be involved in that decision making process. But I honestly feel like if you're an actual leader, there is no shame in coming up to your employees. There's no dishonor. There's nothing bad in saying, hey, at this current moment, you're not the right fit for our company. I know we started off on the right foot, but now it's not going too well. We need to part ways. Even if that person is angry in a moment, later on, they'll be happy that you told them directly. There's nothing worse than hearing from people not involved in the situation or you hardly know, speak with somebody else that you do know. And again, I've been involved in like mass layoffs and I've been involved in mass layoffs where it's done very well and done very poorly. Most of the time when it's done poorly, it mostly comes because the communication isn't clear. The communication doesn't come directly from the owners or from the founders or from the people actually above you in terms of like managerial or responsible for you and stuff. That's when it kind of hurts. That's when it stings a little bit. That's when you can start to get in your head and think of all these other, you know, theories about what's happening. But when somebody actually comes to you directly and sits you down as a team, as a company and has that hard conversation, it actually can do you the world of good for your confidence after the fact because even if it hurts at the moment even if it's fucking gut-wrenching you're gonna be like you know what at least this person oh you know at least he or she was able to face me up as a, as a man as a human as an adult and say you know what here's the deal blah 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 and laid it out not fucking you know threw out their fucking lawyer who i don't even know who i barely fucking seen and communicate that thing to me that way in a very sterile and dry way no actually brendan should have had that conversation with him directly because he's emotionally attached that's what they should have had a proper heart to heart who does he actually speak to emotionally anyway in the first place he actually probably needs that more than anybody actually lower your fucking guard a little bit and fucking humble yourself and speak to that guy especially if it's a hard conversation directly that's what you should have been happening but again what do i know very attached to him love George. you're yeah. terrible at any kind of any kind of repositioning firing or anything you're the worst the you're worst. the fucking worst it doesn't matter if he's the worst you should have to have a conversation so i've been with bgl who fired bgl then did lex fire bgl did brian fire bgl did fucking Chin fire BGL? Who fired BGL then? Who fired Malik? Who fired fucking Malik? Who fired special... Who fired um, MJ? So did all those firings get done by Lex? This mysterious Lex guy, did he fire everybody? Or did Brendan do it through text and stuff? So the one thing he's happy to admit he's not good at is firing people, is being emotional, is showing some sort of human emotion. Like, that's what you're not good at, allegedly, right? Allegedly, that's what this guy's not good at. Come on, bro. This is some bullshit, bro. This is some fucking bullshit. And it's so dumb as well. This is so inconsequential. This is so minor of a situation. People get fired every day. It's not a big deal. He could have he could have fired George because he doesn't like the he, he doesn't like the smell of his breath. He can fire him because his face is annoying. He could have fired him because he doesn't like how he walks, because of his loose skin, because of his annoying smile. He could have fired him for any reason. It's his his business. It's none of our business. But the way he's handling it is so fucking redacted, it does make you laugh. Because he has every right to fire him for whatever reason he wants to. But he's making it so much worse <laughs> with this explanation by letting fucking Daddy Rinks speak for him now. Now, all of a sudden, he's not interrupting fucking Rinks. Now, all of a sudden, Brendan has nothing to say. Now, all of a sudden, he's looking sheepish. Now, he's trying to look sad. Fuck off, man. 
And so having we know this about you so we have other people that actually run the mechanics and day-to-day -day operation of thick boy right? yes okay yeah. I'm, I'm we have people we have people brian you work for thick boy you don't own it why is he acting like he owns it thick boy right you don't even you don't own it you fucking work for, for brendan ever since brian got fucking accused of rape the 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 fucking power dynamic has really shifted in Brendan's favor. If I'm not mistaken, when Bren, when Brian got cancelled, didn't Brendan take more ownership of the fucking money they make? I think before it was 60-40. Didn't he take 70-30 now? I'm pretty sure something like that happened. Again, I'm not sure if I'm like mistaken on my law, but the imbalance of fucking res you know power and who has authority in a company or whatnot is mostly on Brendan. If anything. Brian is just a glorified employee. He turns up on Friday the Kid and that's it. What else does he do? He doesn't edit. He doesn't submit. He doesn't probably submit ideas for fucking topics and shit. He turns up sometimes on time, records his podcast and goes home. He doesn't do anything. So he's probably happy just let's get collecting a check. But now he's acting as if there's some like big corporation going on there. Everybody that's involved in in Thick Boy is in that room with a part apart from that other white dude that's you know sits on another computer. Everybody involved in Thick Boy is in that room. They're acting as if it's some like big fucking multinational corporation or something. Like, fuck off. I'm just speaking and you tell me when yeah. I'm wrong. So George is somebody all of us here care about. And, and right now, I think you guys offered George something else within Offer the something company. Else where he doesn't have to, because now he's killed himself coming in every day. Yeah. So he doesn't so want to do that. a different role. His thing was, it's not that he doesn't want to be here, but he has other opportunities. Okay, 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 okay. What the fuck is going on? They start off by saying that George isn't qualified for the role that they need. Thick Boy is expanding, it's growing, it's blooming into this big production company, this big fucking studio, this big network, and they need somebody to do more work. Need somebody that's more experienced. George is too young, right? Even though they got him on board because he's young and highly impressionable and would be happy just to be there. Now, all of a sudden, his age is a um, negative, right? He's not experienced enough. Cool. We're letting him go. But now, they're saying that George wanted to go because he's inundated offers. Keo George, who no one fucking knows outside of this fucking podcast, has now got loads of people knocking at his door. Offering to fucking, you know, take him up on his services of what? editing tiktoks and shit like somehow he's in demand that's why he's leaving because you know he, he needs to kind of fly he needs to kind of grow and become the you know beast of a producer that he's destined to be if he's so good why don't you keep him if he's so in demand why don't you fucking keep him huh which well, i also find help them facilitate right? yeah he has two good ones uh, which of i course help he him facilitate so 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 brendan fired him and now he's trying to get credit for helping him get jobs, even though he fired him in the first place. I'm the good guy here. Even though I fired him, I gave him other jobs. So I can't be the bad guy here. Even though I fired him before Christmas through a lawyer and then went out and bought a lime green Dodge. <laughs> I fired him, but now I bought him a Dodge. So you can't say mean things to me because I'm a good guy. Fuck off, bro. Why are they making this so difficult? If you fired him for every reason, hey, we went our separate ways. It didn't work out. We wish him all the luck. Um, hopefully, you know, when he gets more experience or maybe down the line, it's always, the door's always open. He's always welcome to come back here. Why is this all this, all these, all these fucking, all these pleas that they're copying just makes it seem like they're lying. Just be simple and plain and straight to the point. We went our separate ways because we need to, we need something, whatever. It's not that big. It's not that big of a deal. They're actually lying about something that doesn't need to be lied about. I understand. Like if he, if he, if those don't work out, he can come back here. You know that it's always yeah. open. I love George. I talked to. No, it isn't. Oh, see, he's gonna say it. He's gonna say it. I talk to George all the time. Me and George are good friends. <laughs> let's see him say it like if he if he if those don't work out he can come back here you know that it's always yeah. open i love george i talked to george <laughs> probably more than anybody in here besides... uh, no! <laughs> classic 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 
I talk to George more than anyone in here. He, I am his father. Me and George are boys. We always go to the pub, you know, me and George, knocking back the booze, knocking back the beers, having a couple bevies with the lads. Me and George, you know, on the strip, kitting up all the ladies and stuff, you know, playing a bit of pool, throwing some darts, watching the football and stuff, you know. Yay. <laughs> You. Yeah, and I, I talk, talk to him too, and I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna I talk to him every day. I can help no, him you don't. Plan, no, you the- don't. No, you don't. DMs don't count. Liking his fucking Instagram stories don't count. That's not talking to somebody every day. I talk to him every day. We're good friends. Dude, this is what people get. You know how far Georgie has. This is my conversation with today. Me and him talked in person. You know how far Georgie has come. You got to think about. It. I met George when he was 450 pounds on King and the Sting. He sent in a submission. Because my goal is to get down to 190. Okay, what does that have to do with anything? What does this have to do with anything? This is another misdirection. What does this have to do with anything? Blah, blah, blah. I'm a thick boy. I said, Georgie, you get down to 190, I'll fly you here live in studio. Year later, calls in, he's 190. We know the I story. I fly him in, he's such a good... Why do you, why if do you, you ever why need you George, this? can't help but love the kid. Okay. Fly so what, him in here. So why do you fire him? If he's so lovable and he's so inspirational, why do you fire him? <laughs> if he's such a great guy and you talk to him every single day, why do you let him go? He's in the, allegedly he's in demand, but he's not in demand for you. I love him. I go, dude, come to San Antonio with you. Ever stay in a nice hotel? Never. Cool. It's the first time I'm on a plane too. <laughs> oh, I love the humble brag. I love the poor shaming and the humble brag at the same time. Right? He's never, he's never been in a nice car. He's never stayed in a nice hotel. He's never worn nice clothes. He's never had cool trainers. I did that. Me. <laughs> He's such a piece of shit. He's the kind of person that'll lend you his jacket and then tell the whole room he lent you his jacket. Hey, you know that jacket? That's mine. Those shoes, I lent him that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lent him those shoes. They're good in it. They're nice, isn't it, right? I borrowed him those shoes. I don't really need them. You know, I've got so many shoes. <laughs> San Antonio, put them up at our favorite hotel, Hotel Emma. Give him of the- course. Look at this. Praise me. I've got links at the hotel, Hotel Emma. We go way back. Great hotel, never been in presidential suite. He's living like a- <laughs> oh, this guy is fucking impossible. King, bring him on stage. And then I was like, can't stop here, dude. I'll find a job for you. That's you. That's you. That's me. That's you. If you, you, you know, yeah, that's <laughs> Look you. At this. And, and- but- what the fuck are they dude, doing? So we went from zero skills to my brain is fucking bleeding out of my ears. That's you, Brendan. Hell of a great guy. Let me get on my knees and suck your dick. Let me suck your fucking dick. Great guy. That's you, Brendan. The best guy. Best guy. Great guy. Never fucking met him. Beast of a guy. Beast of an employee. Beast of a beast of a boss. Beast of a fucking husband. Beast of a <laughs> beast of a colleague. <laughs> beast of a comedian, right? Some would say the bestest. <laughs> <laughs> he can Fuck. edit now yep. he can cut clips he can do social media hey can you edit brendan can you cut clips can you do social media please let us know yeah he's but here's the problem with you here's the problem with you you get you get emotionally attached to every- <laughs> that's brendan's problem his emotions That's the main thing that's holding back Brendan. His emotions. He's too in touch with his emotions. He's an empath. That's Brendan's real problem. He's a fucking empath, right? (laughs) He can't but help. He can't help but feel pain for the world. He works up sometimes in a cold sweat, clutching his chest, thinking, that's not nice. The pain of everybody around the world, that's not nice. I can't believe everybody's going through what they're going through. Like it brings him pain. He gets, he falls to his knees when he thinks about George. He falls to his fucking knees when he thinks about all the great things he's done for George. Presidential suite, Hotel Emma, cool shoes, (laughs) flights, (laughs) money, a warm bed. He never had those things before me. He, He clutches his fucking chest. Everybody. Correct. I shouldn't be running and, business. And I, I also don't hire and I, 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 I What? You don't hire everybody? What? Everybody. Correct. I shouldn't be running and, business. And I, I also don't hire and I, 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 I shouldn't be running a business, but I'm a beast of a businessman. And I don't hire everybody. 
He said it in the same breath. He spoke out both sides of his mouth. The humble brag or the attempt at self-deprecation, I shouldn't run a business. I'm just so I'm just so in touch with my emotions. I'm just so much of a good guy. I shouldn't have a business really, you know, because I can't be a capitalist pig. I can't be a shark because I just love people. I want to give people everything. But then on the other side of his mouth, I actually don't hire everybody. It's actually done by somebody else. It's actually Lex. It's actually that guy over there. That Lex guy who we don't know. It's him. So you run a big business where you've got all these big employees and you've got a CFO, but you also are too in touch with your emotions to hire anybody. Come on, man. Come on. You're lying. Unnecessarily. I think that is a liability for you yes. because sometimes you got... Uh, yeah. I have a bad reader. You know what's a liability? Trying to fuck your friend's wife. You know what's also a bad liability? Doing a show with a fucking known diddler. You know what's also a liability? Having a co-host that's been accused of fucking rape. That's a liability. <laughs> that's a liability. Big up NJ Ranger. Appreciate you, bro. White version of profit on Yekka power and wisdom. Exactly. Exactly. It fucking exactly. It fucking exactly. It fucking exactly. Exactly. On Yekka fucking Shorb. On Yekka fucking Shorb. If you know, you know. Do your fucking Googles. Reader. Well, it's not that you're a bad reader, dude. You're just very optimistic. We're not and I, about I, books. I, some job. No, you are a bad reader. You're a bad reader. You can't read cue cards. That's why you're probably not on TV. You can't read books. That's why you sound the way that you sound. And you're a bad reader of people, right? Let's say that for sure. Putting all your fucking hopes and dreams and the long-term future in an accused, alleged rapist and somebody that's been accused of diddling in Crystalia is really bad business, especially when you've got a young family. Because at any moment, somebody could come out with another allegations and that whole fucking, you know, car, house of cars that is known as Thick Boy could come tumbling down. That is really bad business, to be honest. That's why most people in Hollywood and LA have run a mile from Brian and from Chris Alea because guess what? Bitch, you guessed it. They're looking after their family. They're looking after their fucking partners. They're looking after their kids' private school tuition fees and that. That's what they're doing. But these guys, nah. If you're running this a company, you you are going to need a 30 year old person who has a lot of experience to run shit, it. and you have to be a Do fucking background check. They have a YouTube channel. They have a glorified YouTube channel. That's it. They do the same content on every single show. Just a couple of middle-aged men talking into microphones. Better cameras than mine. Better lighting in the studio somewhere. But it's the same thing. Even Food Truck Diaries doesn't even exist anywhere. That's, that's the, the different show, but that's gone. Every piece of content they do involves them sitting in front of a camera pontificating about life. Why do they need to do background checks on that? Why? Why? It could be argued somebody that has a dodgy history is actually the only ones you're actually going to get to work at some, you know, hellhole that is Thick Boy. What person with an actual sound employment history will decide to work there? What person with actual career ambitions would think that's a good place to go and get a fucking, you know, to get your step, your foot on the ladder or somewhere? Why would you actually do that? Considering all the bad, you know, vibes around these guys and stuff and their reputations in tatters. And yeah, but you also have to be the kind of guy that is like people that run a business are the sharks. way more ruthless than you. And I'm not. They go, you. Oh my God. Didn't he say in the other previous interview that he's a shark of a businessman? Didn't he say in that other interview with that guy that he's a shark? He's a business shark or something. Now he's saying he's not a business. You see what he does? When it doesn't serve him, all of a sudden he's this like sweet, innocent guy. Hey, I don't know anything about business. I'm just too emotional. I'm too much of an empath. I just connect with people too much. I just get too emotionally invested. I can't do it. If I was to confront George and tell him I was going to fire him, I would break down and cry. And I can't cry because of George. I can cry when Chris Salia gets accused of being a pedo. I can cry on air because I'm scared that people are going to come after me. Most of them crying about my best friend getting fucking accused of being a pedophile. I can cry about that, but I can't cry about firing my employee that's just something i can't do so i had to go and get lex to go and do it 
That's why I have to do it. I'm just a poor little lamb. I can't do that. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. What is this? Just the other day, you were a beast of a businessman. Now look at you. All of a sudden, you can't talk. Now you're shy. Now you're biting your bottom lip like, I, I just can't, I just can't do it. I'm just, I'm just holding it all back in now. It's really tough. And um, it's, it's really, really tough to be me, to be rich, to be successful, to have all this money, to buy cars and to just be covering my, you know, my stay at home wife and Balenciaga and my kids, you know, just forcing them to be materialistic monsters that I am. It's just really, really tough. And I don't know. I'm just getting really, 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 really emotional thinking about all the tough decisions I have to make. Do I drive my Porsche? Do I drive my Lambo? Do I drive my Dodge? Do I drive my TRX? I just don't know what to do. Life is just so fucking difficult. It's so difficult to be a beast of a dad, to be a beast of a husband, to be a beast of a podcaster, and to be one of Joe Rogan's best friends. It's just so difficult. I just don't know what to do. Please, somebody get me more dollar bills to wipe my tears. More dollar bills to wipe my tears, please. <laughs> it's not working. You got to get out of here. Yeah, not, That's I, the way it's... I, I'm not like that. Oh. Not like that. Not <laughs> like that. Well, let me just tell you about Brennan. So hold, just on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What, 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 way more ruthless than you. And I'm not. They go, you, it's not working. You got to get out of here. Yeah, I'm not, That's I, the way it's... I, I'm not you like did, that. Yo, you are ruthless. Why do you get rid of Malik? You are ruthless. Malik was arguing back. Malik was pushing back. Malik was fucking openly laughing at you, mocking you, right? Clowning you as podcasters are meant to do. You're meant to be comedians. You're meant to be ribbing off each other, right? Ribbing each other, poking each other, you know, pause. But you didn't like that. And you let go of fucking Malik because he fucking hurt your ego. You are ruthless when you want to be. Why did MJ get let go? Why did MJ get let go? Please. Why did MJ get let go, huh? Let's get to that. Let's get to that. Why did MJ get let, let go? Come on, bro. Where's Tank? Justice for Tank. That's ruthless. You buy a dog and then all of a sudden you get give the dog away. Or, it, or you fucking euthanize it. Why, where's Tank? That was ruthless. That was fucking ruthless. Big up Wingers Dingers. BBB Big Up has... Bendon being a beast of an employer. Bean cheese, bean cheese, bean cheese. Bean cheese, bean cheese, you know how it is. Big up Wingus McDingus, my guy. Bean cheese, bean cheese. Fired, hired, fired, hired, fired, hired. Right? <laughs> fired, hired, fired, hired. Love you, don't love you. Love you, don't love you. Huh? Ruthless empath, ruthless empath, ruthless empath. Look at Brian as well. Look at Brian getting on his fucking hands and knees and slobbing on Brendan. Let me tell you how amazing you are, Brendan. Brendan, let me tell you. Let me tell you just how great you are. Do you know how amazing you are, Brendan? Do you know if you had a little bit, if your hair was a little longer, if you had a little bigger tits, if you had a little bit of a perkier ass, that I would fuck you? Do you know that, Brendan? Do you know that, Brendan, that you'd be right up my alley? Do you know that I would leave my second family for you, Brendan? Do you know how much I love you? Do you know that? Fucking donkey. Come on, Brian. Not like that. Pause Not like it. that. Well, let me just tell you about Brennan. So just so people know. The, the number of- We don't care. We know already. We don't care. We don't fucking care. You can't convince us any different than what we see. We have too much information. We know exactly what he's like. We can't convince us. We're not fucking vulnerable little fucking comedians going to an open mic, willing to get some comedy time to suck your little wrinkled dick. We're not that easily manipulated. Do not try to do it, Lewis, like that. All right? We're not some fucking open micer or something. Come on, bro. Let me tell you about Brendan. Let me tell you about the stand-up music. Let me tell you about stand-up comedy. Let me tell you about how hard it is to make it. Let me tell you about um, how hard you have to work. Come talk to me in the toilets. Come talk to me behind the bins. Come talk to me behind this fucking velvet fucking curtain or something. Come on. Come talk to me behind here, young lady. How old are you again? 17? Perfect. Let's go. <laughs>
people that we've had who we all love and they were all great but there were things sometimes where this person i'm not talking about george in this case i'm talking about in our oh in yeah here. Oh, oh yeah you're not talking about george who else could you be talking about then malik Chappelle, mj special k evan the beard who else could you be talking about then tank who else could you be talking about then huh come on the netball girl who else could you be talking about then you haven't had that many employees bro you know fucking pepsico you know fucking General Motors? Why are they going on as if like they have this high churn, high turnover? We're, a, we're in a crazy industry. The markets, right? The, it's a bull market at the moment, right? The stock market's flipped on its fucking head, right? Like, come on, bro. You run a fucking podcast. Chill the fuck out. As we've been here, there were, I think we've had probably, I think eight or nine real discussions about you calling me and saying i don't know what to do with this person they're not doing their job and i and i and I, it's, it's driving me crazy because i'm paying them hey 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 that's not a, that's not a humble brag if you keep employing terrible employees that you have to fire at some point you look in the fucking mirror at some point you look in the fucking mirror if you have five terrible employees after terrible employees maybe it's you maybe you don't screen properly maybe you don't interview properly maybe your fucking job description is too wafty maybe you attract fucking grifters and leeches and fucking whatever maybe it's you maybe maybe who knows that's not a humble brag you know, I've just got a big heart and I just offer everybody a salary and every time I get burnt, but I just keep doing it again. That's not a good thing, brother. What kind of what, what kind of weird way is that to kind of feign some sort of like, like you're some sort of humanitarian as if you're running some sort of charity or something? Huh? Huh? A fortune... A fucking me. fortune, and I would be like, okay. And then what and would we would always say? Like, what would we always say? Uh, and finish my say. sentence. You would go, yeah, but you're not gonna do anything. No, I'd say, and you know what we're gonna do about this? Absolutely nothing. You'd say absolutely nothing because we'd, leave him, we'd leave him on board. <laughs> I can't confront it, but if somebody wants to have, you know, if somebody doesn't want to have sex with me, I can cover their mouth and keep going. <laughs> but when I want to confront someone about not doing their job, suddenly I can't do it. I get really, really shy. But when I want to force somebody's, when I want to force my hand underneath somebody's skirt by fucking force, I just do it. <laughs> That's fine and easy. But when I want to fire somebody, I find it completely difficult. <laughs> for another year at least right until it gets so toxic or well, they whatever leave it is, or something whatever yeah. the case you know and, and that's not the way to run a business no, right sir. and so we have a 22 year old who we all care about who we are who we want suddenly his age is an issue when he joined everything was fine but suddenly his george's age is the main issue here his age he's just too young he's just too young <laughs> he's just too young when have, when have either of these guys ever turned down a 22-year-old, eh? George, George is just unfortunate he's not female and hot. If George was hot and a girl, they would have never fired him. That's his problem. George was too ugly. If George was a bit cuter, he probably would have stayed. That's his main problem. George's ugliness is what fucking killed him. Not his inability to do the job. If George had perky little tits... If George had a weird little soft, wet mouth that's always kind of slightly ajar. If George kind of like had sweet, innocent eyes that were open and ready for possibilities and manipulation. If George walked around and swung that little, small little rump shaker around and bent over at the, at the waist to pick up trash and got the boys coffees and always got them wrong and was like, I'm sorry, I thought you wanted decaf. He would have still got the job. But unfortunately... He's a big, you know, round face, trailer trash white guy. And they don't need that around there, right? They don't need that around their parts, right? He's a regular dude, actually. George actually is a regular person. He's a regular person. <laughs> and they couldn't handle having him around. He's too regular. He was calling his mom. He had family issues. He had regular, regular guy shit going on. They couldn't handle it. <laughs> He was a reminder of like the regular struggle of the regular person. They w didn't want that around them. Oh, <laughs> it's too depressing.
Oh my god, that was brilliant. Let's continue. Want to win, and he will win, and I'll do what I can. No, you're you know, not. To help him gain. No, George you're has not. a great resume now. His skills. And he's also a great kid. So. And also, when he came in today to tell me. And did like, a great job here, by the way. Of course. On, let's put that on yeah. record. What didn't George say the other day that he was staying to be remote worker, and he tagged Brendan in his story? What changed then? What changed? To be fair, I'm happy about it. I'm not going to lie. All jokes aside, all jokes aside, I'm happy about this. Because I have a feeling this is what happened. They're lying. This is what I feel happened. I have a feeling Brendan did fire George through a lawyer because he's a coward. Then, because he has no form of social awareness, because he's obviously divorced from reality, because he has no heart, no soul, right because he's a godless human being he goes out the next day and buys this lime green car and everybody goes crazy again do what you want with your money no one's pocket watching but optics wise that looks crazy when you fire somebody through a lawyer because you can't afford to pay them on allegedly and then you go and buy a lime green car that's one of the most in demand cars at the moment and you pay double the fucking retail price for it people are going to be a little bit aggrieved by it especially when they think george is a vulnerable guy and whatever it may be and they might think he's a bit redacted or special needs and shit they're gonna have more sympathy for him even though i don't think he is and he kind of leans into it that's a story for another day he does fire him he gets publicly shamed into rehiring him right and then in a rush to try and make himself look like a good guy he fires off like everybody's wrong doesn't know what they're saying without the knowledge that brian can obviously confirm that he did fire him cool it happened but i think luckily for george he has some real people in his ear and maybe george actually was keeping an eye on the reddit because i saw on the red even i left comments on the reddit i left comments on the reddit i said stuff on my live stream and i saw other people say stuff on the reddit the same way and somebody some one guy made a post actually let me actually find it this one guy made a post on the reddit where he basically pleaded with george and said please whatever you do don't go back to thick boy I think he said that. So people made posts on the Reddit. Again, the Reddit, according to Brendan, is toxic. They're all there. They're all fucking child abusers. And they do all this sort of nonsense. He invents all these stories to discredit people who have some genuine right pushback and criticism about him, right? They kind of frames them all as bad, evil people. But the Reddit actually was telling George, hey, whatever you do, don't accept this other job offer from Brendan. Run a mile. Here's the post. See, here's the post. Here, this is the post. Somebody actually posted this on the Reddit. Look at this. Look what they said here. Re George, remember this when you will be fired very, very soon. We all meow down here. You will too, right? Look at the caption the person writ. Look at this. Somebody actually went out of their way to actually give George a bit of advice. Listen, it says, George, I watched the one and only podcast you were on from last year and most cats on here won't or didn't watch. I did because I wanted to know more about you as a human being. Everything, um, everybody gives you shit rightfully so because you talk shit to Marg to defend your very stupid, greedy, selfish... Big, big up, Wingus Dingus. Is Chang's hiring? I'm pretty sure George would have an amazing career behind the friars. <laughs> to be fair, I'm not going to lie. I don't think he could do that. I think he would actually be a detriment to the people around him and to maybe his own safety operating that kind of equipment i'm not gonna lie like i don't think he has the iq to do that job no offense to the kid no offense to the kid but i don't think he has possible to do that to be honest i think he's one of those people that if he's not a genius behind the computer i think manual you know service industry jobs he can't do it i think he has to be one of those dudes who has to either find his lane in his own little niche or something or be a genius behind a computer on a phone i don't think he could do those kind of like you know, could you imagine George working behind a bar? Can you imagine George working in a busy restaurant? Can you imagine George working actually at P.F. Chang's? Like, how busy those P.F. Chang's are and shit. Can you imagine him during the fucking dinner rush and stuff? Having to... I don't know. I don't think that would work out. Personally. But I could be wrong. It continues. Um, everybody gives you shit, rightfully so, because you talk shit to Mark to defend your very stupid and greedy and selfish materialistic boss. But for me personally, after I watched, my heart hurts for you and for your family. 
you don't have a lot of money money and you come from a very poor family who has been struggling for your entire life your dad is very ill and suffering tremendously your mother is taking care of the kids that aren't even hers cats don't know but you are a very sweet funny self-aware intelligent dude I can tell that you are definitely on Addies or some kind of shit, which is why the cats always say that you're always acting weird and twitching on one podcast and you are on substances, obviously. I don't blame you though. So I, I would too if I was in your if if I had your life. You know what I'm surprised by that? Were you guys aware of that? Do you remember those clips of George like doing these weird things? Were you guys aware that he was on Addies and shit? I didn't know that. I just assumed he had little ticks. I just assumed he had like a Tourette's or something. I didn't know he was on like Addies or pills and shit. Did you guys think that as well? Or were you guys aware of that? That he might be on some sort of prescription drugs or medication or something? I had no idea that was the case. I just thought he, was, he had like ticks or some shit. Who knows? It continues. All of us cats are saying is that you are working for a very greedy and inhumane, selfish and extremely narcissistic piece of shit. He, Bert and Chin took advantage of you and lied to you about helping you to receive a life-changing operation with your skin removal surgery. I honestly believe Bert and that piece of shit crap that you have donated should have donated financially to help your struggling family as a gesture to help a fellow human being, especially a fan who worship these false idols. You deserve better, man, and I hope you and your family are going to be okay. My heart hurts for all of you. When the dark day finally comes, we welcome you to go scorched earth. So guys were telling him, hey, run for the hills. Brendan is not your friend. Make sure you run for the fucking hills. So he was being warned by the fans out there who are usually the ones who don't have a lot of time for Brendan in the first place. But they even saw that this guy was getting taken advantage of. So maybe my theory is Brendan did fire him. Brendan did lie about firing him. Brendan did rehire him. But then George maybe said, you know what? I'm going to step away. I think he saw the reaction to what happened. He saw how Brendan acted towards him, especially because imagine, George actually is a fan of Brendan. He's actually a fan of T-Fat K. He actually looks up to these guys. And if you know anything about Brendan and his interaction with fans, he hates his fans. He doesn't like that his fans look like George. He wants his fans to look like David Goggins or something. I don't know what his idea of his fans are, but he actually hates that his fans are like usually chubby, usually um dudes usually mexican dudes as well he, he he doesn't like it i don't know why he doesn't like the fact that he has a big chubby fan base of like mexican guys that go to his shows he wants his his fans to be like i don't know to look like alex Pereira or some shit he wants it to be fucking badasses and look like luke rockhold i don't know what his idea of his fans are but this was never going to be a long-term relationship because deep down he despises that his fans are look like fucking george he doesn't want four hundred. He doesn't want formerly obese fans. He wants all his fans to be like beasts of businessmen like him, to have like sharp suits, to work for Porsche, Ferrari, to be like these startup guru guys, to be like he wants his fans to be like Jake Paul and Logan Paul. That's what he wants. He wants those type of guys to be his fans for some reason. But the fans he has, he doesn't take them for granted. He does. He doesn't take. Um, you know, he doesn't um, appreciate them for who they are and stuff. So let's go back to the video. Uh, blah, blah, blah. but uh he came in today me and him talked in person just to tell me like if it's gonna be a part-time thing like i'd rather just go somewhere full-time i was i get that dude i get that you know yeah. love yeah. georgie ah so that's the truth the truth is he fired him rehired him because he got shamed and he felt embarrassed and he went to rewrite the narrative and make sure he's a good guy. And then he offered him part time. So what BGL said was true. He was getting knocked down to like part time hours or something. Right. And obviously, George said it's not because he wants to stay in L.A., I'm assuming. He doesn't want to work part time. It's not going to be enough money. So then Brennan said, yeah, you got to leave them because I can't offer anything more. So technically, he couldn't afford him still. So, so technically, it's kind of still true. You couldn't afford to pay him. But then you still go and pay for your new car. And then you have your wife that doesn't work buying Balenciaga and Gucci every day. I would be, I would be so mad. I would be so mad. <laughs> well, that's, that's a win. That's the goal. 
to go from here that, to and it's it. hard you know he's 22 he's never this is his first job really yeah he's, so he's, he's coming yo big up um matty boy matty boy no you're right um embarrassed to admit i used to regularly watch the show during fats or whatever period you know what unironically i think people in the chat could even admit the show was actually kind of decent when malik and Chappelle came on there it was always it kind of fell off anyway, but it actually got rejuvenated when Chappelle and Malik went on there. Why? Because Malik and Chappelle were like, especially when it first started, they were laughing at Brendan more so. It was quite funny. Even the Reddit was quite was loving it because of the times that they would both be looking at each other when Brendan would fuck up a word and they'd both be cackling and shit. But over time, you saw that Brendan didn't like that. He didn't actually want to have a comedy podcast where people laughed at him. He wanted to be like the main guy and you know, he's the one delivering the funnies, but he doesn't like to get laughed at. He doesn't really like getting roasted and stuff. It's not really his thing. It kind of takes it personally. So over time, you saw the guys kind of chill with the roasting and laughing, and then it turned into just a boring show again because clearly, you know, you could see that he had a conversation with him to the side or he made it very clear by his reaction that he didn't enjoy getting laughed at. That's why the show kind of went to shit. So it actually was good. That, that period was good. But over time, Brendan obviously kind of stamped the fun out of that show. So unfortunately, that's what happened. Um, let's continue here. Oh, what, what he said here? Um, what he said here? What he said? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Assad. The head of North, the head of Ferrari North America. <coughs> Sorry. Commander Rock Jackson. Um, Frack Fix says... He doesn't have a Mexican fan base, though. There's, that's why Green Up is so confusing. No, but that's the thing, though, Frack Fig. If you look at Brendan's um, meet and greets videos that he does, there's a lot of Mexican -y type. Again, maybe it depends where he performs. If he's performing in, like, Covina and stuff, maybe there's a high concentration of people from that part of the world there. But if you look at his videos when he does his meet and greets, his fans look like that, like... I don't know if they're all Mexican. Some of them could be from other parts of Central America, but they look kind of like from that area. And I've always wondered why. Maybe because they think he's Mexican himself. I don't really know why the reason. Or maybe because he's married to that woman. Who knows? But he does actually have a weird amount of people that are from that place that look like that. But he doesn't like them anyway. He doesn't even like his Mexican family. You know? That's the problem. His fans are Mexican, but he actually doesn't like his Mexican family. You know? <laughs> was you're from london you can't tell who's mexican or not again you're right i can't tell who's mexican or not but they don't look white is that is that is that okay to say they don't look white i'm not fucking disparaging them i'm not being rude to them i'm not fucking insulting them i'm just saying the fans i see in video clips of brendan doing meet and greets with these fans they look like those type of guys from that particular region of the country, of the world. They could be from Guatemala, they could be Honduran, they could be from Nicaragua, wherever they're from, they don't look like they're from fucking Arizona. They don't look like they're from fucking Mississippi. They don't look like they're from fucking Philadelphia, all right? They look like they're from that part of the world. And for whatever reason, Brendan doesn't necessarily like that they look like that, even if they're not Mexican, even if they're white. The fact that they're chubby and they look a bit geeky and nerdy, Brendan doesn't like it, okay? Let's put the Mexican thing to one side. They're not Mexican, okay? Forget they're Mexican. Brendan, for some reason, has this idea of what his fans look like. And whenever you... And it, maybe, again, maybe I'm being a little bit... Maybe I'm being a little bit too critical. Maybe he's just awkward around his fans and he gets uncomfortable being around people. But I've seen enough meet and greets video footages where he just looks a bit weird. He kind of looks a bit uncomfortable. Like, he's kind of upset. Like, you know, like, like who, who are these people? Who are these guys? You know what I mean? Like, he, he just doesn't like it. It's weird because those are your fans. Like, it doesn't matter what your fans look like. They're the ones that are fucking allowing you to have the life that you have. Like, why are you, why are you treating them like this for? Why are you acting as if, like, they're not good enough for you? Like, it's weird. It's bizarre. It's very, very odd because the people that come out to his shows, I would say, are actually his actual fans. Because if you're somebody now of, of, of age and you have the internet and you still actively root for Brendan, that means you're an actual fan. Despite all the documentaries, despite the streams like mine, despite all the other channels that exist out there that rip Brendan apart, if you actually pay money to go and see him perform somewhere and you pay money to do a meet and greet because he charges for them, you're actually a hardcore fan and he should be 
honoring you. He should be fucking hugging you every day because you're the ones that actually allow him to have the life that he has to be able to afford to buy another fucking lime green car. That's actually something amazing that all these kids and all these guys, sorry, go to shows with their girlfriends, with their partners, with their friends, despite all the bad things that are said about him and they still are his fans. That's being that he should be really like honoring and fucking respecting and being really appreciative of, but he's not. He actually doesn't like it. He wants his fans to, what, look like Luke Rockhold? Huh? It's like, why, why is that? Why, why, I don't know. It's, it's bizarre. I find it bizarre, but hey, what do I know? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm in straight out 22 yeah. from his background. So it's like, he's just getting more experience. That's all it is. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I told him when I talked to him, I said, this is all, this is good. It's that Jocko Willick thing. Good. 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 Now, oh, Easier good. Said than oppor done, but yeah. opportunity to, to even get better and build a bigger skill set. Look, when I, as an actor, um, I had seven yeses in my fucking career and everything else was a no. And what, so I had an acting teacher say this to me. <laughs> said, yeah. Why are you making it about you? We don't care about your acting career. It doesn't exist anymore. You don't act anymore, brother. Your acting career went away the moment that fucking ex-girlfriend said you raped her. It is what it is. There is no acting career. Allow it. We don't want to know, bro. Imagine making this about you somehow is fucking incredible. That's, you know, says, oh, this woman was crying because she hadn't worked. And said, he goes, yeah, it's real hard. It's a bitch, right? It's a bitch. Um, here's what you got to look at. When you go in for a job, an acting job or any fucking job, and you're interviewing for a company, take. Hey, hey, hey. What job have you had outside of acting? What job have you had outside of playing adult make believe? This is when I get really hot and heated. I don't understand why they like to LARP as if they're like the common everyday man. You're not. That's why people enjoy your content. Actually, you know what? Leaning into the fact that you are somewhat privileged, leaning into the fact that you have this silly, crazy career that allows you to bloody tell dick jokes on stage is actually why people want to listen to you. Because you want to be, you know, taken away from the thinking about the struggles of your everyday life. Them guys trying to pretend as if they're like, just like you, just like the regular dude on the street making a living. It's like, huh? What do you know about job interviews? You, 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 you played adult make-believe, bro. Like you, you, you work on a podcast three hours a week or if that. Come on, man. Interviews. What? You have a dad that allegedly works for the CIA. Come on, bro. Come on. Take this uh, mindset. They have a problem. That problem is they need someone to fill a need, fill a gap. Be the solution to that problem. If yeah. you come in and you're the actual solution to that problem and you're solving problems they didn't even see, like Chin. Chin is a good example. Chin came in, I don't know how many years ago, and he put uh, something over around. <laughs> Using Chin as an example of what a good employee looks like is a bad one because Chin has no life. Chin is really good at what he does, but he also has no life. His life revolves around working. He's the worst person to kind of judge what a good employee looks like because he has no life and they take advantage of that. They take advantage of the fact that he has no life outside of work so that he can do just about anything and everything. And of course, part of him also probably likes the fact that he's so reliant, relied upon because it gives him some level of purpose because he obviously is somebody that also likes to work, a workaholic. He probably gets a lot of value from it and identity from it, blah, 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 blah. Cool. But let's not use him as an example of what a good employee looks like. Let's be a little bit, let's leave it. Let's be a, if we're going to pretend to be empaths and we're going we're gonna to be pretend to be in touch with our feelings and too emotional and stuff, let's understand that maybe Chin isn't reflective, isn't representative of how regular people treat jobs of regular employee, of regular employees out there. He's a little bit of a freak in that regard. And they take advantage of that freak freakness to get the most out of him because he has no life and they can make him work around the clock and stuff. And I have a feeling now, honestly, I agree. I think Severa Design was a person that said it. Severa Design was the one that said it. I'm actually agreeing with Severa Design. The fact that these guys act the way they do, the fact that they treated George the way they treated George, I'm now of the thinking, I don't think Chin actually gets paid what he should get paid. I think Chin definitely gets underpaid. I think the fact that they 
take advantage of their employees the way they do, the fact that they don't respect their work the way they do, the fact that they dismiss and dis, you know dispose of them the way that they do, the fact that they treat them the way they do, most likely Chin isn't getting paid what he's due to get paid, which is awful. Which is awful if you think about it because he works around the clock, he gives his life to that fucking job and what? He owns stocks in a company that doesn't do much and he probably doesn't get paid as much as he should do as a base salary. I'm pretty much certain of it. On your neck, right? He had he was wearing a he was wearing like a hard drive and he goes, I'm your guy, this is what I can oh, do. Oh, he got hired you guys at the and, lab. And, and Chin Chin is Chin is a guy who no matter what, any any crisis we've been through. By the way, remember this. Remember this. Remember this. Remember this. When Chin gets fired, remember this clip. <laughs> when Chin eventually gets fired too, remember this clip. Even though I don't think they should fire Chin, even though I think Chin is the most important person at Thick Boy, maybe even more important than Brendan, because if Chin leaves, no one else, they're, they're never going to find one producer who's going to do what Chin does by himself. He does the job of probably two people, maybe even three. No one else would do their job and put up with them as people and work with them and have their reputational damage. No one's going to do that. So I honestly do think you should keep abreast of this conversation. Remember it, save it in your memory bank when Chin eventually gets fired. <laughs> Whatever it is, this motherfucker would always say to me, Brian, stay pro positive. Brian, stay positive. Brian, stay positive. Or, or just he's the rock. He's the fucking rock. No Dwayne matter Johnson. what, always here. Hmm? Dwayne Johnson. He's go on, Brendan. Say something nice about him too. You see how Brendan looked down. Brian's sucking him off, and Brendan kind of looked down and didn't say nothing. Uh oh. Again, I could be reading too much into it. I could be reading too much into it. I could be fucking bored. I could be fucking you know um, devoid of any friends, living in my parents' basement. Fingers covered in Cheeto dust. I could be making this all up, but that isn't a good sign. Brian is sucking off Chin. He's sucking off. He's giving him a good little blowy. And Brendan doesn't fucking get on his knees too. Bit odd. You know what, Chin? You're the Asian Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Only not as thick. That's sick. And yeah, probably have good. a better heart. Not a, not a better heart. Uh, nothing I mean, from Brendan. He, nothing from Brendan. Physically. Yeah. Nothing his, from his Brendan. Push, he's pushing things. Right nothing from Brendan. He's, he's pushing things. Yeah. Nothing God from Brendan. Yep. Nothing from Brendan. Yeah, no, I love George. Oh, I love George. See? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Chin, be worried, brother. Your day's coming soon, bro. You're going to meet Lex as well soon. You're going to meet Lex too. Lex Luthor's going to come and knocking. Lex Luthor's going to come knocking and tell you, hey, Chin, go back to fucking Korea. <laughs> Chin, you got all the time in the world to go to fucking Korean barbecue. You got all the time in the world to go fishing now. <laughs> Chin, your day is coming, bro. Be worried. Be keep your head in the swivel, brother. Your day is coming soon. Everybody keeps getting fired around him. Your day is coming, bro. <laughs> Georgie. So I wish there was a cooler story for you guys, but yeah, that's it. George is good. Yeah, chin sad. Chin, how you sad. feel? What do you have to say about it? That's just sad, you know. I got attached yeah. to him, so yeah. of course, we all did. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, chin knows his bread's buttered. Chin didn't want to say too much. It's just sad. We got attached to him. That's like he's a fucking dog. We got attached to him like he was a fucking office dog. What? <laughs> Yeah. Chin sad. Chin, how you feel? What do you have to say about it? That's just sad, you know, I got attached yeah. to him, so yeah. Of course. Oh, yeah. look at the girl but looking down. The girl didn't say nothing. What's her name again? Sh Shiraz. Is that like a is 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 that a wine? Shiraz, is that a name? Sh Shiraz, Shiraz? Isn't Shiraz a wine? I don't know. But yeah, this girl doesn't say much as well. She kinda looks down. Kinda awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, what yeah. a fucking joke! Yeah. yeah, but he'll be. We'll, we'll bring him back in. Oh yeah, periodically. He's gonna be around LA for a while. Is you're he, gonna you're yeah. gonna bring him back in <laughs> to do what? <laughs> They're gonna bring him back in to do what? I love when they say these things. Did they say the same thing about Theo? Theo's always gonna be coming back. Theo never came back again. George is never coming back, bro. George is never coming back. 
That's Good. important. Um, anyway, <laughs> all right. So uh, anyway, <laughs> let's take. I'm gonna cry. Let's take a break. Let's take a. <laughs> let's take a 30 second uh, weep break. And take a hot weep break. <laughs> How about uh, changing lanes? How about the, the are you familiar with uh, Gypsy Rose? Oh my God, of course, Gypsy fucking Rose talk. Anyway, you had your own Gypsy Rose. George was your Gypsy Rose and look what you did to him. Look what you did to him. You had your own Gypsy Rose. George was your Gypsy Rose and you treated him like shit. Oh, oh, oh. God almighty. God almighty. So, what do we think? Um, what do we think here? Exactly, Josie. Chin, keep your resume up. NJ Ranger, I bet they will try to do this shit with AI because they can understand the technology. Um, <laughs> Severe Design says, let's think critically here, Fickies. Notice Brian keeps referring to George's dismissal of information as this misinformation, but it turned out to be true. Exactly. That's the thing, Severe Design. He keeps saying everybody got it wrong, but everything that happened on the Reddit was right. And if anything, you know what this also proves? This proves that Reddit runs a fucking podcast. Even though they act like they don't read comments and all this stuff, that Reddit runs this fucking podcast. The Reddit actually has got these guys on strings. They're actually the ones behind <laughs> all the shit that happened. <laughs> They actually are the ones that are like moving them around like fucking puppets. It's actually kind of crazy. They don't read comments. Brendan posts and ghosts. But that Reddit runs them. They're on fucking strings. That's the actual truth of it. Can you imagine? Wow. They've actually proved how powerful that Reddit actually is. Fucking hell. Bobby Lee is actually... Bobby Lee runs the Fire and the Kid subreddit. Bobby Lee runs it and he runs a podcast. That's the truth of the matter, isn't it? Bloody hell, man. What an absolute horror show. Absolute horror show from all involved. Absolute fucking horror show. Exactly, Josie. The um Game Breed Footballer. <laughs> look at the look look at the contrast. Game breed footballer. The girls are girls a knob too. Josie. The girl could not give a fuck. <laughs> Both things are true. Both things could be true. According to BGL, that girl's fucking Brendan. According to BGL, that girl is having sexual relations with Brendan in the fucking King and the Sting Golden Hour offices. Do you guys believe that to be true? That's what fucking BGL says. He says Brendan is clapping those, um, you know, those fucking cheeks in that fucking Golden Hour room. What do you guys think? Do you believe this to be true? That's what BGL said. BGL said he's clapping those cheeks. Listen to this. I know the ex, you know, boyfriend of the Snaz girl and... Oh, that's her name, Snaz. He was telling me, like, Brendan was one of the reasons they broke up because she'd constantly be texting him and calling him, like, at night and at weird times and just their relationship seemed inappropriate to him. So do you believe that? Do you believe that somehow BGL is friends with that girl's ex-boyfriend and he told him that they broke up because he found texts or saw his girl texting brendan late at night <laughs> i can't be i don't want to believe this because i thought initially when she joined that brian would be the guy to try and fuck her i don't know why something told me that brian would try to slide in there you know and do a little bit of like, ha ha, he he, you're my work wife. Let me touch your bum as you're walking by me and shit. That's what I thought would happen, right? Especially with his history of, you know, not asking for permission and never, and never taking no for an answer. But I wouldn't, I was, I didn't know Brendan would be that sloppy. So I don't, I don't know. <sighs> BGO has a, BGO has every reason to disparage Brendan because he doesn't like him. But I also, I'm of the thinking of why would he lie about this? You know, it's a dumb thing to lie about. And he's, and he's having a DM with somebody privately. It's not like he posted this on a Reddit. Even though probably he knows he's going to get posted on Reddit, you know, there's no reason for him to lie. So I'm inclined to believe him, but it's fucking wild if it's true. Him, and it was like, why are you having giggly text and phone conversations at all hours of the night? Like, and she'd be like, it's just work. Oh my God, he's my boss. It's nothing like classic female downplay, you know, a situation where... 
obviously they're fucking. And I've seen him take multiple women in during the day, during business hours, during all his employees are working, he'll take some bitch into the fucking King of the Sting slash Golden Hour room and fuck her for, you know, like disappear for two hours. Can you imagine working at Thick Boy and having to listen to fucking Brendan grunting and and moaning as he's allegedly smashing somebody in the next room? And then you have to be like chin and walk in there and carry that big fucking box, that big wooden box with all the fucking gear in it and sell them the other podcast. Can you imagine that to be true? Can you imagine that awful that must be to work somewhere like that and have your boss smashing some random and you have to fucking, you know, set up the fucking studio for them later on with the smell of fucking, you know, sexual intercourse in the air. And fucking nicotine pouches all over the floor. And half drunken bottles of fucking Tiger Fick whiskey. And Addies and stuff on the floor. And maybe some rubbers and stuff. Can you imagine? But yeah. Exactly. People are saying, well, Game Breach Football is not believing it because it's not because it's two hours. Brendan Cart lost two hours. No one's no one's disagreeing with if it happened. They're just debating on whether or not he could actually last two hours. They don't believe it. Just the two hour fuck fest at work. <laughs> no one believes it. The two hours is the de- is the thing that no one could believe. Two hours? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh I love that BGL actually knows the time too. BGO was that in love with Brendan. He was keeping a, a, a he's keeping score of the time of how long Brendan was actually fucking. He was actually making note of it. Making note of how long Brendan was fucking. And probably high fiving him like, yeah, m- yeah, man. Well done. Well done, bro. Well done, bro. You know, like fucking hell, bro. Can you fucking imagine? You know what I mean? Smashing some fucking random at work for fucking two hours. Jesus Christ, don't you have work to do? Don't you have fucking work to do, mate? What the fuck is going on? Hey? You're out here fucking fucking and sucking for two hours. Don't you have work to do, bruv? Fucking hell. Um In terms of believability I don't know, it just sounds too it just sounds too made up, innit? I don't know, man. But why would he lie? What am I gonna say? I'm I'm going to call cap on it. I don't want to, but I'm going to call cap on it. It just sounds too like, I don't know. It just, I don't know. It just sounds a little bit fucking Jay from in between us, you know, like I'm going to call cap. I'm going to call cap. I'm going to call cap. Huge cap on that. I don't know. I want it to be true. I badly want it to be true, but I'm going to call it cap. I'm going to call cap. I really would like it to be true. I would like nothing more than to know knowledge of that and have that be one of the next fucking arcs and sagas in Brendan in Brian in Brendan's life. That would be funny to follow the whole fucking that you know um you know for to to follow the whole demise of that and have have her come out and say something. That would be brilliant. But I don't think it's true. It sounds too fucking made up. Okay, but hey, I could be wrong. Next clip here to check out. Um, old Brian is just caught up in the middle of all this. Let's see what this is saying. We didn't watch this before. What's this saying? Da, 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 let's zoom in a bit. Let's get this video on. Let's see what it's saying. What's up, Brian? Good luck, guys. <laughs> You're a bitch, huh? Huh? You're a bitch? Hey, bro. Stay there. I'm going to tell you something. Back when Chris and Bri- Bri- Brian used to be friends, right? Remember? When Chris and Brian used to be friends, they're not friends anymore though, right? Since Chris got accused of being a diddler, Brian doesn't know him. They don't hang out. They've never been on tour together. They've never been to dinner together. They only meet each other in comedy clubs. And even when they meet in comedy clubs, they're just there to work. They don't know each other at all. These niggas should be at home with their children. 
these guys are in their mid 40s with kids and stuff right and this is what they're doing like that's probably why these guys enjoy being stand-up comedians isn't it it's sort of like a divorce from your responsibilities you actually get to like be paid for being in a constant state of arrested development he actually pays you to be a fucking you know to have some sort of peer pan syndrome you actually get paid for it when yes you should be at home with your kids it's dark out it's late at night you should be fucking reading your kids bed, bed bedtime stories you should maybe be talking to your wife about her day and letting her unload about you know her fucking annoying workmates and stuff you shouldn't like what is this he's never gonna change that in it that fucking stance in it right the fucking stance with the legs things in it that's 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 brian's comedy right and i was like and my legs were like i was running like she was like i just feel like a man she's a woman i'm a man like fucking hell bro get some new material you old fuck What's happening? That voice inflection that he does is so funny when he's trying to be serious. He's like a fucking um, supply teacher when they're trying to get their class in control. Guys, excuse me. Can you listen to what I'm saying, please? Okay. Hello. Please. Could you all settle down and listen to me? Let me be clear. I did not rape that lady. Oh my God, bro. Karma is so beautiful, isn't it? Karma is so beautiful. He chucks Chris under the bus, even though... He was more than aware of Chris's wrongdoings. Everybody was in comedy, right? They all were. Even though they try to all act like they're fucking shocked now and they all try and get on their fucking, you know, soapbox and whatever it may be. They all knew, right? They all knew. But then the moment he got fucking found out, everybody pretended like they didn't know and they all kind of not his friends anymore. Brian probably knew more than most because they were best friends. He throws him under the bus. He, dis he fucking, you know, pretends he doesn't know him. And then... The I think it's the following week he gets accused of rape. Can you imagine the karma that happens? You know, there should be a there should be some honor amongst diddlers and rapists. Really, there should be like some sort of like, hey, you got my back, I got your back, I keep your secrets, you keep mine. But when you fucking you know, when you do that sort of shit, the 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 fucking creepo gods, right? The sex pest gods don't look down well on that sort of stuff. You know. <laughs> oh. Not friends, by the way. Not friends, by the way. Remember, not friends. Not friends. Don't know each other that well. Remember that. Not friends. Not close friends at all. The irony is, the irony is, the irony is this. The irony is... The best content each has ever made was when they were working together on 10 Minute Podcast. And they really should have a show together. It shouldn't be a show with fucking Brendan and Eric Griffin and fucking Chris. It should be a show involving Brian. If that show actually involved Brian, it'd actually be quite funny. That's the irony of it. The irony of it is Chris got cancelled and Brian, Brendan actually used that as a good opportunity to slip in there and become Chris's best friend. Because before that, Chris and Brian were best friends. They were close. But then when, when they both got cancelled, it drove a wedge between them and Brendan slipped in there and then became Chris's best friend by force. And that's when they do content together now. But really and truly, the best content they could ever make is if Brendan and Brian were... were sorry, Brian and Chris were involved together. The pedo and the rapist, allegedly, would actually make really good content. That's the funny bit around it, but they can't because, you know, they don't know each other.
Can you imagine somebody writing that as a headline about you? Husband of Brian Callan's rape accuser claims comedian is a danger to the entertainment industry. <laughs> even if it's not true, even if it isn't true, the fact that he has this as a headline is fucking hilarious. Ah, oh, you're a danger to the entertainment industry. This guy's a fucking monster. Lock him up. Throw away the key. <laughs> Somebody won't you think of the children, eh? That comedy, innit? That's the comedy that he does. Let me be effeminate. Let me pretend like I'm gay. Let me do all this fucking funny movement and that's it. Imagine getting paid to do that kind of comedy. That's the comedy that you do. Like the kind of like, you know, the kind of stuff that you would do to make your fucking college roommates laugh and shit. These guys are doing when you're like 50 plus on stage. Girls are like, guys are like, have you ever been in a date? And the girl says, I was fucking this one girl one time. It's like, bro, you have, you have two families. You're 50. Like, can we stop with this? <laughs> you know what's funny as well? Everybody was saying when Chris was at his pomp, Chris was always known as a guy that had girl fans at his comedy show. Because I guess a lot of these male comedians don't really have a lot of female women fans, right? Um, he was, you know, before fucking, what's his name? Uh, Matt Rife came around. Chris Lear was known as a hot guy. But it was always a bit of an inside joke that a lot of the girls that would come to his shows looked really young. That was what everyone used to say. So I found it really funny when the news broke and they all started sobbing and crying as if it was a big surprise. It's like, bro, don't you all joke about him having young fans anyway? Like, why are you surprised? Come on, bro. Why are you surprised? To be fair, he's right. He did continue doing what he wanted. Wasn't it, wasn't it kind of revealed after the fact that when he made that apology podcast thing where he was talking really soft and so about going to sex therapy? Wasn't it revealed that that same time he was still texting the same girls and shit and still you know going to random hotels and hooking up with them and stuff and stuff right like he still continued doing the same thing that's the funny thing about it he hasn't actually changed <laughs> nothing he's maybe slowed down but that's it nothing's actually changed <laughs> he's not on netflix anymore but he's still doing the same shit That's just a couple of strangers playing baseball with each other, right? Just a couple of strangers who don't know each other playing some baseball. Thank you very much. You guys rock. <laughs> oh, that was brilliant. That was fucking brilliant. Big up fucking Brian Callen. Big up Brian the kid fucking Callen. The fucking diddler whisperer. The diddler whisperer in chief. The fucking diddler whisperer in fucking chief. Um, what else? What else were to talk about here? We spoken about the car thing yesterday. We did the fear thing yesterday. We did the George thing yesterday. What else were to talk about here? Buddy, 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 boom. Of course, if you're watching the stream and you're enjoying what you're seeing, please make sure you're liking the stream. That would be greatly appreciated. Help a brother out. Smash a like, even a dislike. Just leave some level of engagement there. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated, my dear, dear, dear friends. Um, let's continue here. Um, let's do a bit of podcast cringe. Podcast screen's got a new video out. Dumb and Dumber about Brendan. The cost of stupidity. Let's see what this is about. Let's see what this is about. Dumb and Dumber. Dumb and Dumber. 
Big Up Podcast Cringe. Great channel. You know I love them. Um, the Cost of Stupidity featuring Brett Crash. Let's call let's, let's play this. Let's see what he's saying. Big Up Podcast Cringe. Bada bing, bada boom. Come on, son. Work, 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 work. There you go. The, I only saw two minutes of the way. Okay, cool. Big up the watcher. Big up the watcher. Big up the watcher, my guy. What's good? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Let's roll. Come on. Du, 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 du. Bear with me a little bit as it's loading here, my friends. Apologies for the delay. It's going to be here in a second, any moment now, any moment now. Let's fucking go. Who makes more money? You're Tom. Uh, You're selling more. No, no. Bigger I mean, no, I mean, I, 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 I should shut know. up because no, I no, love no. him and he'll, he'll eviscerate me. Probably. No, no. Tom has his, I think his podcast, Your Mom's House is very right. profitable. I don't think he's touring right now. So it's like, it's anytime anyone's touring. I definitely do bigger venues than he does. Oh, really? Yeah, he knows that. Okay, good. The uh, he doesn't. He's done an arena. I do arenas. <laughs> so like, whereas Tom has done an I, arena. Uh, one here. He, he's primarily his comfort levels theaters. That's where he really can sell right. tickets. One truck. Yeah, not I, even. Oh. I I have like five semis Six. and three tour buses. Yeah, right, right, right. He has, like, he flies. Yeah. He he flew uh, yeah. Southwest recently. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Happy New Year to all my regulars. This is my first video back, so I hope it finds you well. And to start off the new year, I'm gonna be breaking down what's going on with Bert Kreischer and Brendan Schaub because I have some new information for you guys that has me pretty confused. I don't know, maybe you guys can make better sense of it than I can. Basically, it looks like Bert has hired some random Indian firm based out of Mumbai to start spamming copyright claims against YouTubers. Really? I've received a couple myself, and I have no idea if Bert actually really? hired. Really? Ah. Huh. Is Bert doing this, or is this somebody trying to make some money? Because that's a bit of a scheme, as all people do, right? Where they file copyright claims and they're not the copyright holder and they just claim they are it's a nice little racket you can do hmm i had these guys to look after his copyright claims or if they're youtube copyright trolls pretending to represent bert to steal ad revenue allegedly on his behalf so i'll show you exactly what's going on there wow. also after making a video a couple of weeks ago covering a recent interview with brendan Schaub, where he claimed to have an ongoing defamation claim in the courts i've since done a bit of digging and made some interesting discoveries which i'll share with you as well but here's the bottom line in my opinion, both Bert Kreischer and Brendan Schaub are slowly going broke. So let me explain exactly what I mean. What? Really? Bert. Brendan, I could see. Bert, I don't think. Bert, I think, makes a lot of money. Huh. And then I'll come back to those two discoveries I just mentioned, and I'll tie it all in for you. I've covered this briefly in a previous video, and it's an ongoing trend within the podcasting industry where a lot- Honestly, why is he wearing a Chelsea shirt? This guy is the most deplorable person when it comes to jerseys. Why did he own a Chelsea shirt? Big up high def, appreciate it, brother. Merry New Year. Thanks for all the streams in 2023. Merry New Year to you too, high def. Thank you so much for the super chat, brother. Appreciate you and hope you're doing well. Hope the family's well. Hope you are well and all of those things in between, my good sir. Hope you are feeling amazing, brightly and shining, okay? Fuck, bro. A lot of shows that blew up during the pandemic are now seeing. Oh yeah, big up Netwatcher. Yeah, I'm gonna cover that next, next, next um show. Um, the fucking um Hans Kim versus Rick thing. Yeah, I'll cover it next show. I've been doing a bit of viewing on it. I checked out some clips on the Reddit. It's fucking hilarious. I'll cover it in the next stream. Thank you for the reminder, brother. Thank you for the reminder. Significant declines in viewership and obviously ad revenue. Look, oh, look at I realize now. Wasn't Brendan wearing that Chelsea jersey because of Christian Pulisic? Was that the reason why? Right? The fucking... You, the, the, the American fucking football player that, that went to Chelsea. That's why he was wearing the fucking Chelsea jersey. 
Because Christian Pulisic played for them. Cringe. Cringe, bro. He owns a jersey from every fucking team in the world, even fucking random soccer teams that he has no fucking idea about. Like, oh, God almighty. Yeah, he plays for AC now. Yeah, he's pulling up. He's doing pretty well there as well. Him and Rafael Liao on opposite sides of the flank, absolutely bossing it. Big up, Theodore. This should get you a baker's dozen of tatar tots. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. A <laughs> bacon does some tater tats. Uh, tater tats. Thank you. I'll get myself some tater tats, actually. Thank you so much. <laughs> a baker's dozen of tater tats. Yeah. Now seeing significant declines in viewership and obviously ad revenue. Let's look at Bert and Schaub, for example. If we start with Bert's 12 latest uploads, in terms of views, he got 11k views, 22, 48, 51, 49, 23, 116, 75, 27, 73, 57, and 276. And that's as of the 2nd of January. His subscriber count is sitting at 1.27 million. So on face value, those numbers aren't that bad. I mean, it's hard to get views, right? But his channel is almost 20 years old. That's right, he started his channel way back in 2006. Some of you watching this right now were probably in diapers in 2006. And I'll tell you what, if I was in the business of entertainment for 20 years and my main YouTube channel was struggling to break 50k views on the regular, yeah, I'd say there's a problem. And it's the same for Bupper. On his Fighter and the Kid channel, his regular views sit between 50 and 60k grand views. I don't think that's right though with Bert. I kind don't of think Bert makes a lot of money from his podcasting. I think a lot more money comes from the touring, um, obviously the ads on the podcast, but I don't think he makes a lot of money from like AdSense and shit. That's never been the game. You know? I don't I don't I don't know. What do you guys think? There's a pod here with a guy called Oh, okay, okay. Maybe maybe he's right, podcast cringe. Because I see Burtcast number 605. It's, two, it's, a, it's 20 hours ago uploaded. It's on 5.7K, thousand views only. And he's got 1.7 million subscribers. That's not good, is it, really? To have a podcast that's got only 5,000 views and you've got 1.7 million followers, 1.2 million followers, isn't the greatest. But then the next show underneath it, Hot Sauce, um, is got 40K views. I don't know. A lot of these guys don't really... A lot of these guys use their podcast as a way to get ads. And that pays the most money. Because it's money you get up front. And we all know from the whole Podcast One controversy, these ad companies pay way too much money to podcasts. Right? That's why the podcast probably probably burst. Right? This, they're overpaying for shows. They're not receiving anything um, you know, on the back end in terms of user signups or whatever, discount codes using, whatever it may be. Um, so that's why the fucking market is a bit fucked up. But I think that's the main money earner. I don't think AdSense or that shit has ever been the biggest money earner. I think it's a nice top up if you're able to get, you know, two to five grand a month extra. But I think the main chunk of their money comes from the ads. Liquid Death, Athletic Greens, On It, all these fucking ads and shit are the ones that pay the most. I think so. You've probably also noticed that for both Bert and Schaub, they occasionally have an upload with a couple of hundred thousand views, but that's usually a video that involves a big name that acts as a draw card. And what that tells me is that these guys can't draw in the viewers themselves unless they do something unique like have a special guest on, for example. To further prove my point here, let's take a look at Theo Vaughn's channel real quick. Yeah, um, Koyla, he's not consistent with the Bert cast, is he? I don't, I think you might be right because I'm looking at the, I'm looking at my phone now Burtcast 605 has 5.7 views. Burtcast 604, 23,000 views. The guest there was Gary Gorman. Burtcast 603 with guest Felipe Esparza, Huckleberry Hill, and someone called Regaline Farms, 53,000 views. Burtcast 602 with Shane Torres, 23,000 views. Burtcast 601 with Heather McMahon, Heather McMahon, McMahon. Um, that one got 27,000 views. Burtcast 600 with Red Rocks, 58. That's pretty decent, don't you think? Again, it's not super consistent. Like Koyla said, it's like two week gaps in between episodes. But for a podcast that doesn't have super popular guests on there and it's kind of inside baseball comedy talk, 
to get like there's an episode here with a guy called um Mike Mike Vicione. I'm assuming he's a very you know heads comedian. That's twenty six thousand views. That's pretty decent, I think. Don't you think so? For somebody that's not super popular, Burtcast five nine seven with Chris Stefano. That that oh wow the Chris Di Stefano one got two hundred and seventy two thousand views. And then the one with um the one with that kid. What's his name? The oh, there's the one here with Trick Daddy got eighty five thousand views. Burtcast. I don't know. I think it's pretty decent. To get anywhere between like 20,000 to 100,000 views for Burt is pretty decent, I think. Sure, he's sitting at almost 2.3 million subscribers, but his podcast regularly goes over the million view mark, and even the episodes where it's just him on his own, they still almost get 500k views. And what about Tim Dillon? He's got 583,000 subscribers and he routinely gets well into the 200 to 300k mark. That's a good point. So Bert and Shaw get views around the 1 to 5% mark relative to their subscribers. That is a terrible view to subscriber ratio, especially for two YouTubers who have been doing it for so many years. Now, here's why I think Bert and Shaw have reached a tipping point. This is the punchline. Commentary videos like this one are getting more views than their podcasts. Mm. There are several channels that provide high quality commentary on these guys, like Too Lazy, Comedy Enforcement, Joke World, and don't forget my boy Sewer King who's on his way up. Shout out to Sewer King, love you man. Those guys routinely get more views than the actual content they're covering, and think about all those mini documentary channels like Patrick CC, Ghost Gum, Jay Aubrey, Beige Frequency, <laughs> Sunny V2. Some of those guys get millions of views per upload. What about guys like Rogan and Theo Von though? Yeah, but I don't think that's fair though. I think commentary channels kind of fill a void because most people don't want to watch their content. Most people don't want to watch comedians' content and shit. They'd rather have commentary channels or people like me or whatever summarize shit, right? Or maybe just, you know, whatever, re review things. They don't really want to watch things. Like, whenever I try and watch a fucking full T-Fat show on here, people fucking go crazy to chat. They fucking hate it. They'd rather I just pull the clips or just watch the clips from the T-Fat K Reddit. No one wants to actually watch sit there and watch their content. So you're always going to get more views because people don't want to watch their content. They just want to laugh at them saying dumb, funny things. So that might be the reason. Again, maybe I'm defending them too much. I don't know. I just don't buy the fact. I, I just don't buy that it's that significant their views are down because I think they make a lot more money on ads. And obviously they make, especially in Bert's case, he makes a hell of a lot of money on tours, right? He's always on fucking tour. He's always doing shows somewhere. He's never with his family for the most part. So you'd imagine that makes a lot of money for them. So I don't think they're hurting the way that Podcast Cringe said it, they're hurting. Maybe they're, obviously their views aren't great compared to maybe Theo, but Theo's also a bit of an outlier. I think so. So they will always get more views than commentary videos and mini docos. So that's why when I started receiving copyright claims from some random Indian company I'd never heard of, claiming to be working on behalf of Bert Crusher, it made sense to me, Bert's getting desperate. He's in panic mode. But wait, there's an alternative explanation. So I was chatting to my lawyer earlier today, who's also my best friend, and I was filling him in on the whole Bert Kreischer matter entertainment copyright business. And he actually thinks that this rando Indian company are copyright trolls. As in, Bert Kreischer doesn't know who they are, there's no agreement, they basically fish for content they can make copyright claims against and start stealing ad revenue off channels like mine. Yeah, yeah, now, basically. I don't agree with that. I think Bert is stupid enough to do business with a company like that because his views are falling off and he's bleeding cash every month. But I could be wrong. Have a look for yourself. This is their website. These are their three sections, legal, services, and contact. They say, Matter Entertainment is a Mumbai-based entertainment and content company. In our talent management division, we work with leading creative talent across the realms of direction, screenwriting, and publishing to create entertainment for the global Indian audience. In addition to talent management, we offer integrated capabilities of content curation, development, and full-scale production in our producing division. Okay, doesn't mention anything about content management or copyright management. It looks like a production company to me. I even managed to find who founded the company, some guy called Caleb Franklin, who apparently originated from LA, graduated from Harvard, and now he lives in Mumbai. He's got deals with Netflix, Amazon, Sony, Disney+. Plus. So maybe this company is legit. 
but why did Bert hire an Indian company to steal ad revenue of commentary channels? <laughs> Maybe it was cheaper than using bent pixels like Brendan Schaub or Superbam like Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. both of which are LA-based companies. Anyway, who knows? It all seems so dodgy to me, but let's put some numbers on all of this so we can get a better idea of how much we're talking here. And to do that, we're going to jump over to ex-YMH producer Nadav, who recently jumped ship to start his very own channel. And lucky for us, he's making a series on how podcasts make money. This was from part one just two weeks ago. And for reference, CPM means cost per mille or thousand views. And it's an advertising term used as a rate paid to a content creator for advertising on their website, okay. video or social media account. Mm -hmm. So basically for every thousand views, a creator will get paid a specific CPM rate from the advertiser. Let's plug in the numbers for something that's in the entertainment niche. Let's say it's an hour long podcast with a CPM of 50 cents and it has 10,000 views. I just plug that into the old J piano and that comes out to a whopping 50 bucks in YouTube ad revenue. However, let's say a podcast has a CPM of $10 and got 3.6 million views. That comes out to an insane $360,000. Now keep in mind, that's an abnormally high CPM and abnormally high number of views for a podcast. So let's go with the average. Let's say an entertainment podcast has about 150,000 views and a CPM of the average, which is about $2. That comes out to $3,000 and that's a lot more realistic than some of the other numbers I was talking about. Um, hang on a second, is that right? Let's just double check those numbers. So if I go over to ChatGPT, if a video with a CPM of $10 gets 3.6 million views, how much ad revenue did it make? Do some calculations. The estimated ad revenue for the video with 3.6 million views and a CPM of $10 would be $36,000. <laughs> um, what did Nadav say again? <laughs> That's why you got fired, isn't it? That's why Nadav got fired from your mom's house. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, mate. You carry too many zeros, right? <laughs> oh, fucking the dog. That's why he got fired, man. Or oh, that's why he had to go. <laughs> However, let's say a podcast has a CPM of $10 and got oh, 3.6 million views. That comes out to an insane $360,000. 300, huh, not quite. <laughs> 360,000. Yo, he thinks like everybody is like a multi-millionaire. <laughs> Holy shit. God almighty. No wonder everybody's shitting that fucking podcast, isn't it? <laughs> Dove, but you were only $324,000 off the mark. Did Tom teach you nothing? Jeez, mate, maybe this will help. Just know that it's your mindset and you're thinking <laughs> like a loser, but... You don't have to. You don't. You can change the way you think, but you have to accept the way you're thinking right now is not going to get you anywhere. You're being bitter. You're being petty. You're insecure. You're not confident. And you can change that, but you have to be proactive. <laughs> okay, that was mean. Shout out to Nadav. Maybe just steer clear from talking about numbers altogether. But hey, at least he cleared it up in the comments, right? Hopefully Tom never relied on his numbers when buying all these cars. Anyway, looking at Bird and Shaw, it's a it's an interesting grift, isn't it? Like it's an interesting angle, isn't it? I worked out a podcast. Let me tell you all about the numbers, and then he gets the numbers wrong. <laughs> I worked on a very successful podcast. I know everything that goes on about. I know all the inner workings on that makes a podcast successful. Let me tell you all the inside information that you guys don't know about. All the behind the scenes stuff. First fucking thing he does, gets the information wrong numbers because they've got brand deals and they do ad reads i think they're probably working off a cpm in the range of 20 to 30 dollars so taking their average video of 40 to 50k views they're looking at anywhere from 1000 to 1500 dollars per video but if we look at their channels from a top down view bert got around 800,000 views in the last week which using our cpm of 20 to 30 dollars gets him to around 20,000 dollars for the week and for sure things are looking a little bit worse with just 250k views for the week which would be bringing in around $6,000 for that week. Now, that's a lot of money, right? No arguments there. They're still doing okay. But when you start including their overheads and their expenses, the picture doesn't look so rosy. 
Shorb has to pay Callan and two producers, he's got to keep the lights on, pay the bills, pay the rent for the studio, etc. Well, he does have to pay George now. He can save some money. He didn't pay George, so he can save some money that way. He does have to pay George, so he can save some money that way. And it's the same for Bert. These guys have full-time staff working for them. They both also have other side gigs, like Bert has Two Bears One Cave with Tom, Shorb has his Thick Boy channel and his new one called Toontown, so I think Bert is still getting by, but Shorb is definitely feeling the heat, in my opinion at least. I'm sure a bunch of you have heard about Bupper's latest fail after he flew out one of his fans to LA and then offered him an internship at Cringe Boy Studios, only to apparently let him go because he couldn't afford to pay him. Now, I'm not fully across that situation, all I did was watch Too Lazy's video, so go and check that out if you haven't already, but see, this is what I mean about tough times for Shorb. And to make matters worse for him, he recently joined the Podcast One network after he was apparently scammed out of $1.6 million in unpaid ad revenue from his previous network. But he so did get it back. But he did get it back. He did get it back. That's why he signed with them. Because no one... I kind of got why he signed back with Podcast Cringe. We're sorry, with them, Pod, Podcast One. Because nobody else was going to pay him the rates that he was getting. Nobody was probably going to sign him anyway. So he's probably low on options, low on guarantees. So he went with Podcast One because they owed him money and they paid the money to him, right? They took out a loan with some online Spanish fucking credit, um, you know, uh, I forgot, was it that like payday loan service or something? Something crazy. I remember I read that in the article on the stream and that's how he got his money. So he got paid at 1.6 million and obviously he went and bought a car. <laughs> right he went and bought a fucking car straight away um but yeah he got paid so it was probably a smart decision to go sign up back up with podcast one actually if you think about it as part of this deal he supposedly took a bunch of shares in podcast one which he was bragging about if you want to know the details go and check out my video covering that but let's check in to see how bupper's shares in podcast one are going they ipo'd in september at four dollars 39 and now they're trading at, oh wow, $1.86. That's an almost 60% decline almighty, in value bro. over a four month period. Whoops. You know, I'm a shark when it comes to business. But that's the thing though. That's the thing that's funny though. They obviously are doing badly, but he's doing well. That's the thing. He still came up trumps with that because he got the money. He basically was signed up. I forgot what they were called before podcast one. So he was signed to terms that were crazy favorable to him not to the company that company beforehand they were doing guaranteed minimums right or payouts or whatever it may be which is fucking crazy so before you even get fucking ads they will pay you a certain amount and they were doing that obviously to make sure they get you know all the podcasts on their fucking network then obviously over time the ad stopped coming in they couldn't stop they couldn't offer the money they couldn't offer guarantees money they couldn't keep up the payments and obviously that's when it started fucking scamming people but brendan was owed 1.6 million from them and he obviously is not get that for anybody else. So he stuck with them and still got the money. So even though he signed with them and he might have stocks, you know, it involved, you know, interest and shit, he still kind of came out of it smelling like roses because he got the money he's owed and he still has a podcast ad network behind him that he probably wouldn't have got on his own. You know, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to say, but he still did the, I wouldn't say the smart thing, the right thing, not the smart thing, the right thing. Business. They underpaid my man. That a boy B. Just keep moving. Don't stop. Jeez, lucky Toontown's going gangbusters. Oh, thanks, man. Oh, that means the world to me. Thank you. No worries, B. I got you, bro. He, but he, he didn't cry like that about George, did he? He only cries like that about Crystalia, and when they made that fake video pretending like, you know, he didn't know he was made about thanking him for putting out Gringo Pappy. Brilliant. You know, you you get you commission Chin to make a video for you with all your friends and family thank thanking you for being alive. You cry your eyes out, but then you don't cry your eyes out when you fire George, the sweet, innocent boy who didn't deserve to be fired the way he could did. Cold, cold world. As for Bert, have I mentioned that he is one of the biggest comedians in the world and regularly sells at arenas and sells millions of dollars in tickets around the world? I was talking to a comic the other day and he's like, your stage setup, how much does it cost? What do you travel with? I travel with five tour buses. I have, it's like 1.7 for a month is what I pay for my state. Like, we're, it's, it's such a huge business that if you're a guy who just wants to make people laugh, you have to, one, negotiate the open mic scene, which is 
insane. Just getting out of an open mic scene and getting to the next level is crazy. That's like little baby turtles have a better chance making it to the ocean, right. making it to deep water than a sta- than an open micer does getting out of a comedy scene. Then you have to get into the clubs, and we haven't even got you into Hollywood yet. Now you got to go to Hollywood and try to pitch a show and see if you're actually likable. I mean, this is there are so many hurdles to get through that then you go. Oh, you've got to start a podcast. you got to have a social media presence. you got to have a social media team. Do you have a producer? Who's doing your content for you? I love how none of this includes being funny. I, ha- I love that none of this includes being funny. It's all a big fucking hustle, a racket, a grift of some sort. None of it includes being funny. None of it includes putting on a good show for your fans. It's all just like, how high can I ascend? And how much money can I make? It's never about doing actual good work, putting on a fun show, making your fans smile. I don't know, whatever. It's just <laughs> it's just how far can I climb up this ladder? How much more money can I take up with me? How big can my bag get? How big of a bag do I need to carry all this motherfucking cash? For you. Oh, by the way, your digital footprint needs to be this, and that's going to cost you $10,000 a month. Where's that $10,000 from? You're not getting it from stand up. I mean, dude, I run a business and I. Digital footprint? What? Does he pay people to like what? Digital footprint? Does he mean like he pays people to make content for him 10 grand a month? Or does he mean he pays people to like clean up all the shit stuff he says and to put good press stories out there about him? 10. Honestly, if there's any way. If there's one way you can scam, you can ease a, a aspiring stand up comedian is somebody that's easily separated from their money in it. If you're a scam artist, somebody you can easily scam are aspiring comedians and aspiring actors because they all think the reason why they haven't made it is because they haven't gamed the system when really it's because they're not good. Well, really, maybe it's a timing thing or whatever, right? But they all think there's like a clever hack or a trick as to why they aren't getting as much views as they need to get. So if you're a scammer and you set up an agency that is catered around fixing the digital footprint of comedians, you're going to have a queue around the block of people willing to pay you a retainer, right? Or a monthly consultation fee or something. Because they all think it's just it's just this one thing that's gonna change their fortunes. <laughs> oh mate, honestly, they all get I've got a feeling they're all getting scammed by somebody. Everybody's scamming each other. They're scamming the ad networks by inflating their numbers of the you know podcasts and what who listens to them and all the fucking audio is king stuff to get good ad monies and shit, you know. The ad guys are, sp- are scamming them and they're fucking bored people, they're scamming their fans. You know, everybody's scamming each other. It's all one big racket. And I I run a fairly successful business, and I am one of the biggest comics in the world. And I'm still going, like, I'm checking, making sure I'm paying my overhead. Like, it's crazy. So if you missed it, Bert just said that he has his touring set up, and it costs him around $1.7 million per month. Now, I don't think that includes all the other comedians he has to pay to go on tour with him, and that's Bert's big lie. Sure, he makes big money of selling tickets to his comedy shows, but that's not all his money. I've heard so many different people say that they go to see the other comedians at Bert's shows, and when he finally gets up there, it starts clearing out. Now, I don't know if that's true wow. personally. I've never been to a Bert Crusher comedy show, and I never will. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Bert has a big machine behind him, and that machine is expensive to run, no pun intended. So, with that in mind, let's move on to Brendan Schaub's law. Huh. So, is Bert basically paying to hang around with his friends? He's basically paying the priv- He's basically paying for the opportunity to be on the road with his comedic friends and not be at home with his family. He'd rather be with the boys. So he constructs this whole elaborate tour thing to do all these shows. They don't really make much money, but he doesn't care because he likes to hang so much. Because I could see that to be true. I could I could make I could see it to be a possibility where Bert is willing just to make enough to, you know, break even, but he more likes to hang. He more likes to go to shows, get all the adoration from fans, get all that dopamine hit, right? be able to drink and hang out with his fans, do shots, take off his t-shirt. That makes some sort of sense, isn't it? 
Like, I just want to hang out with my, you know? Fuck, bro. Lawsuit and follow up from the last video because it's relevant to Bert's new Indian partnership that I spoke about earlier. So, yeah, what else are you going to do? Stop? Quit? No, no, that's not me. That's not never going to happen. But have you done anything to try to, like, um, like suppress this or, like, get on top of it? Like, it's just... What do you... I mean, no, there's nothing you can do. I mean, can, can you sue people? I don't... Have you tried doing any of that? No. I mean, we got... We, we have a lawsuit with a guy who made, like, 3,000 videos. Again, if you're going to critique... <laughs> He made 3,000 videos. I wonder how much videos, podcast cringe, these channels are going to end up making in the end. I wonder how many videos they end up, they're going to end up making in the end. Like, because it spawned a whole entire fucking economy and industry around him. That one lawsuit was one of the worst moves Brenda could have ever made. He tries to say it in a mocking term. Oh, they made, he made 3,000 videos. It's like, yeah, but you fucking suing him also like launched the careers of 3,000 more channels. It's like, you fucking shot yourself in the foot, mate. Um, Coyle is saying, a few people in the comments of that video said that they walked out of his shows. Okay. But I don't know. Actually, does, does, Brett, does Bert do a lot of shows on his own? Or are all of these shows like where he has like, other people performing as well? He, he does tour in his, his own a lot, doesn't he? He does do his own shows. So I don't know. I've not really heard him saying he's struggling to sell tickets and stuff. I don't know. Maybe they're onto something, but I don't think it's as fraught as he's making it seem. I don't think it's as he's that down bad, really, to be fair. I still think he's still got a really crazy fan base because he still sells quite a few tickets. Um, but yeah, but he probably enjoys the hang a lot. And he just wants to, you know, pay his friends to hang out with him. <laughs> stand up or my fight picks or my, whatever my football picks all good that's what the internet's for now if you're gonna go out there in uh defamation like you know whatever brendan hits his kids or beats his wife oh. well, then you got my attention i'm gonna come after you oh yeah geez. that that game i don't play and the guy's suffering from that so that is whatever but you know the internet's always gonna internet there's nothing you can do to combat that but Okay, so after I made my previous video on Bapa's interview with Joel on the Hot Breath Comedy Network, I tried to see if I could find the lawsuit that Brendan was talking about in that interview. And so I spent hours trawling through the various courts trying to find his defamation case that Shorb said he had going against the guy who, in Shorb's own words, made defamatory statements about his wife and kids, except I couldn't find it. All I found was a copyright case Brendan has going against a YouTuber, but I couldn't find the defamation case he was talking about. Now, I'm assuming that after being involved in a legal battle against a YouTuber, Brendan knows the difference between a defamation case and a copyright case. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here and assume that he must have a defamation case in the works. Maybe he just hasn't filed it yet. Who knows? There are myriad possibilities as to why I couldn't find a current defamation action from Brendan Schaub. So because I'll just have to take- Because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. His word for it and wait for more information to become publicly available. But I will say this, and I'm going to speak in general terms here because there's a broader point to all of this outside of the whole Brendan Schaub situation. In the US, there are specific provisions that safeguard against copyright claims when a copyright holder disagrees or has hurt feelings from the critique or commentary another individual makes to a US-based audience. If you want to look it up yourself, it's Title 17, United States Code, Section 512, Subsection F, which is a subsection of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, commonly referred to as the DMCA. So you've probably heard people talk about a DMCA takedown. However, in the context of this subsection, a false claim refers to a knowingly material misrepresentation that material or activity is infringing. So let me just break this down. What does that mean in the real world? Well, if a copyright owner sends a DMCA takedown notice to YouTube claiming that a particular video is infringing on their original work, but that claim is false or fraudulent, then the alleged infringer can sue the copyright owner for damages under 512F. Now, to be successful on a Section 512F claim, the plaintiff must prove that the false copyright claim was made with actual knowledge that the claim was false. Okay, now we get into the juicy bit. So, I don't think this would ever happen because Joe Rogan's a big boy with bigger things to do. 
But let's look at a completely hypothetical situation where he's scrolling through YouTube and he finds a video that says he's the worst comedian alive, he's not funny, he's also a midget, he looks like a thumb. <laughs> and in that video, they use a couple of clips from JRE to explain why they think those things about him are true. Now, he's not happy about that. So he jumps on his computer, he emails his minions at Superbam, the company that manages Rogan's content, and he says in this email, I'm so sick of these guys making fun of me. I've had it. I want you to take this video down and shut them up. I don't ever want to see a video like this using my content again. So Joe's angry, right? I hope I've conveyed that well. His minions follow their orders and they go through the process on YouTube's backend and make a DMCA takedown of that video. Say this particular YouTuber isn't scared of bullies and knows a thing or two about US copyright law and decides, you know what, this was fair use of those JRE clips. I'm going to sue him for taking my video down because I make a living from these videos. So they eventually end up in court and they get to this thing called discovery. This is my favorite part of legal disputes because effectively each party gets access to any materials from the other side. So we're talking like text messages, emails, meeting notes yep. that contain certain key words that are relevant to the case so that they can assist the court in making a determination. Mm -hmm. Everything eventually comes out, right? Mm -hmm. Now, remember that hypothetical email that Angry Joe sent to his minions at Superbam? Yeah that hypothetical email would now become evidence. And in my opinion, based off my experience in these cases, as well as my reading of Section 512F, that constitutes actual knowledge that the claim was false because it had nothing to do with copyright. It was simply a public figure trying to silence someone else's criticism of them because it hurt their feelings. Okay. That's why I'm assuming that when Brendan Shaw went and did that interview, he said all that stuff about a defamation case going because someone said nasty stuff about his wife and kids. I think he was actually talking about a defamation case because if he was talking about a copyright case, in my opinion, that would have to be the single most stupid thing an individual in his position could do because, again, this is just my opinion, a court could potentially infer from those public statements that a copyright action wasn't really a copyright action. It was simply an attempt to silence criticism, however vile and unwarranted that criticism might be. It might look like he had actual knowledge that the copyright claim was false. That's why I'm holding out for this defamation case, because there's no way someone with such expensive lawyers two years into a legal battle could be that stupid. And I'm being 100% serious. I honestly think there has to be another case. Stupidity of that. I don't think so, though. I, I, I don't think um, maybe Podcast Critics hasn't got enough experience or doesn't know enough about Brendan. But I honestly think there is no defamation case. I think Brendan was conflating or was purposely misleading um the you know the reason why he fucking sued unique he's basically trying to make it seem like that but he is that redacted that he would incorrectly describe it as a fucking defamation case and obviously open himself up to more issues in the courts because he's obviously suing unique for copyright infringement or whatever it may be but he's then trying to make it seem like it's defamation at the same point, which obviously it isn't. So, um, yeah, Brendan is that dumb. Brendan is that stupid, unfortunately. And, um, yeah, he's probably going to pay for it in the end because he's probably going to win that case. That magnitude is simply not feasible for somebody in his position. The only other thing I can think of is maybe he meant to say he has a bad case of inflammation but got his words mixed up. Who knows? But that's why I'm concerned for Bert, you see. I feel like Bert is going down that same road but for slightly different reasons. His expenses are piling up. His revenue is falling. Now he's got this random Indian company. Sorry, I find this so funny. So he's got this random Indian company trying to claw back ad revenue from other channels that are using his clips fairly as per the DMCA. And look, he'll get away with it for the most part, but there's going to be that one channel, that one guy, similar to the hypothetical Rogan example that says, hang on, he can't be doing this. He's infringing on my legal right to fair use because fair use is a legal right. It's not a legal defense. There's a difference. Hence why a copyright owner can be liable for damages in the absence of any economic loss. But look, don't worry about that. I'm probably nerding out too much. The bottom line is, for slightly different reasons, Bird and Shorb are on their way out. 
And when you put midwits like this in a corner, they start scraping the barrel and they end up accelerating their own downfall. And all their advisors and handlers are probably happy <laughs> to just take their money until it runs out. So they're surrounded by a bunch of yes men who do whatever they want them to and then desert them when it all runs out. Anyway, that's my breakdown of Dumb, Dumber and Dumberer. I think they're not going to ever fall full flat on their face. I think Brendan has always got Rogan in his corner. I think most people have surmised, myself included, that Rogan has always felt secretly guilty about making Brendan quit the UFC. And ever since then, he's made it his mission to make sure that Brendan never falls on his, you know, on his face. And he's always there to support him, even though they've kind of, you know, they've kind of drifted apart and they're maybe not as close as they once were. He always still has him on his show. He always still talks well about him when his name comes up and shit. He's kind of always kind of loyal to him in that respect. So, you know, even though he's maybe not got him on the comedy mothership and shit, their relationship still maintains because he feels a sense of, he's kind of feels like he's almost obliged or he has almost a sense of responsibility to look after Brendan because he obviously basically, um, you know, encouraged him to quit the UFC and maybe that kind of changed the course of his career. Blah, de, blah, blah, blah. And when it comes to Bert, he also comes from a family with money. He's also got friends with money and shit. He'll be fine, you know? I don't think it's ever going to get that bad for either of them. I think they've both been almost grandfathered in. They have the kind of Joe Rogan protection, which counts for a lot, which is why they all suck him off so much because basically with Joe Rogan, it means you can never fail um, because he's always, especially if you're sweet with him, he's always going to make sure he can prop you up and get you on his show to kind of get more eyes and ears back on your side of things. He probably helps people with deals behind the scenes and shit. So I think those guys will be okay. Yes, will they die a death a thousand cuts by seeing their channels slowly but surely die in terms of views over the years cool but it'll still be worth it'll still be a, enough of a vi it'll still be enough of a vi viable business for them to turn up every day and collect the ad revenue money from and the ads they get money from as well because like i said i think a lot of those pods they're not really done with the intention of trying to create fun shows for the fans they usually do those podcasts as an opportunity to just squeeze more money out automatically get more money right to use them as leverages or as guys keep platforms to you know stick ads on and shit it's not really as a fun show so i think they'll learn their feet and they'll be perfectly okay but very informative video from podcast cringe appreciate him for doing all this shit very detailed very thorough and obviously his knowledge and his experience being an actual legit lawyer plays a lot into some of the information that he talks about and how detailed and how thorough he is with the things that he talks about so i always appreciate that so big up podcast cringe always incredible always detailed check out his channel you know where it's at you know where that bad boy is at Okay, um, what else we want to talk about here? We spoke about him doing that. We spoke about the DSP thing already. Um, we spoke about that TFK stuff yesterday, the car we spoke about yesterday. We did quite a few things already, in it? I'm not going to be honest. We did quite a few bits. Um, oh, you've seen this clip. This clip is really good. Have you seen this one? This one is really fucking good. Whoever this comedian is, absolutely eviscerate Crystalia. I'm not sure if you've seen this one, but this is really fucking funny. Bear with me a second as I kind of load it up. This is fucking hilarious. Whoever this guy is, absolutely eviscerate Chris Lee. Kind of, um, you know, is a bit mean, actually. <laughs> to be fair, this guy tore Chris Lee apart. Listen to this clip. We need single cat guys. Cat guys are, by the way, I think the nicest. They're not going to rip you. I don't think no. Cosby had cats. I don't think... um. Did Delia have? Delia doesn't have cats. They never have cats. They certainly didn't pet. I haven't confirmed. Yeah. He would only have kittens. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out, and they had to get tattoos on their little necks. <laughs> what he I read. Shapes them down. Yeah, he, sha them yeah, he shapes them. Yeah. <laughs> God, the and then they were cats, and he'd throw them out. Get out of here. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mate, I fucking love it. <laughs> He'd only have kittens, not cats. Cats are too old. <laughs> oh, that guy was brilliant. Big up him. Whoever you are, you're fucking funny. Um, next, let's do this one. No, chin. Oh no, high def. No, uh, no, 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 no chin today, please. I don't want to feel. I don't want to feel down. I'm already down about George. I'm already fucking, you know, crying inside about George's fucking unfortunate situation. 
I don't want to do more chin. No, please. Please not today. Please. I beg of you. We'll do chin another time, but not today. I can't. I can't. I can't. It's too much, man. It's too much. Too much negativity. Too much negativity. Too much Debbie Downer shit. Another time. I beg of you. I beg of you. I beg of you. I beg of you. That 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 chin you need to work your way up to that. You know, that needs to be like a a thing you kind of you know. You need to eat clean. You need to have a couple of days of like eight hours sleep and shit. You know, with fucking you know, blackout blind, and then you kind of get into the chin stuff. I can't just do it willy nilly. I can't, I can't, I promise you, I can't. Um, but big up high def. Let's watch this one. The origins of Chombi. This should be a good one. The origins of fucking Chombi. Thick lie, thick nace, thick lie, thick nace. You know we do it right, never do it light. It's the thick lie. Oh, you know, you know. Tatted up, <laughs> veteran of the tat. Not compared to these guys. Doesn't say veteran of the tat game, but not really. <laughs> you know what? And I never enjoy them. They every single one hurts. Whoever tells you they feel good are full of shit. Get the tape. <laughs> <laughs> the human laugh track. There he is. The fucking human laugh track. Hey, all ten. The fucking human fucking Labrador, also known as fucking Chappelle Lacey, right? The fucking human fucking Labrador, the human laugh track, the guy that would make Brendan feel like he was fucking Dave Chappelle, the way he laughed at everything he fucking said. He fucking hurt. You didn't know i cream like Chappelle did over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. First of all, it's your arm. True, better not use numbing cream. And numbing cream don't help that fucking much. Today we're at my shop, Captured Tattoo, here in beautiful Old Town Tustin. And I have the absolute honor of tattooing Brendan today. Can you imagine? And again, I don't, you know, I've I've had a I've had a couple of kids, right? <laughs> I've had many kids. But can you imagine getting tattoos of your kids as rotting dead zombies? So your kids say a word in like if your kids say a word incorrectly, most of the time you'll correct them, right? Maybe it's cute when they're like five or like two or three. But if they're of age, you kind of want to correct them so they don't keep saying the word incorrectly. But you don't. So you just embrace the chomby thing and then you what? Make illustrations of them as zombies and you put it as a... Like, it's such an odd thing to do. Or maybe this was just an excuse to get the tattoo of zombies on his body. Maybe he just always wanted to have a tattoo... Um, or tattoos of zombies but he couldn't justify getting just random illustrations of zombies so you know he goes out and then he you know has this chance encounter with his kids where they say the term chombi um as their cute way of saying zombie and then he then gets a tattoo maybe that was the thing maybe it was almost self-serving maybe he just wanted the tattoo anyway and those kids happened to be around at the time it was just a coincidence that they happened to say what they said and it gave them an excuse to get it done maybe that's the case don't get me wrong illustration is pretty cool illustrations were well done but the idea of getting your kids as rotting corpses is odd <laughs> First one, like real tattoo I got was uh, a football with a crown on it because I went freshman of the year, like first year in college. Yeah. So I got a football with a crown on it. I'm not sure if I know like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Like, he's, like, you're, he's like, you don't you're like, you're gonna look when you're older? I'm like, dude, I don't give a fuck. I, you know? I was in Florida, but one of my boys is Tim Tebow. I was playing, we were outside playing football, and it was me, Tim, uh, Vinny Testaverde, who won a Heisman, played in the NFL, and another Heisman winner, and, uh, Tim's brother, Robbie, who's his manager, he's my boy, he, he busts balls. And we're all out, <laughs> out in Florida playing catch with the football. We're all sitting around drinking water, and he comes up and goes, Football king, huh? Around all those dudes who are like, <laughs> we're just like football royalty. I was so fucking embarrassed. So he got, his team won a game and he got a tattoo of him, what? For himself calling himself football king. Why would you want to admit that? Your team won a game and then you got a tattoo to commemorate the one game that you won. That wasn't a championship. Is that what he said? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Football king, huh? That's cool. Yeah. And I got tatted by the very talented Dan Smith. 
and uh, I think it went pretty good. So I have a feeling this also got comped. Anytime he does content around the stuff that he makes, I feel like it's usually an opportunity to get something for free. Or maybe you got a heavy discount. Anytime he does all this shit, this type of content, it feels like an opportunity to just, you know, to get some freebies. So it wouldn't surprise me. This is the reason why they recorded this vlog. Because you don't see many other vlogs for other tattoos he got because he probably didn't get them for free. This feels like a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a you scratch my back, I scratch your back type of thing, right? A little bit of a you get paid in exposure type of thing. So he's dicey when you're getting portraits, especially he when you're turning kids into a zombie. This could have been a disaster. That's why I drove out here in rush hour traffic during a goddamn flood to get tatted by Dan Smith just to make sure I'm getting tatted by the best. Couldn't want any better, man. My son, you can't say zombie, so he says Chombi. That's where the idea came from. So check out my Chombi. Chombi one, Chombi two. Perfect. Can I see your tattoo now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we can it's see it It's still pretty juicy. Well, it's a little dry now. Ooh. It's a little dry She's now. She's very green. Who is that? That's Boston. Okay. And then Tiger's up here. I can't pull up. <laughs> okay. He's a zombie because he says Chombi. Oh, dude, I can oh. see his brain. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's your son as a zombie. Yeah, and then Tiger's here as a zombie. I'm not mad at that. Oh, no, it's cool. Cute. Yeah. I'm not he, mad. every morning says Chombi. Yeah. He can say zombie. Tiger in Boston. So you got Tiger up here and the boss is right here. That's a yeah, little it's cool. disturbing, but in a good way. Yeah. All right. Yes, here's crazy. That guy, Dan Smith, is so fucking good. You can't really see it now because it's healing. He's a cute zombie. Yeah, he's cute as fuck, zombie. Yeah. Got a brain matter showing. but He's zombie, matter. dude. All right. It? Chombie. Yeah. It's pretty good. Was that Take, taking a while? To, no. no. Easiest tattoo I've ever got. Really? But Dan Smith has such a light touch. Wow. Yeah, I didn't barely felt it. Yeah, he's great. It's taking longer than I thought he does, to he does, he's Oh, don't get me wrong. All tattoos are very personal. You probably shouldn't tell anybody the reason. All reasons are fucking nonsense. Just get them whatever you want to get done. But it's just such an interesting thing to do because it feels quite self-serving. I just wanted a ta new tattoo. I just wanted a tattoo of zombies. I couldn't justify getting just random illustrations of zombies. So I get my kids as zombies on my thing. That's probably what it feels like. I don't know. But maybe it's, maybe it's not uncommon. Maybe this is a common thing. Maybe there are people out there that get whole family portraits, um, you know, done on their body, depicting their family members as zombies as well. Maybe that's the thing. I don't really know. But the first I've heard of it is through Brendan. So maybe in that case, he is a thought leader. Maybe he is actually the one that's there to, you know, change things and be the agent of change, right? He's actually there pushing things forward, showing people that, hey, you can do things another way. Maybe that's the reason why he's around. Maybe. You never know. Maybe that's why he's actually around. Maybe that's the reason why he's actually here to provide content for us lowly, lowly fucking people, right? Maybe that's the whole reason why. Maybe that's the whole reason why. You never fucking know. Who fucking knows? Who fucking knows? Okay, 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 okay. I think that might be it for me. I've double checking the tab, see if I've got anything else to talk about. Um, I think that might be it. I think I've done most of the things. So I'm going to love you and leave you, my friends, for now. Four hours in. Um, thank you for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. Never a fucking chore. Never a chore. We've learned a lot of things today. We learned that George got fired, got rehired didn't get fired didn't get hired brendan talks to him every single day couldn't fire him face to face because he's too emotional and too sensitive um got his lawyer to do it and you know all that other good stuff so it's fucking a brilliant great to see loved all of it um and yeah wishing george the best on his travels man i think it's for the best anyway that he look he left
Um, even if he got fired and he came back and then he left after, I don't know. I think it's for the best in general. Um, it's not going to serve him long term being connected or working with Brendan. He's just bad for business overall. Obviously not the greatest guy in the world when he can't even, you know, have the guts or the courage to just let you go personally face to face in any type of way awful that's not cool especially if you can't be honest about the reasons behind it one minute it's because he's young next minute because he's got no experience next minute he's inexperienced is a good thing who knows blah 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 it's a good thing for him in the, in the long run and probably it's good when you encounter people like him early in your career i think when you are coming up and you're young and you're first getting your you know you're, you put you probably get your first proper job Maybe he worked in supermarkets or bars before. But when you get your first like office job, your first quote unquote nine to five, I think it's quite important to meet Brendan's, to meet those type of personalities because then you know how to navigate or to like avoid them in your next roles or how to deal with them. It's really important to meet those type of people so you know that they exist out there because it's a different type of it's a different type of issue to deal with and to overcome than working in the service industry. Service industry dickheads and horrible people do exist, but they're a bit different in how they go about what they're doing. People that work in offices and those type of arenas and stuff, they do their things differently as well. So it's a good knowledge, it's a good kind of experience to kind of have. And hopefully that knowledge will, you know, do him the world of good in his next roles going forward. So more power to Josh. Um, keep your head up, brother keep your fucking head up for the rest of you watching the stream appreciate you like it if you haven't liked it below make sure you do that of course links to everything that i do down below as well patreons social media all that shit you can find it down below i'll see you guys again very soon keep your fucking heads up thank you for tuning in random show episode number 182 part two we're out of here take care my friends peace out it's been a pleasure never a fucking chore and i'll see you guys again very soon Peace.